Volume 2, Chapter 6 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Weiner. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubbock. Chapter 6. When first Robert came to Winston, Elizabeth had consulted him on the subject of sending for Sam, but her brother opposed it. Emma had listened in silent anxiety to the debate, and in keen disappointment to its termination. From her sister's conversation, she had an ardent desire to meet her unknown brother. She expected to be able to like him. Elizabeth had, in speaking of him, told many little traits of character, which convinced her that he must possess a generous disposition and an affectionate heart. She longed to see him, to know him, to be loved by him. But Robert had decided that though he was, of course, to be informed of his father's illness, there was no need to say anything which should induce him to come himself. No doubt it would be excessively inconvenient to his master, and needless expense to himself, perfectly undesirable in every way, and quite unnecessary, for of what use could Sam be when Robert himself was there? He was nobody, a younger son, the most unimportant being in the world. As to his wishing to see his father again, what did that signify? People could not always have what they wished for. Young men in their apprenticeship must not look for holidays. He was sure he should never have thought of anything of the sort whilst he was serving his articles. And now, how seldom did he ever take a holiday from the office? Let Sam look to him and his application to business if he wanted an example of steadiness and good conduct. But Emma's wish to see her brother was not fated to be entirely disappointed, for no sooner did he receive the news of his father's death than he obtained leave of absence from his master without difficulty and arrived unexpectedly at Winston. She was sitting alone in the darkened parlour when an unknown step arrested her attention. It was not the slow, measured, consequential tread of Robert. It was quicker, lighter, more like one which had sometimes made her heart beat before, at least so she fancied for a moment, perhaps only because she had just been thinking of him. The footstep passed the door, then paused, returned and entered slowly. It was not more than the doubt of a moment as to the identity of the intruder. There was so strange a family likeness on each side, a likeness of more than features, a likeness in mind and temper, a sympathy of feeling, that the hesitation of the brother and sister was brief indeed. "'My dear Emma, how I have longed to see you,' cried he, advancing. "'I am your youngest brother. Will you not welcome me?' The cordial, fraternal embrace with which the words were accompanied overcame her firmness and she burst into tears in his arms. He was much affected likewise, but struggled for composure in order to soothe her, opened the window to give her air, brought her a glass of water from the sideboard, and then, sitting down with his arm round her waist, drew from her all the circumstances of his father's death and learnt that it was Robert's doing that he had not been summoned sooner. That hour repaid Emma for much she had suffered mentally in her father's house. She had found a friend in her brother, the dearest, the least selfish, the most equal bond which nature ties, children of the same parents, sharing the same fears, the same sorrows. From that moment was laid the foundation of an affection which added so greatly to her happiness. Feelings, till then sleeping unknown in her heart, were suddenly awakened, and affections, which almost unconsciously had been craving for subsistence, having now found an ailment to nourish and satisfy them, grew rapidly into strength and beauty. One hour's delightful intercourse was theirs, before they were interrupted by the rest of the family, but when her other sisters entered the room, Emma could not but wonder at the indifference with which he was received both by Penn and Margaret, and imputing to him the sensitive feelings of her own heart, felt doubly pained by each cold word or careless look bestowed on her new brother. Robert's reception, however, was the worst of all. "'So you are come, are you?' Hum. That was his salutation. "'Yes,' replied Sam quietly. "'Of course you were expecting me.' 
a most needless waste of time and money, I must say. A young fellow, not out of his apprenticeship, has no right to be flying over the country in this way without any suitable reason. Sam controlled himself so far as not to answer. It's throwing away your master's time in a most unjustifiable way. Excuse me, Robert, Mr. Allen voluntarily gave me permission to come here and most kindly made me master of my own time for a week. Quite unnecessary, whilst you are an apprentice. I believe he thought that even an apprentice might have feeling, replied Sam with emphasis. You might at least have asked my opinion, I think. As your eldest brother, you might have consulted me before incurring so much expense. Robert, I am accountable to Mr. Allen alone for my time. As to my pecuniary affairs, I am not answerable to you. And as to coming to this house, Elizabeth, who is mistress here, has told me I am welcome, and I require no more from anyone. My sense of duty led me here, but depend upon it, I will ask your leave before I intrude on your house at Croydon. Robert turned away and had recourse to his usual expedient when vexed, namely, stirring the fire into a vehement blaze. It was in pursuance of a system of counter-irritation, by creating a greater degree of external warmth, no doubt he counteracted the internal heat from which she was suffering. The whole of the week which Sam spent at home was one of consolation and comfort to poor Emma. He listened to all she could tell him, made her describe her past life, talked of her uncle and aunt, questioned her as to the effects of her change, entered into her feelings, anticipated what they must have been, sympathised warmly in them all, and was, in fact, a true, warm-hearted brother to the forlorn girl. Together they talked of their father, praised his amiable disposition, sorrowed for his loss. Then Sam told her his prospects and wishes, confided to her his attachment to Mary Edwards and his wavering hopes of success, his plans for his future subsistence and his anticipations of the brilliant success which was to await him in his profession. Emma's future prospects likewise were canvassed. He could not bear the idea of her having to reside with Robert and his wife. You will tell me it's wrong, I dare say, said he, but I detest Mrs. Robert. She is so self-sufficient, so cold-hearted, and so insincere. Indeed, I wish her no ill, Emma. I am not malicious. My detestation does not go so far as that. But I cannot wish her to have your society for a constancy. It would be thrown away on her, and she would torment you to death. Oh no, I hope not. I trust if my home must be there, that I shall have strength of mind and patience to bear with her. You must not weaken my mind by commiseration. You should rather teach me to look forward with hope, or at least resignation. Do not pity me. That does me harm. Sam protested that Emma was in every respect much too good for such a situation, and that the moment he had a house and an income, however small, she should share it with him. Her promise to do so was as cordially given as it was required, and her heart already felt lighter and happier from her acquaintance with her dear brother. When their father's will came to be examined, it appeared that it was dated three years previously, and that, of the sum of £2,000 which Mr Watson had to bequeath, neither Emma or Robert were to receive any share. The latter had already been put in possession of all that he could reasonably expect, his father having made considerable advances to establish him in business, and at the time when the will was made, every one supposed Emma would be provided for by her uncle, and though that expectation had been entirely frustrated, it seemed that Mr Watson had never summoned sufficient energy to alter his will and give her any share in the little he possessed. It did not transpire whether Robert was much disappointed at finding he was to have no further benefit from being the eldest son. Perhaps the idea that Emma, by becoming entirely dependent on him, would be liable to be subject to all his caprices, and might be made a complete slave off in his house, soothed away the bitterness of his mortification. He took leave of the family immediately and returned to Croydon, having arranged that when everything was settled at Winston, three of his sisters should follow him there. Penelope, professing it to be her intention to return to Chichester as soon as she conveniently could, 
Sam's week was not yet expired, and he remained with his sisters. The morning after Robert's departure, as Emma and her brother were sitting together, Margaret joined them, and sitting down beside Sam, told him with a consequential air that she wanted very much to consult him. "'Well, Margaret, what can I do for you?' inquired he kindly. "'I want your advice on an affair of great importance, Sam, and you must promise to give it to me.' "'Readily, Margaret. That's a thing you know everybody likes to be asked for. So come, let's have the whole history. I will not even require you to follow my advice when I have given it. That would be too much altogether.' "'Well, listen. I am engaged to be married. What do you think of that?' "'I will tell you when I know who it is.' "'Oh, I assure you, it is a very desirable match. "'A most excellent young man, so amiable and fashionable and clever. "'You will at once allow it when you hear it is. "'Mr. Tom Musgrove.' "'Tom Musgrove? "'Indeed I am surprised, Margaret, that he should marry and marry you, "'would I own astonish me. "'But I tell you, it is a fact, Sam. "'We are engaged beyond all doubt. "'And why you should be surprised at my being his choice, I cannot understand. "'I beg your pardon, Margaret. "'Tell me what you want my advice about, "'not as to accepting him, I presume. "'No, indeed, but I am in an unfortunate situation. "'I am so miserable, ever since the happy night at Osborne Castle, "'when he plighted his troth to me, We have not met, and I have heard nothing of him. That is very extraordinary, Margaret. Nothing at all, and can you not account for it? No, otherwise than I am sure he is ill. Nothing else could be the reason of such unexampled silence. It was after supper when he made the offer, and I cannot help fearing that the champagne and the lobster salad may have been too much for his constitution. Did he take much champagne, then? Much? No, not much. That is... Not enough to, to, just, you know, raise his spirits a good deal. I did not count the glasses. And it was then he proposed to you. Are you quite sure he was sober at the time, Margaret? What questions you ask, Sam? Sober? You quite shock me. Remember, you are talking to a young lady. Well, I will not forget that. But really, I don't see anything so bad in the question. And I know no more delicate way of putting it to suit you. Are you sure he was not drunk at the time? Will that do? Upon my word, worse and worse, as if I should talk to a man who was drunk. What do you take me for? I am sorry to offend you, my dear sister, but I have known Tom Musgrove a long time, and sometimes seen him very drunk. Indeed, in my opinion, he is just the sort of man to make a fool of himself first, and then of any girl who would listen to him. How excessively unkind you are, Sam! pouted Margaret, apparently on the point of crying. I am quite sure you are wrong. Tom never could or would make a fool of me. He is not the sort of man at all. But I have heard nothing of him since that evening. I wish you to go and call on him. Tell him how much pleased you are to hear of the engagement, and beg him to come and see me. There is no occasion to shut him out of the house, though we do not admit other visitors. That's your plan, is it? But suppose he declines altogether, suppose he should say it was a dream on your part, a delusion, a mistake, suppose that is the reason of his silence, what am I to do then? Oh, if he were to do that, you must challenge him. You could not do less for such an insult to your sister. You must send him a challenge, and I could bring an action against him for breach of promise. Well, if you mean to do that, I think I had better let the challenge alone, because the one might interfere with the other. If I were to shoot him, you know your action could not be brought. Do you mean that you will not do as I ask you? Indeed I do. Then I think you most unkind and ungenerous. I always understood it was a brother's duty to fight with every man who insulted his sister or broke an engagement to her. But allowing us such high privileges, my dear Margaret, I think I am justified in requiring proof. First, that the engagement was made. Secondly, that it has been broken. I am not clear yet on either of those points. I see what it is. You are determined not to help me, and I think it very ill-natured and cowardly of you to stand by and see your sister insulted and robbed of her best affections and not interfere the least for her sake. Indeed, my dear Margaret, I cannot see that my interference has the least chance of doing any good. 
If Tom was serious and sober, he will need no intervention of mine to remind him of his promises. If he was drunk and did not know what he was saying, the less that is publicly known of such a transaction, the better in every respect for your dignity. I see you will not take my part. You are no use at all. I shall just take my own way and see if I consult you in a hurry again. Whilst the silence and indifference of Margaret's lover gave her so much concern, the attention and assiduity of Emma's occasioned almost as much excitement in the mind of the latter. Not a day had passed without Lord Osborne either calling himself at the door or sending a groom with a joint message of inquiry from his sister and himself. Several kind little notes had been received from the young lady, expressing concern and sympathy, and it was quite evident that they did not wish to drop the acquaintance. Nothing had been seen of Mr. Howard, but a note from Mrs. Willis assured Emma that they had heard every day through Lord Osborne, or they would have sent more frequently to inquire for her welfare. This was consolatory, as serving to convince her that she was not forgotten at the parsonage, but she could not help murmuring a little to herself that Mr. Howard should have so entirely withdrawn from personal intercourse. Sam had received from her a minute history of her acquaintances at the castle and parsonage, and when he subsequently became aware of the visits of Lord Osborne, he immediately formed the very natural conclusion that the young peer must be in love with his sister. Emma appeared to him so pretty and so amiable that her being loved was the most simple and probable event, and he only wished that Lord Osborne had been more worthy of her, but the peerage and fortune of the supposed lover did not quite blind the brother's eyes to the fact that their owner was not distinguished by any characteristic worthy of his high birth. And Sam could not wish his sister to sacrifice domestic happiness for the glitter of a coronet or the harmony of a title. She must have a husband who united mental and moral qualifications to those of birth, wealth and station, and if he possessed the means of advancing Sam himself in his profession, it would be so much the better. Did you ever, in your life, see such a fool as Margaret makes of herself, Sam? was Penelope's observation one day, when the whole family were sitting together. She will persist in asserting that she is engaged to Tom Musgrove, though I have taken the trouble of ascertaining that he has left home, and the servants are not sure whether he has gone to London or Bath. I asked the baker's boy to inquire, in order to set her mind at ease. I must say, I think her story very incompatible with facts. I am sure I am necessarily obliged to you, Penelope, for your kind way of speaking to me, but I know very well what it is. You are all envious of my good luck, and that's the reason you will none of you believe me, but some day I shall pay you off, you will see. In the meantime, I will give you ample credit, Margaret, feeling confident that you will never forget a debt of that kind, but if you are Mrs. Tom Musgrove six months hence, I will admit that I know nothing of you, nothing of Tom, nothing of men in general, and that I am little better than an idiot. I do not see why you should doubt it at all, cried Elizabeth, interposing. I am sure I believe it entirely. Don't you, Emma? The gentleman is probably gone to London to give instructions for preparing the settlements, observed Sam gravely, preventing, by his interposition, any necessity for Emma to answer her eldest sister's question. Margaret assented to this proposition, and Penelope took no further trouble to vex her at that moment. Meantime, all the necessary arrangements for the girls quitting their old home were made, with all possible dispatch. Margaret indeed took no interest in the proceedings, contenting herself with wandering about and fretting for Mr Musgrove. But the others were busy from the time Sam left them, and towards the end of a month the time for removing to Croydon began to be discussed. Penn still held to her resolution of not visiting her brother, she determined to return to her friend at Chichester and marry from her house, and she announced that the marriage would take place within a few weeks of her quitting her home. Emma was sorry at parting with her, she had got over the shock which her coarse manners had at first inflicted, and they had always agreed very well since the day at Osborne Castle. 
In fact, what Penelope had observed there of the kindness and attention which Emma received from that family had greatly raised her sister in importance in her mind. A girl so much noticed and liked by people who had never stooped to them before must be worth agreeing with, and as there was everything in Emma's own manners and temper to recommend her to the kindly disposed, Penelope had always avoided quarrelling with her, as she constantly did with her other sisters. Consequently, Emma could not help wishing it was Margaret who was going to Chichester and Penn who was to share their home at Croydon. Things, however, were really better arranged than she could have ordered them, for it would have been impossible for Penelope and Jane Watson to have continued in the same house without the certain destruction of the peace of all around. There was no one in the neighbourhood to regret, excepting Mrs Willis, for Emma would not allow even to herself that the separation from Mr Howard gave her any concern, and it was a satisfaction to quit the vicinity of Osborne Castle and the scenes where she had been so happy. The Osborne family were all gone to town without her having seen anything more of them, or the suit of the young nobleman having made any progress. She did not expect ever to see them again. Her own plan for the future was to try to procure a situation as teacher in a boarding school or private governess, anything by which she could feel she was earning the food she ate, in preference to becoming, as her brother expressed it, a burden on his family. She began now to comprehend more fully than she had done before what an evil poverty might be, and felt a vivid sensation of regret that her uncle had left her so entirely dependent on others after giving her an education which quite unfitted her for filling the situation of humble companion to her sister-in-law. She struggled to suppress the feeling that she had been unjustly and unkindly dealt with, but it would intrude to her great discomfort. But though there were few people to regret amongst her associates, there were sufficient discomforts and worries of other kinds attending their removal, the dismantling of their old home, the sale of the furniture, a portion of which was taken by the succeeding rector, the rest was to be disposed of by auction, the disputes about dilapidations, the finding situations for their servants, the vain attempts to procure a purchaser amongst their acquaintance for their old horse, even the parting with the house dog and their two cows made Emma sorrowful. Added to all this was the incessant repining of Margaret, who was fretting herself almost into a decline at the disappearance of Tom Musgrove, and the ill-natured letters of Robert Watson, who regularly quarrelled with everything Elizabeth did, or did not do, who disputed all their proposals, and suggested nothing but impossibilities himself. Emma could not make up her mind on another point, and this was an additional worry to her. She knew that Margaret's assertions were correct, that Tom Musgrove had really made the offer which no one else believed, and she doubted whether it was not her duty to support her sister's declarations by her testimony. But this threatened to involve so great an evil that she shrank from it. It was evident that had Robert been aware she was a witness to the proceeding, he would immediately have taken advantage of the fact to compel Tom to fulfil his promise, or threaten him with an action in case he refused. Margaret seemed likewise to be much inclined to this course, as the determined silence and prolonged absence of her lover naturally gave her doubts of his fidelity. The idea was horrible to Emma and the possibility of her having to appear in a court of justice was most overpowering. Elizabeth, with whom she consulted on the subject, and who, from her partiality to Emma, was far more inclined to consider her feelings than those of Margaret, advised her, for the present at least, to hold her tongue, and see how the affair would be settled without her intervention, and from not knowing what better to do. Emma finally decided to take her sister's advice. At length, just before quitting Winston, she had a farewell visit from Mrs Willis and her brother, whose plan for leaving home, she was already aware, had been renounced. The lady was the same as ever, friendly and warm in her manners, but Mr Howard looked pale and ill, and was evidently out of spirits. The visit was short, and when they parted, Emma found the interview had only added an additional pang to all the suffering she had previously endured. And thus, for a second time, was Emma Watson driven out from the home where she had vainly hoped to find a continued shelter. 
and a second time compelled to look for protection from strange relatives. It was strange that though at this moment she really had more subjects of anxiety, more sources of depression and sorrow, she bore it so much better than the first. Then she had seemed overwhelmed, now strengthened by the blow. She was learning to see life, its duties and its trials in a new light. She discovered that suffering was not an accidental circumstance, like a transitory illness, to be cured and forgotten as soon as possible. It was the condition of life itself. Peace was the exception. And she had enjoyed her share. Henceforth, she must look forward to trial and endurance. She must struggle as millions had struggled before her, and learn to draw contentment not from circumstances, but from temper of mind. Conscious that whilst in her brother's house she should probably have much to bear, she sought for a strength greater than her own to go through with it, and endeavoured by viewing her expected trials as a system of mental discipline which would benefit her, if well supported, to bring her mind into a frame to endure them with patience. End of Volume 2, Chapter 6 Recording by Elizabeth Rayner Volume 2, Chapter 7 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lori Frankel. The Younger Sister by Catherine N. Hubeck. The journey to Croydon was safely performed and as expeditiously as could be expected by three young ladies and a quantity of luggage traveling through crossroads with post horses. Margaret was quite at home in the streets of Croydon and its neighborhood and pointed out to whom the various houses belonged with a feeling of exultation, as if knowing the names of the owners when her sisters did not were the next thing to possessing them herself. The bright green door with its brass-handled bell was easily recognized by the large plate bearing the owner's name which adorned it. The door was opened by a footman who informed them that Master was at the office, Missus was out in the town, but they could step into the drawing-room whilst they waited for her return. With evident nonchalance and something like insolence, he assisted the postboy to unload the carriage, and summoning the housemaid, inquired if she knew what was to be done with all them things. The waiting woman decided that nothing could be ventured on till the missus came home. She had changed her mind so often about the rooms that it was quite uncertain what would be settled on at last. And if she should happen to alter her arrangements whilst she was out, it was evident they would have had all their trouble for nothing. The three girls were therefore sentenced to sit in the parlor during the interval, which Emma could not help feeling might have been more profitably employed in unpacking and arranging their property. There was little to amuse them during their temporary confinement. A copy of the ladies' magazine containing the recent Parisian fashions was instantly seized on by Margaret. A cookery book and a child's doll were lying beside it, and a cat and a kitten were reposing on the hearth rug, which, judging from its texture and the ugliness of its pattern, was probably the work of some domestic needle. Some uncommonly rare paintings hung against the walls, rare from the total want of taste, harmony, and merit which they displayed. Beside them were two most striking portraits which were considerately labeled as intending to represent the master and mistress of the home, thereby preventing such mistakes as to identify as might have occurred. The carpet was faded, the chairs and couch covered with slippery black horsehair, bumping up into hard, offensive things called cushions. The table was covered with green beds, much stained with wine, and the easy chair by the fire showed the exact spot where the owner was accustomed to repose his powdered and pomatumed head. Presently, the door opened and the little girl appeared. Margaret instantly rushed up to embrace her, but the child, who seemed peculiarly self-possessed for her age, repulsed her. I did not come here to see you, Aunt Margaret, said she. Which is Emma? I am, said Emma, advancing, and pleased to be called for. Her niece considered her attentively with an air of surprise, then said, But you are quite tidy and clean, not ragged and dirty. No, my dear, replied Emma, smiling at her puzzled look. Why did you expect to see me otherwise? Because the people my nurse tells me are beggars in the street go without shoes and wear old clothes. Emma colored slightly and made no reply, but Margaret, pressing forwards, asked again what that had to do with Aunt Emma. Papa and Mama said she was a beggar, and I thought she would look like them. But she is nice and looks good, and I will not mind you teaching me at all. Will you make me pretty frocks? Mama said you should. I shall be very glad, love, replied Emma, to do anything I can for you and your Mama too. Will you sit on my knee and tell me what I shall make your frocks of? 
Whilst Emma was making friends with her little niece, Mrs. Robert Watson herself arrived. She received her sisters-in-law with more cordiality than Emma expected from the epithet applied to herself, which the child had just betrayed. In fact, she was rather pleased than otherwise at this accession to her family. She felt that she had secured a careful assistant to the cook in Elizabeth, who was well-versed in the mysteries of pastry and custards, cakes, jellies, and raised pies. And in Emma, she hoped to find a competent nursery governess, who would relieve her of all cares as to the child and supply, unsalaried, the place of the nursemaid, to whom, under this impression, she had already given warning. After chatting some time with them, she rang for the housemaid to show them to their rooms, and the child declared she would accompany them, as Aunt Emma's room was close to the nursery. And so Emma found it was, for she was shown into a small closet containing a bed with room to walk around it, an old chest of drawers, and a high stool. This was her apartment. There was no chimney, and the window looked out upon a small space of flat leads, surmounted by high black tiled roofs. It had commenced raining since they entered the house, and the gurgle of the water in the gutter, and drip from the window on the leads, had peculiarly monotonous sound. Emma looked at the forlorn and cheerless closet, and felt she was a beggar indeed. She hoped, however, that when her boxes and books were brought up, she should be able to make it a little more comfortable. At least she had it to herself, and should be able to pass her time there in peace. Her niece dragged her off to see the nurseries. The two rooms devoted to her occupied the rest of that floor. They were spacious and in every respect comfortable, except that they were littered with playthings which their owner apparently had not learnt to value. As it drew near to the dinner hour, Emma ventured downstairs and found her brother and his wife in the parlor. Robert received her in his usual manner. In another moment, her two sisters entered, and they sat round the fire whilst waiting for dinner. I hope you like your rooms, girls, said Mrs. Watson. I thought it would not matter putting Elizabeth and you together, Margaret, because I know it's only for a time. I have heard a little bird whispered to me a certain story which you need not blush about of a certain young man. I know who, and I am sure I congratulate you. When did you hear from him last, my dear? Oh, my dear Jane, I have not heard from him at all. Ever since the evening when he proposed, he has disappeared from the country, and I cannot find out where he has gone, nor induce him to make any answer to my repeated letters. I cannot tell what he means. For my own part, I think someone has been slandering me to him, telling him things to my disadvantage, or perhaps in intercepting one of my letters. Oh, I have thought of a thousand reasons for his silence without charging him with infidelity, and I console myself with the hope that when the romantic interruption to our correspondence is removed, and the mystery which now envelops the affair is cleared away, that I shall find he has been suffering as much from the misunderstanding as myself. I am sure I hope you may, but are you certain there is no mistake on your part, said her sister-in-law? Are you sure that he really proposed to you? I am as positive of the fact, said Margaret, as I ever was of anything in my life. Well, that is a good deal, observed Robert, for you can be pretty positive when you please, but I only wish, if it's true, you had had some witnesses, then I could have helped you. Would you have called him out, inquired his wife, in a tone of indifference, which quite startled Emma. No, I should have called him in, said Robert, laughing. If the fellow refused to marry her, I would have had him up for a breach of promise, without ceremony. And what should I get for that, said Margaret eagerly. You might perhaps have got a couple of thousands. I think I would lay the damages at three. Only three, Robert? I am sure that it is not enough for deceiving me, robbing me of my best affections, betraying my trust. Oh, three thousand pounds would be no compensation for such conduct, no adequate compensation. I am sure my heart is worth more than that. I dare say you think so, Margaret, replied Robert coolly, but you might not persuade a jury to think it likewise. There would be the difficulty. But would you really go to law about it, inquired Emma? Only think how it would make you talked about. Well, so much the better, replied Margaret sharply. Why should I mind that? I am not afraid of being spoken of. It would be much better to make him pay damages than compel him to marry you, observed Elizabeth. I always wonder women venture to do that. I should be afraid he would beat me afterwards. Two or three thousand pounds would secure you a respectable husband, Margaret, continued Robert. My friend, George Millar, would perhaps take you then. I think I would rather marry Tom Musgrove than anybody, replied Margaret. George Millar is only a brewer, after all, and Tom as a gentleman has nothing to do. But Millar has a capital business, I can tell you, cried Mrs. Watson. I should not mind my own sister marrying him. Why, I know he used to allow his late wife more than a hundred a month to keep the table and find herself in gowns, a very pretty allowance, and very pretty gowns she used to wear. Aye, George Millar could count thousands from Musgrove's hundreds, said Robert, and a capital fellow he is. I only wish you might have such luck as to marry him, either of you girls. The conversation was interrupted by the dinner, which was a welcome sight to the hungry travelers, who had tasted nothing since their early breakfast at Winston. 
Their brother looked at the table with evident pride. Well, Elizabeth, I promised you rather a better dinner than you gave me at Winston, observed he. He had the habit of reverting to past grievances. You have kept your word, too, replied she, good-humouredly. Oh, my dear creature, cried Jane. Robert told me of the shocking dinner he had. Poor fellow, you certainly always manage very badly about such things. Perhaps it might do you no harm if I gave you some lessons. I have rather a genius for housekeeping. At least so my friends tell me. My uncle, Sir Thomas, used to like me to order his dinner. My dear Jane, I am afraid your instructions would be quite wasted on me, unless you would give me your income to supply my wishes. When anyone allows me a hundred a month for the table expenses, I will give capital dinners, said Elizabeth. You are not thinking of what you are doing, Jane, said her husband reproachfully. You know I cannot eat the wing of a fowl unless it is torn properly. Emma, I'll trouble you to cut some bacon. Good heavens, I cannot eat it so thick as that. You are not helping a Winston plowboy, remember? Emma endeavored to comply, but she grew nervous, and her brother was angry, and sent for the dish that he might help himself. Emma colored and apologized. You should try to oblige, Emma, said Jane coolly. A little pains bestowed on such things is quite as useful and essential to good breeding as painting or books. Careless ways of carving are very detrimental to the comfort of a family, and though it may seem of no importance to you, it makes all the difference to a delicate palate, one used to the niceties of life, a gentleman, in fact. Emma felt though she did not say, that there was no delicacy of feeling, whatever there might be of palate, in her sister-in-law, but she wisely held her tongue on the subject. After dinner, the little girl made her appearance and immediately required of her mother a share in the walnuts on the table. My precious one, you must have them peeled for you. Yes, mamma, peel them. No, my darling, they stain my fingers. Ask your Aunt Emma. I dare say she will do it. The child crept to Emma. Good-natured aunt, peel me some walnuts. Emma readily agreed to do so, wishing, so far as lay in her power, to show that she really was anxious to oblige. The little girl seated herself on her knee and endeavored at first to assist in the operation, but soon relinquished the attempt and contented herself with slyly dropping the walnut shells down Emma's neck and slipping them under her gown, a playful trick which amused her mother excessively when she discovered it and gave Emma the trouble of going to her room to undress before she could free herself from the disagreeable sensations they occasioned. The conversation before dinner still dwelt heavy in her mind. She felt persuaded that the time would come when she and Miss Osborne, too, must step forward to prove the truth of her sister's words, and she shuddered at the idea. She felt that she must make some apology or at least some announcement of her intentions to Miss Osborne before she could venture to risk such very unpleasant consequences to them both, and she determined to write to her and tell her the circumstances as they occurred and ask her to support and substantiate her word when it came to be questioned. Her head was too weary and dizzy to undertake anything of the kind that night, but she resolved not to defer it very long, for Margaret's sake. A day or two passed on, and Emma began to wonder when she should find time for writing the projected letter. Her sister-in-law kept her so fully employed that a spare quarter of an hour was not to be had. Her talents with needle and scissors had attracted Jane's observation when at Winston, and now they were put into constant requisition in mending the child's wardrobe or improving the mother's. Her niece's lessons were likewise turned over to her, for she was to learn her alphabet, her parents expecting her to be a little prodigy and Emma must spare no pains to produce the desired result. Take this as a specimen of their usual routine. I wish, Elizabeth, now you seem to be at leisure, said Jane, entering the parlor. You would just go and teach my cook to make those custard puddings, and if you would put her in the way of making almond cake, such as you had at your father's, I should thank you. We have had some friends coming to tea, and I should like them to taste those. Elizabeth, who was just taking up her needle to mend a garment of her own, very good-temperedly put it away, and repaired to the kitchen to superintend her sister's confectionery affairs. Now, Emma, cried Jane, turning to her, I'll call Janetta, and you shall give her a lesson, and I should like her to know the busy bee to say to the visitors tonight. That little darling, exclaimed Margaret, as her sister brought in the child, has quite her mother's talents. My sweet pet stroking down her hair as she spoke my little beauty will grow up a clever good woman like mamma some day will you not dearest like me dearest margaret do not wish her such an evil a poor weak creature like me the child of impulse the slave of excitement may she be better and happier than her poor mother emma commenced the painful task of cramming infant brains with what they could not comprehend for exhibition to people who did not want to hear it jane showed margaret a piece of work she wanted done and then threw herself into a lounging chair. Who do you expect here this evening, Jane? inquired Margaret. I did not know you meant to have company. 
It's a country client of my husband's who is coming to dine, replied Mrs. Watson, and I asked one or two friends to meet him. One cannot very well help that, or else I don't know that just now, considering how lately your old father died, that I should have had any company, but Mr. Terry is a man of much influence. All Emma's sensitive feelings recoiled at this indifferent reference to their recent loss. That he was Robert's father likewise did not seem to occur to his wife, who had never looked on him with either affection or respect. Meantime, the little Janetta, for such was her niece's name, made but small progress towards acquiring the much-desired learning, and presently her mother, turning sharply round, cried out, I am sure, Emma, you are taking no pains about that child, for she is so quick in general at learning anything, I must say, considering the circumstances and the liberality with which your brother has received you. It is not asking such a very wonderful favor, requesting you to attend a little to his child. I am sure I am very happy to do so, replied Emma meekly, but your little girl does not seem disposed to attend to me. That must be the fault of your manner of instructing, then. You do not adopt an interesting way. But I have observed constantly where most gratitude is due least is paid. Janetta, darling, does not your aunt teach you nicely? I want to look at Aunt Emma's watch, replied the child. I hear it ticking in her pocket, and she says I must not see it till I have done. How came you by a watch, Emma, inquired Mrs. Watson, in a tone which seemed to imply a suspicion of its being honestly acquired. Let me see it. It was a gift from my uncle, replied poor Emma, producing it rather unwillingly. It was a very handsome one, and had her name engraved inside the lid. I want to watch very much. Mine is not to my taste, observed Mrs. Watson, greedily eyeing her sister-in-law's property. You would not like to exchange, would you, Emma? Certainly not, replied she hastily. It was a keepsake from him, and I would not willingly part with it for anything. Don't you think you had better take Janetta to the nursery, said Mrs. Watson? I am sure she would learn a great deal better there than here, where we are talking. There, darling, go with Emma like a pet. Emma saw that her sister-in-law wanted to get rid of her, but she really thought the quiet of the nursery would be preferable to the drawing-room worries, and she gladly withdrew. I don't quite understand that sister of yours, Margaret, said Jane as soon as they were left together. I think she seems very proud and unpleasant, a good deal of conceit and pertness mingled in her manner. Exactly so, dear Jane. With your usual candor and penetration, you have precisely described her character. Yes, said Mrs. Watson, with an air of great satisfaction. I hope I can see through people a little. If there is one quality I pride myself on, it is my penetration. I am blessed. I acknowledge with a singular facility for discerning characters and what I think I must say. I speak my feelings almost unconsciously. You are a wonderfully clever creature, Jane. I am sure I never knew anyone to be compared to you. But as to Emma, I think it's her intimacy with the Osbournes that has set her up so abominably. Really, since she has been there so much, there is no speaking to her sometimes. That is often the case where young girls are much noticed by those above them in rank, Margaret. I wonder what they saw in her to like so much, even if they thought her pretty, which I do not. I don't see why they should notice her for that. Do you think Lord Osborne liked her? I really don't know. He used to look at her, and he danced with her, and called on her. I sometimes thought he did care for her. I wish I could devise any means of bringing them together. If I were quite sure on that point, it would make a great difference, but I don't suppose anything will come of it now. There's the postman's knock. Just step out in the passage and bring in the letters here. I know Mr. Watson is out, so I can get a peep at his dispatches now. Margaret did as she was desired and returned presently with a handful of letters. Mrs. Watson took them on her lap and examined the postmark and address of each. Several were, from their size and appearance, letters of business. She put them aside. Over one she paused. Here's one in a lady's hand, said she, and to my husband, London. I wonder who that's from. I never saw the seal before or the handwriting. There's some mystery there. I wonder whether it's from some mistress or improper person. I dare say it is. Men are always deceiving one. Oh, Jane, cried Margaret, that's impossible. You, of all people, cannot fear a rival. Robert could not serve you so. Oh, the best of women, my dear, fare no better than the worst with some men. The best of men are worth very little, and as to Mr. Watson, he's no better than his neighbors. I can tell you I would not trust him without watching, and I'll see him open and read that letter, or my name is not Jane Watson. But let's see, turning again to her letters, what else have we here? One for me, one for Elizabeth. Who's that from? Look, Margaret. Margaret readily obeyed, and kneeling down beside her sister's chair, looked at the letter in question. I think, said she, it's from the upholsterer who purchased some of our old furniture. That's H on the seal, and his name was Hill. 
Very likely, but look, Margaret, here's one for Emma, a lady's hand, too, the London postmark, and a coronet on the seal. Good gracious, that must be from Miss Osborne, or perhaps from her brother. I wonder if one could see anything inside. You see, Lord Osborne has franked it, and it's in an envelope. How tiresome. If it had only been folded like another letter, we could have read some of it. So we might. I dare say Emma will never tell us a word. She's so close. She never chats comfortably with one about anything. I am sure to this day I know nothing at all about what she thinks of Lord Osborne or any of his family. It's so provoking and disagreeable. So it is. I hate such nasty close dispositions. I, who am all openness and frankness, cannot comprehend anything secret and underhand. Well, we cannot help it, and I suppose we shall not know what it is about. Take those letters to the office, Margaret, and tell the clerk they were brought into the drawing room by mistake. Whilst Margaret fulfilled this commission and stopped to flirt with the young clerk who received them, an old acquaintance of hers, Mrs. Watson, having first carefully laid aside the suspected epistle to her husband, proceeded upstairs with Emma's letter, and after turning it over in every direction and even holding it up to the light at the staircase window, but without benefit, she suddenly entered the nursery. There she found Janetta had dropped asleep on a bed, and Emma, taking advantage of the leisure thus afforded, was preparing to write a letter. Janetta asleep, oh, said the anxious mother. Well then, you will have time, Emma, to do a little job for me. I want some alterations in the trimmings on my bombazine gown, and I wish you would do it for me before evening. I shall be very happy, replied Emma, to do anything in my power to oblige you, if you will only explain it to me. Very well, come with me, and I will show you what I want. Oh, by the by, here's a letter for you. I think it must be from Miss Osborne from the seal. Does she write to you often? No, replied Emma, surprised at hearing this, and holding out her hand for the letter, which Mrs. Watson still detained to examine. I never heard from her before since she left the country. Indeed. What do you suppose she writes about? By the way, I suppose you are not accustomed to receive letters and give no account of them, are you? Indeed I am, replied Emma, quite ashamed at the idea of supervision in such a particular. I have never been controlled in either receiving or writing a letter. I consider that an exceedingly improper liberty for a young girl, observed Mrs. Watson dryly. At your time of life, under age, I should hold your guardian as very culpable if he took no account of your letters. And I am much mistaken if your brother does not expect, as a matter of course, to overlook all the correspondence you chose to carry on. Surely he cannot consider it necessary, remonstrated Emma seriously. At my age, it is not as if I were a baby quite, but I am almost twenty. Possibly so. But whilst you are under age, you are his ward, and must have to admit to any restrictions he lays on you with a good grace. It's no use coloring and pouting. There's nothing like bearing things with a good temper, and not giving yourself airs and graces about it. There's your letter. Emma took the letter and observed as she put it in her pocket. If you will show me what you want done, I shall be happy to oblige you. Read your letter first, Emma. It may be a matter of business, and you should never delay business. Your brother always says, do what is to be done directly and do it yourself. Emma silently drew forth the letter and, breaking the seal, read the following words. My dear Miss Watson, I am sorry to trouble you with any unpleasant subjects, but I cannot forbear mentioning a circumstance which nearly concerns your family. And when you know the particulars, you can judge for yourself. Mr. Tom Musgrove, whom I had, as you know, reason to suppose engaged to one of your sisters, is now in town and has not only been for some time past paying great attention to a young lady of fortune, a friend of my own, but, as I understand, has denied all engagement to Miss Watson, spoken very disparagingly of her, and even shown letters written by her under the impression that such an engagement existed. Not knowing precisely how affairs stood between your sister and Mr. M., I dare not interfere, lest, by revealing what she may perhaps wish concealed, I should injure her and mortify you. I shall not, however, feel justified in preserving silence much longer unless I am positively assured that all engagement is at an end between them. If she has released him from the promise to which we both are witnesses, it may be important to preserve silence on its previous existence. But if, as I cannot help suspecting, he has only released himself, has deceived or deserted her, I cannot allow my friend to be misled by him and must insist on having his conduct cleared up and set in a proper light. I am sorry to be obliged to trouble you, as I feel convinced that whether secretly deceiving, openly deserting your sister, he is certainly using her extremely ill. You know I never had a good opinion of its character. I am overwhelmed with gaiety, and look back with a feeling of regret to the tranquil hours at Osborne Castle. 
Anxiously expecting your answer, I remain, dear Miss Watson, your sincere friend, Rosa Osborne. P.S. Mr. Musgrove's address is 75 Bond Street. My brother and Sir William desire all sorts of proper messages to you. Have you seen the Howards lately? Whilst Emma was reading these words, Jane was standing near her, playing with the sheet of paper in which it had been enveloped, and anxiously watching Emma's countenance to see the effect produced by the communication. She saw enough to discover that the emotion occasioned by the contents was not of a pleasurable nature. It was something which required deliberation and consideration. Mrs. Watson grew impatient. Well, what is it? cried she. You sit there pondering and pondering as if it were a dispatch from the king himself. Tell me what your difficulty is and I will help you. I think, said Emma, hesitating and embarrassed, I think I must speak to my brother about this and perhaps I had better, I mean, he would like me to consult him first before speaking even to you. Tell me what it is, said Miss Watson, burning with curiosity. Let me know all about it and I can tell you if it is necessary to consult him first. But if I tell you now, I cannot apply first to him, remonstrated Emma, and so that will not do. Oh, but you need not tell him that you told me, said Jane, as I am his wife, I should be sure to know it eventually. Can I not go to him at once, said Emma, rising? It would be much better, and as it must be done, the sooner I get over it, the better. Is it anything you are afraid of telling him, then, inquired Mrs. Watson, still more eagerly, as she followed Emma from the room? Is it about yourself, or Miss Osborne? Oh, I know. It is for Mr. Watson to draw the marriage settlements. They say she is going to be married to Sir William Gordon. Is that true? Or is it an offer from Lord Osborne? I wonder. How obstinate the child is, and how fast she runs. I must make haste, or I shall lose some of it. End of Volume 2, Chapter 7. Recording by Laurie Frankel. Volume 2, Chapter 8 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubback Mrs. Watson overtook Emma at the door of the private room, where so many important matters were settled by her husband, in time to hear an impatient, Come in, and to enter in her company. Robert was pacing up and down the room and looked excessively surprised to see the intruders. "'What in the name of all that's troublesome brings you here today?' was his courteous salutation to his wife and sister. "'I wish to show you this letter, brother,' said Emma, very humbly, with Miss Osborne's letter in her hand. "'And as it seemed to me, no time should be lost in acting on it. I have ventured to intrude.' Robert did not allow her to finish her sentence, but took the paper from her hand and read it deliberately and attentively through. Anything in the shape of business received his strictest attention, or he would never have occupied the position which he now held. When he came to the conclusion, he looked up and observed, I don't see that Jane has anything to do with this, and shall therefore beg she will leave the room. Directly, added he, seeing that his wife hesitated. She knew the tone, and was obliged to withdraw, but it was with a mental determination to plague her husband for a resolution so contrary to her wishes, though she could not settle whether the punishment should consist of boiling a leg of mutton, omitting his favorite pudding, or spoiling his chocolate. Whilst she was arranging her plans for vengeance, her husband was holding counsel high on the subject of this letter. How came Miss Osborne to know anything about it? What did she mean by saying that she and Emma were witnesses to the engagement? Was that really the case? Why had Margaret never alluded to it? Emma explained as briefly as possible when and how they two had overheard the whole conversation. Robert rubbed his hands with inexpressible glee. He's caught then, fairly caught. That is good. We shall soon bring him to terms now. Capital, to think of your eavesdropping with so much effect. But why did you never mention this before, child, when you heard me lamenting the want of witnesses? Emma asserted that she was only waiting to consult Miss Osborne on the subject. 
for as they had been mutually pledged to secrecy, she could not divulge it without her agreeing to it. Robert was in an ecstasy of hope and enjoyment. He saw a brilliant perspective of litigation, an action for breach of promise of marriage to be conducted, with all the eclat that could be given to such a proceeding, and damages given to his sister, which would enable her to marry decently out of hand. This was delightful. His first step, he determined, should be a letter from himself to the culprit, claiming his promise to Margaret, but without alluding to the witnesses to be produced. And he instructed Emma to write to Miss Osborne and tell her that her sister had never released Tom from his engagement, but was still acting on the belief that it existed, and that, therefore, she, Miss Osborne, was at liberty to inform her friend, indeed had better do so at once, that Mr. Musgrove was acting an equivocal part in paying attention to any other woman, as his hand was positively pledged to Miss Margaret Watson. This assurance from a party whom he naturally supposed unacquainted with the fact would alarm Tom, and it was possible, but Robert did not depend on it, that it might bring some offer of a compromise. Emma inquired what should be the result if, as was very probable, Mr. Musgrove should deny the engagement altogether, and trusting to there being no witnesses, refused to fulfill it. Robert assured her that in that case he should have the means of compelling him either to fulfill the contract or pay large damages. He should not have a moment's hesitation in commencing an action against him, and with Miss Osborne and Emma to support Margaret's evidence there was no doubt of the result. She was horrified to hear what was impending over her, and inquired, in a tone of something between fright and incredulity, whether he really contemplated forcing Miss Osborne to appeal in a public court of justice. "'Why should she not?' was his cool answer. "'She is as capable of giving evidence, I presume, as any other woman, and her appearance will give a great publicity to the proceeding.' "'But do you think she will like it?' suggested poor Emma, trembling for her own share of the trial as much as for her friends. I shall not trouble my head about that. I will have her subpoenaed as a witness, and she must come, whether she likes it or not. Emma was silent, but looked extremely uneasy. Her brother observed her distressed appearance, and after thinking a few minutes, addressed her. As you know so much of the Osbournes, Emma, and it really appears that you can keep a secret, which, considering your age and sex, is rather remarkable, I will tell you my whole plan, and we will see whether your wit can help me carry it out. Look here. Suppose Tom Musgrove refuses all acknowledgement of the engagement. I threaten an action, call on you and Miss Osborne as witnesses. If it really comes before a jury, she will be compelled to appear but say she dislikes it, is too fine or too delicate. Well, let her family use their influence with Musgrove to induce a marriage, and they may succeed. By threatening to make his perfidy public, by menacing him with the indignation of the family, if he compels us to resort to such extremities, possibly even by the judicious application of family interests, to procure him some situation, some sinecure appointment, or in many similar ways, the Osbornes may work upon his feelings in a way which we could never do. Meantime, say nothing. I will explain enough to Margaret, and you have only to answer all inquiries by the assurance that you are not allowed by me to mention the matter. Go now. Emma would gladly have retreated to her own room, but Jane was too sharp for her. What an immense time you have been! cried she, impatiently clutching hold of Emma's shoulder. I thought you would never come out, and I could not hear a word you said. Now tell me all about it. Emma assured her that she dared not. Her brother had so strictly forbidden all allusion to the subject. She really was not at liberty to mention a single word. Well, really, that's great impertinence of Mr. Watson. I'll give it him well for that. What can it signify whether I know it or not? I dare say a mighty matter to make so much fuss about, 
any affair you are concerned in must be so very important. No, don't go upstairs. I want you in the parlor, child. Emma reluctantly returned to the parlor. Elizabeth and Margaret were both there. But before Jane had time to expatiate upon the injustice and tyranny of her husband in denying her knowledge which did not concern her, a morning visitor was announced. The lady who entered was a Mrs. Turner, a widow with an unfashionable black dress, a good-humored but unmeaning face, and a cheerful manner. "'Well, Mrs. Watson,' cried she, "'here you are. "'amiable and industrious as ever. "'I am sure your husband must thank his lucky stars "'which gave him such a wife. "'I always consider you quite as the pattern "'for all housekeepers and married ladies. "'And such a cheerful party as I find. "'Who are these sweet girls? "'Charming creatures, I have no doubt.' "'Mr. Watson's sisters,' said Jane laconically. "'Ah, I remember.' Poor things, orphans. Miss Margaret, I beg your pardon. I ought to have known you. I believe it was the black gown deceived me. Elegant. Black always looks well. And Miss Margaret's slender figure sets it off to advantage. What a sweet, pretty face. Eyeing Emma. Really, you must be quite proud of your new sisters, Mrs. Watson. Now I don't know anything pleasanter than a pretty face. It's so cheerful. All three so remarkably good-looking, too. They are not the least like you, Mrs. Watson. Mrs. Watson made no other answer than an inquiry for Mrs. Turner's son-in-law, Mr. Miller. George! Oh, he's charming, thank you, replied the merry lady, who seemed to view everything couleur de rose up to his elbows in hops and malt. I often tell him, it's well if he be never smothered with his business. I do believe it's the most flourishing one in the town. Those little darlings, his children, you cannot think what angels they are, but they do want a mother sadly. Now, Mrs. Watson, you could not recommend one, could you? Looking slyly at the three young ladies, any nice, steady, sensible young woman of six or seven and twenty? George need not look out for a fortune, thank heaven. He's a plenty and to spare of his own. But a nice, good-humored wife, who would not thwart him or vex his children. That's what he wants. Well, cried Mrs. Watson with delight, let him come here. I dare say either of the girls would not say him nay. They have no money, so they must take what they can get. It does not do for such to be too nice. Not but what even the nicest might well be satisfied with George Miller. Aye, indeed. Well, they might. Do you know I am at him, day and night, to marry again? And he always says I must choose him a wife, for he has not time to see for himself. Now I'll make him come here tonight and see what he'll say. Do so pray, said Jane. We are expecting a few friends to dinner and tea. Let him come in the evening when his business is over. But don't say a word of our plans. Let him be taken by surprise, you know. Well, exclaimed Elizabeth, I like your plan amazingly. And I give you fair warning, Mrs. Turner, that I shall do my utmost to please your son-in-law and take the situation of Mrs. Miller. I am convinced he is a most delightful man, and well worth looking after. Well done, my dear, cried Mrs. Turner. I like honesty and candor of all things, and am delighted to find you are not too proud to own that you, like all other girls, want to be married. Some pretend to deny it, but it makes no difference. I know what they think secretly, and see through them all the same. We will not try to trifle with such penetration, said Elizabeth, laughing. Ask my sisters if they agree to your assertion. Oh, I know Miss Margaret does, cried Mrs. Turner. She is longing to be married at this moment, and I could point out the gentleman, too. 
My George has no chance with her. Margaret giggled and twisted about. Only think of my affairs becoming so public as my wishes to be known like that. You are a dangerous person, I know of old Mrs. Turner. Well, I must be going. I have to call on the Greens this morning. Sweet girls, the Greens, ain't they? Amazingly clever. Very plain, though. Well, well, one can't have everything. Do you know I plague George about being in love with Anne Green, and he cannot bear the sight of her in consequence? It is such fun. I know very little of the Greens, observed Mrs. Watson grandly. They are not in our set. I dare say soap boiling is a very good trade, but I have a fancy it must soil the fingers. Mr. Miller will not meet the Greens here at all. Mrs. Turner did not stay to defend the Greens from the aspersions cast on them by the amiable Mrs. Watson, but hurried away to praise them to themselves, certain that in this case her eulogy would be well received. Hardly had she left the room when Robert entered with an open letter in his hand and inquired of Emma if she had written as he desired her to do. Emma acknowledged that she had not. Then do it directly, said he, and learn never to delay letters of business. Only do what you have to do at once. It is idle and worse to put it off. Emma did not attempt to offer any excuse, but was preparing to leave the room to obey, when Jane stopped her and recommended her remaining where she was to write. There were plenty of paper, pens, and ink in the room, and there could not be the smallest occasion for leaving the parlor. She could not very well avoid yielding to this request, which, however, she suspected strongly was only made in hopes of obtaining some information relative to the letter in question. Meanwhile, Robert, going up to Margaret, showed her the letter he held in his hand and desired her to read it. "'Oh, how very good of you!' cried Margaret when she had run through the contents. How kind of you to take it up so warmly, you who never believed that what I said was true. How glad I am that you have come round at last to believe my assertions. Now, I trust, Tom will relent, and my blighted affections will once more revive and flourish. Don't talk to me of blighted affections, replied her brother impatiently. Don't bother me with such nonsense. Do learn, if you can to think of matters of business as business, and in an affair of this kind, try to speak in a rational, sensible way. Do you think Musgrove will yield to this representation? Oh, no doubt of it, said Margaret. At least, I dare say he will. But suppose he should not. What will you do then? It appears, replied Robert, that both Emma and Miss Osborne heard what passed between you and as, in that case, they can both appear as witnesses for you. I have no doubt of getting a verdict in your favor, and very considerable damages from any jury in the county. Margaret sat staring at her brother in amazement, and then repeated, Miss Osborne and Emma? Are you sure? And turning to Emma, she exclaimed, Where were you then, I should like to know? We were concealed from your sight replied her sister, by some orange trees, and thus we heard all you said without intending it. Listening were you, very pretty indeed, honorable conduct, from you too, who make such a fuss about propriety and honesty and all that. But, after all, you are no better than your neighbors, it seems, said she spitefully. I am sure I am very sorry, said Emma, with tears in her eyes, if I have done anything to vex you. But indeed, though it may seem strange, I really could not help it. Oh, no, of course not, pursued Margaret, tossing her head back. People never can help doing anything which happens to suit their fancy. However, before I venture to talk another time, I will take care and ascertain if you are in the room or not. Such meanness listening! It appears very strange to me, cried Mrs. Watson, anxious to understand it all, that we should suddenly hear that Emma knew all about it, when Margaret was so long wishing to have some evidence to prove her words. 
Why did not Emma say so sooner then? And it seems still more extraordinary to me, interposed Elizabeth, that Margaret should be so angry when she thus unexpectedly finds what she wishes for. Emma told me of this long ago, and told me that Miss Osborne had induced her to be silent on the subject for several reasons. But I know, from what she told me then, it was quite accidental, and could not be avoided. They're overhearing Tom's conversation with you, Margaret. And it appears strangest of all to me, observed Robert contemptuously, that women never can keep to the point on any subject but must start off on twenty different branches, which have nothing to do with the end in view. What does it signify to you, Margaret, when, how, or why your conversation was overheard? When, on the fact of its being so, depends on your chance of getting two or three thousand pounds in your pocket. What does it matter as to Emma's motives for listening, so long as she did listen to such good purpose? Margaret pouted and replied only by some indistinct murmurs. Her brother then went on to explain to her the circumstance of Miss Osborne's interposition, showing her, greatly to Emma's annoyance, the letter that morning received from London, and informing her of what he had desired might be written in answer. Margaret's feelings on the occasion formed a most comic mixture of pleasure and indignation. She was excessively gratified at being talked about, and made the subject of letters to and from Miss Osborne and the notion of being plaintiff in an action at law seemed to have almost as great a charm for her imagination as being married. But then she was sorely mortified at the information that Tom Musgrove's infidelity was so open and evident. She was vexed, bitterly vexed, at the idea of a rival, and she could hardly console herself for such an indignity by the expectation of the damages which were to be awarded her. She looked very foolish and very spiteful when her sister-in-law made some ill-natured observations about overrating the powers of her own charms, and still more so when Robert added that he had no doubt the fellow was drunk when he made the offer, but it did not matter if he was. Emma was very glad when she had finished her letter, and was able to escape from the subject by quitting the house for a walk with Elizabeth. Jane had some errands for them in the town but as soon as they were fulfilled, they were able to turn their steps towards the country, and escaping into green fields and pleasant lanes, refreshing their eyes and their tempers by watching for the first appearance of the spring flowers. Such a stroll was a real treat to Emma, and gave her strength to endure the numberless petty annoyances which Mrs. Watson heaped on her. She felt, whilst she could still enjoy a few hours of quiet converse with her sister, still breathe the fresh air of heaven, and seek the simple but unalloyed satisfaction to be derived from contemplating the works of providence, that she had still blessings to be thankful for, that her situation, with all its drawbacks, ought still to call forth feelings of gratitude, when compared with the misfortunes of others of her fellow beings, and that it became her to be ready to acknowledge this, lest she should be taught to prize the comforts she still enjoyed by their withdrawal. With these sentiments in her heart, she strove to act upon them, and when Elizabeth would have turned the conversation to past times and reverted to Mr. Howard and his sister, she had the strength of mind to turn away from the dangerous pleasure and pursue some other topic. They stayed out rather late. That is to say, they were not in the house till rather more than half-past four, and they were to dine at five. They met their sister-in-law on the stairs in a great bustle. "'Oh, dear!' I have been in such a worry for you, Emma, cried she. How very tiresome that you should be so late. I want Jeanetta dressed and her hair curled, and Betsy has not time to attend to it, because she has to dress my head. And here have I been waiting and waiting whilst you have been wandering over the country amusing yourselves without the least regard to me or my comfort. I am sorry to have put you in any inconvenience, but I had not the least idea you wanted me replied Emma. What can I do for you now? The wrath of any one but Mrs. Watson must have been disarmed and pacified by Emma's good-tempered answer and the sweetness of her manner, but Jane's was a disposition which yielded only if violently opposed, but became every hour more encroaching when given way to. 
To Elizabeth, who boldly spoke her mind on all occasions, she was far more submissive. But over Emma she could tyrannize without fear of a rude or thoughtless retort, a rebellious action, or even a discontented look. Consequently, Emma was now dispatched to the nursery to perform the office of maid to her little niece, whilst the woman, whose business it was to attend to this matter, was occupied in arranging her mistress's toilette. At length, Mrs. Watson was ready, and sweeping into the nursery with as much finery as her mourning would allow her to display. She took away her little girl and allowed Emma time to arrange her own dress for dinner. On descending to the drawing-room, she found her sister-in-law engaged in talking and listening eagerly to the important gentleman from the country, for whose sake the dinner-party had been arranged. He was a broad-faced, portly man, who filled up the armchair in which he was seated with perfect accuracy of adjustment, and whose countenance seemed to Emma to express a sort of hungry tolerance of Mrs. Watson's attentions. Whenever the door opened, and admitted with each fresh arrival a strong scent of dinner from the kitchen, he seemed to imbibe the odor with peculiar satisfaction, and after inhaling sundry times the teeming atmosphere, heaved a sigh indicative of anticipation and comfortable assurance for the future. The fluttering of Mrs. Watson's trimmings, the waving of her ringlets, and the affected little bursts of merriment in which she indulged for his amusement hardly discomposed him at all so intent was he on the forthcoming dinner. Robert Watson was standing over the fire, talking to a gloomy, dark-browed young man, a stranger to Emma, who seemed to consider that in conferring the favor of his bodily presence on the Watsons, he was doing them so great an honor that there was no occasion for him to trouble himself with any further efforts, and that the absence of mind in which he ostentatiously indulged was due to his own dignity impaired, or at least endangered, by the situation in which he had suffered himself to be placed. There was also a thin, white-faced individual, something between a man and a boy, who was chattering to Margaret with all the ease and volubility of an old acquaintance. Emma remembered that she had heard Jane and Margaret speaking of a Mr. Alfred Fremantle, whose family were quite genteel country people, as being articled to Mr. Watson and concluded that the individual thus mentioned was before her. Just as she had settled this point in her own mind, and seated herself near Elizabeth, she perceived the young man make a prodigious theatrical start, and heard him exclaim in a tone which could not be called low, "'For heaven's sake, who is that exquisitely beautiful creature?' "'It's only Emma. My sister, Emma?' said Margaret, evidently vexed. "'Do you think her so very pretty? Well, I don't think I should call her so. She blushes divinely, cried he, fixing his eyes on her. What a glorious complexion, and her name is Emma? Sweet Emma. Emma was half amused, but almost angry at his impertinence. Had he been a little older, her anger would have been more decided. But he seemed such a mere boy that she attributed his offensive behavior to youthful ignorance a charitable construction for which he would certainly not have thanked her. Having stared at her for some minutes with unwavering perseverance, he rose, and crossing the room, let himself drop into a chair close by her, with a weight and impetus quite astonishing to Emma, when she considered the slight figure which produced such a concussion. The next moment he opened a conversation with her by saying, "'I have just experienced a most delicious sensation,' Miss Emma Watson, the sight of you has exactly recalled the image of a cousin of mine, from whom unfortunate circumstances have so imperatively separated me. Poor girl, you have no idea how lovely she was. Indeed, was Emma's reply, quite willing to admit the truth of his assertion, and equally ready to let the subject rest, but he had no intention of the sort. It is charming to be reminded of an absent friend. Delightful. Exquisite. Are you likely to make a long stay at Croydon, Miss Emma Watson? It is uncertain, replied Emma. And you are actually living in the same house in which I spend the greater part of my weary days, and nothing but these envious walls conceals you from my sight? Is not that hard? Really, no, replied Emma, 
unable to control a smile at the absurdity of his manner. I cannot say I think so at all. You don't. What a monstrous bore Mrs. Watson is. I am sure you will agree to that. She is my sister-in-law, said Emma. Yes, I know, but that's the very reason you should hate her. I detest mine. And you consider that an infallible rule, of course, since you suggest it to me. I am certain, said the young man, that our sympathies are strong. There is something in the turn of your head, the sparkle of your eye, the formation of your upper lip, that betokens decided participation in the feelings which coruscate, burn, and almost consume your humble servant. What a fine day it has been, observed Emma purposely choosing the most commonplace subject in reply to his rhapsody. He looked astonished and perplexed, then said slowly, I fear, after all, we are not kindred souls. Do you love music? Pretty well, replied Emma, determined to keep down to the most commonplace level in her conversation. He cast up his eyes and turned away for a moment, throwing himself back in his chair and elevating his chin in the air, whilst he carefully combed his hair with his fingers. Presently, however, he returned again to the attack. I suspect you are funny. I beg your pardon? said Emma, looking perplexed in her turn. I say, I suspect you are laughing at me all this time. Oh, said she. At this moment dinner was announced, and whilst the fat gentleman was slowly emerging from his chair to accompany Mrs. Watson to the dining parlor, Emma's new acquaintance was pouring out a voluble strain of nonsense in her ear. To think of reasonable and reasoning creatures lowering themselves to an equality with the beasts of the field, by indulging in what is falsely called the pleasures of the table, to think of their voluntarily assembling only to eat, degrading their intellects by sitting down to spend two hours over roast mutton or apple pie. Really, it is inconceivable. Allow me to conduct you and your fair sister Margaret to the dinner table, sweetest Miss Margaret, presenting her his hand as he spoke. My felicity is beyond expression. I can only equal my situation between you two. To love amongst the roses." At the dinner table, Mrs. Watson appeared in all her glory. The dinner was really good, and as the favored guest inhaled the odor of the soup, it was evident from the complacent expression which stole over his features that he was well satisfied with the prospect now before him. Mrs. Watson's tactics were suited to the occasion. She devoted her attention to helping him to the best things on the table, the most dainty morsel, the epicure's piece, was in every case heaped on his plate. It would have been amusing to an observer to watch the struggle, which in some cases occurred between Robert's self-interest and self-love. His appetite was at variance with his policy. It was difficult for him to yield the precedence at his own table to the love of good eating exhibited by another. To see his wife thus liberally disposed to another man was a severe blow. And whilst he acknowledged the justice, prudence, and propriety of thus acting, it went to his heart to behold it. Her attentions, her flattery, her winning smiles, she was welcome to indulge him with. But the dainty morsel from the cod's head? The largest share from the sweet bread fricassee? The liver wing of the spring chicken? These he could not resign without a sigh. Mr. Alfred Fremantle, however, did not leave Emma much leisure to make remarks. He had seated himself by her side at table and was paying her an infinite number of what he considered delicate attentions, calling incessantly to the footman to bring her vegetables, urging her to try every dish on the table, helping her to salt, and filling her glass with wine to the very brim, as he asserted all ladies liked bumpers, at the same time pouring into her ears the most commonplace nonsense about his devotion to the fair sex, his zeal in performing his devoirs, and sundry other observations of the sort. Emma gave him no encouragement, but he did not require any. Perfectly satisfied with his own charms, and accustomed to consider himself as superior to his ordinary companions, he was well convinced that her shyness, not her dissatisfaction, kept her silent, 
and never for a moment supposed she could be otherwise than charmed with his conversation and company. The dinner appeared to her, consequently, very dull. But at last the moment of release came. Her sister-in-law gave the signal for departure, and the four ladies returned to the drawing-room. Here they were no sooner assembled than Margaret commenced a violent attack on Emma for her scandalous flirtation with Mr. Fremantle. He used to be a particular admirer of Margaret's, and she could not with patience resign his admiration to another. In fact, she had not strength of mind to see with composure any woman engross the attention of a man with whom she was acquainted, all whose words and looks of admiration she wished to appropriate to herself, for having been for a couple of winters the reigning belle of her small neighborhood, she still fancied her charm supreme and was quite insensible of the fact, obvious to everyone else, that she was now only exhibiting the remains of former beauty. Her bloom had been of short duration. She was too fretful to preserve the plumpness necessary to show her complexion to advantage, and she early lost the glow and the fairness which had formed her greatest charm. Alfred Fremantle was not now to be won by all her wiles. Emma's newer face and the sort of wondering indifference with which she heard his compliments and his ready-prepared jokes formed an irresistible charm to him. He declared her freshness was piquant, her innocence was exquisite, that it was delicious to meet with a pretty girl so perfectly unhackneyed in the ways of the world, little suspecting that the simple manner which he took for ignorance of life resulted entirely from her just appreciation of his little talent and the total want of interest excited by such flattery as he was capable of administering. But she could make no impression on Margaret by declarations of indifference or assertions that she had thought him decidedly disagreeable. Her sister considered such words as a mere subterfuge, and would not believe that Mr. Alfred Fremantle was a sort of person to slight one girl for another, a stranger, without some special encouragement to do so. Jane took up Margaret's cause. As she was always delighted to have an opportunity of finding fault with Emma, of whom she felt a decided jealousy, and a long and serious lecture was the consequence, which was only interrupted by the arrival of some of the evening visitors. The reproaches which were showered on Emma were, it is true, parried in some degree by Elizabeth, who, although greatly respecting her sister-in-law, did not feel so much afraid of her as to refrain on that account from expressing her opinion. She vigorously defended Emma to the best of her abilities, and there was no saying how long the dispute might have been carried on but for the arrival of Mr. George Miller and a young lady, his half-sister, who accompanied him. Emma was obliged, as well as she could, to conceal the tears which were swimming in her eyes and anxious to avoid any further animadversions. She seated herself as far as possible from the gentleman, and occupied herself with some work which she had undertaken for Mrs. Watson. She could not, however, restrain her attention which was speedily engaged by the young lady, whom she now saw for the first time. Annie Miller was not regularly pretty, but there was an expression of liveliness and spirit in her face, which would have won the palm from twenty professed beauties. Her manners suited her face exactly, lively, arch, and yet perfectly unaffected. She did not seem to know what constraint and fear were. She said whatever came into her head, but that head was so overflowing with good humor and kindness that there was no room for malice or ill will to abide there. Well, Mrs. Watson, cried she, as I found you had invited my brother for this evening, I have invited myself. I cannot imagine why you left me out, but feeling certain you would be delighted to see me, I slipped on my second best gown and came. Now I expect you to make me a civil speech in reply. She was very certain of having a civil speech made. Mr. George Miller was a man of too much consequence amongst his own set for his sister to be slighted in any degree. His fortune was large, and his disposition liberal. He was a widower, and he was very fond of his sister. Annie, therefore, was certain of compliments and welcomes, and was precisely the person to be received by Mrs. Watson with extreme rapture. "'I did so want to be acquainted with your other sisters,' added Miss Miller, "'that I think I should have ventured here had I been even certain you would scold instead of caressing me. 
I always envy everyone who is blessed with a sister and think it must be the most delightful relationship in the world. And I dare say your brother agrees with you, said Mrs. Watson, smiling graciously. Do you, George? cried the young lady. No, no, he considers me, without exception, the most troublesome of all his encumbrances, a charge which he is always trying to get rid of by inducing someone else to undertake it. There is no telling you the pains he is at to throw the burden on some other unhappy man. Her brother shook his head at his young sister, who only smiled in reply and continued, Hitherto have I defeated his arts and preserved myself from the snare. How long such good luck may continue to attend me, I cannot tell. Well, Miss Miller, there's a good opportunity tonight, said Mrs. Watson, for we have, amongst our visitors, a young and single man, who, I believe, is quite ready for anyone who takes the trouble of catching him. So if you think him worth the trouble, he must be very different from any man I ever saw yet, interrupted Annie. Do you mean your charming young clerk, Mr. Alfred Frivolous, as I call him? Oh, dear, no, cried Mrs. Watson. A very different person. He is very well off, has large property in Suffolk, quite a grand estate there, with no near connections, no sisters to be in your way, a most beautiful house, respectable family, I believe quite one of the first families in the county, and bears a high character. And may I ask the name of this desirable individual? inquired Miss Miller, assuming an appearance of intense interest. Grant, Mr. Henry Grant. I am sure you will be charmed with him. Describe him. I am rather particular as to appearance. Why, I cannot say that he is absolutely handsome, but very dark, dark and genteel, quite genteel, I assure you. Lively, inquired Annie. Perhaps he may be, but I do not know that I have heard him speak. Charming, cried Annie. Dine with you and yet not address you? His must be the very refinement of good manners, the very cream of gentility indeed. Tell me some more about this delightful personage. Does he like ladies? I cannot say, but though he seems rather shy of them now, depend upon it, he is all the easier caught. Aye, by those who try. I can fancy that certainly I really must exert myself. Your fascinating description quite rouses my energies. And I am sure if you do set about it, your success is certain, continued Mrs. Watson. Thank you, my dear madam, for your encouraging opinion. I fear you rate my powers too highly, laughed Annie, bowing with mock ceremony. A young and inexperienced girl like me cannot pretend to anything so wonderful as the captivation of a dark Mr. Grant with a large estate and a contempt for women, you must not expect such a triumph from me. Indeed, I am certain you will succeed to admiration, cried Mrs. Watson eagerly. Show me how to begin, then, pursued Annie. Teach me the first step. I should recommend your catching his eye in some striking attitude, as I dare say he is fond of paintings. Something very elegant to attract him at once, replied the married lady quite sincerely. Indeed, let me practice, cried Miss Miller, placing herself in an affected attitude in an armchair. Will this do? Or this? Do I look sufficiently captivating now? Which becomes me most, languor or liveliness? You, I see, are determined to make game of the whole thing said Mrs. Watson. Will nothing induce you to think well of a single man? Are you so devoted a follower of celibacy yourself? Ah, you are quite right. Liberty, charming liberty. No one knows its value till, like me, they have sacrificed it. Ah, I say you are quite right. Only, as you are so uncommonly fascinating, I cannot wonder if others should seek to win you. You are far too complimentary, Mrs. Watson, said the young lady, with affected gravity, and rising from her chair, she walked up to Emma and commenced an acquaintance with her by admiring her work. Emma was almost afraid to speak to her, lest the doing so should excite her sister-in-law's wrath again. But Annie Miller had taken a fancy to her face, 
I was not to be repulsed. Her lively chat soon drew off her companion's thoughts from the disagreeable circumstances which had previously occurred, and half an hour passed pleasantly. Meantime, Mrs. Watson, with judicious precaution, had set Elizabeth down to backgammon with George Miller, and guessing from the lively conversation carried on amidst the quick rattle of the dice that all was going right there. She left them to improve their acquaintance in peace. Very soon after this, the gentlemen strolled into the room. Mr. Grant first, as if anxious to make the more impression by his appearance, he looked round the room, and, as if satisfied by this survey that there was no one sufficiently attractive to induce him to engage in the labor of conversation, he walked away and took refuge in a small inner apartment, which opened from the drawing-room, and which was lighted by a single lamp. Miss Miller shrugged her shoulders slightly, and gave Emma an expressive look, but had no time for words, as they were at that moment joined by Margaret and Mr. Fremantle. The latter made Annie a flourishing bow, whilst exclaiming, "'Miss Miller, by all that is fair and felicitous, this is an unexpected pleasure.' She did not seem to find it so, but looked cold and careless, whilst she made him as slight a return for his salutation as possible. "'Would that I possessed an artist's pencil to portray the group before me,' continued the young man with affected rapture. The graces exactly. It does indeed deserve to be commemorated on canvas or in marble. At all events, it is forever impressed on the tablet of my heart. Margaret giggled. Emma looked immovably grave, whilst Annie smiled scornfully and said, What is that, Mr. Fremantle? Pray repeat that last sentence again, that I may commit it to memory. It certainly is a thing very repulsive to human nature to repeat a sentence twice over, especially if it is a flourishing speech which only answers when thrown off hand at once. Annie was perfectly aware that she could not have found a more effectual way of tormenting Mr. Fremantle. He looked very silly and replied in a qualifying tone, I only said, I only meant that I should never forget it. Oh, replied the young lady, was that all? I am sorry I gave you the trouble of repeating it. Miss Miller is too much accustomed to homage, continued he, for my feeble attempts to create any sensation in her mind. She despises such a humble worshipper as her poor devoted servant. I beg your pardon, returned she, but I never despise anything humble. Quite the contrary, and your overwhelming complimentary speeches really raise such a variety of sensations, by which, I suppose, you mean sentiments in my mind that I positively know not which way to look. He really thought she meant to flatter him, and smiled in a way that showed all his white teeth. Yet, in conversing with Annie Miller, he always had a lurking suspicion that she was laughing at him, and therefore never felt quite at his ease with her. Do sing to us, said he presently, in an insinuating tone. It is such ecstasy to hear you sing. Pray indulge us with the flowers of the forest or one of your other charming Scotch melodies. Annie compressed her lips and only bowed her head slightly in reply, then turning to Emma, addressed her on the subject of music. Several other people joined the party, and the tray with tea, pound cake, and muffin made its progress round the room. Mr. Fremantle insisted on helping each lady to the refreshing beverage, as he called it himself, and passed many small and rather pointless jokes on the subject of the quantity of sugar they each required. Sweets to the sweet, was a favorite quotation of his, and one which he usually found well received. Look at that man, whispered Annie, pointing to Mr. Grant, apparently fast asleep on the sofa. Should you not like to throw a cloak over his head? that his slumbers may be undisturbed. Oh, I'll tell you what I will do. Look now. And stealing quietly into the inner room, she softly but effectually extinguished the lamp, and then returning closed the door, and placing a chair against it, seated herself there, leaving Mr. Grant in complete darkness. To finish his nap, as she said, without risk of being roused by intrusive visitors. Mrs. Watson did not see this maneuver, but Margaret and Emma laughed quietly, whilst Alfred, overcome by excessive amusement, 
dropped on a sofa and rolled about in ecstasy. George Miller, whose table was near, looked round. "'What naughty trick are you about now, Annie?' said he suspiciously. "'I?' cried the young lady, with well-affected surprise. "'Who's so quiet and well-behaved in this room as myself? "'Your suspicions are derogatory to me and disgraceful to yourself, George.' and she drew herself up in an attitude of offended dignity, crossing her hands in her lap and looking straight before her. George went on with his game, and Mr. Alfred Fremantle, having recovered his composure, resumed his station by Miss Miller's side. He inquired how long she intended to keep the poor man in the dark. Miss Miller said he was in the black hole and should continue there till he asked to get out. For, indeed, his voice had never yet been heard, and she was anxious to settle the question whether he was or was not dumb. Presently afterwards another of the party came up, and begged in the name of Mrs. Watson that Miss Miller would favor them with a song. Annie possessed the rare talent of singing without accompaniment, and without affectation, when requested by the mistress of the house. She immediately complied, and warbled some beautiful old ballads to the great delight of the company. She did not change her position, but sat with her back to the door, when, in the midst of her second song, a loud crash was heard in the little room where Mr. Grant was confined. This was followed by vociferous and angry exclamations, at which everyone started forward with various intonations of surprise, wondering what was the matter. Miss Miller did not cease singing or move her seat, but merely waved her hand to keep back those who pressed on her and finished her song with perfect self-possession. When, however, a second part was suddenly taken to her performance by a strange voice in the next room, everyone was still more astonished and insisted on opening the door to discover the minstrel. When this was done, they saw Mr. Grant leaning quietly against one chair, whilst another overthrown beside him revealed the origin of the noise which had at first arrested them. He was in the dark, of course and seemed, as he stood there, so sleepy and dull, that they could hardly imagine he was likewise the author of the melodious sounds they had overheard. How he came there, why he was in the dark, and why he remained so, were questions rapidly asked by such as knew him well enough to speak to him. But he could give no explanation. He only knew that he had woke up and found himself on the sofa in the dark, and thought he was in bed, until rolling off convinced him that he was not that he had fallen on the floor and made a noise, he supposed, and that he should be particularly glad to know whether Mrs. Watson was in the constant habit of locking up her guests in the dark. Mrs. Watson came forward full of apologies and regrets. She really could not imagine how it had happened, or who had shut the door. It must have been so purely accidental. She was excessively shocked and particularly grieved, and she hoped it would never occur again. Nothing could be more admirable than the air of perfect innocence and ignorance which Annie Miller assumed through the whole scene. To have seen her face no one would have imagined that she was in the smallest degree inculpated in the false imprisonment which so afflicted poor Mr. Grant, and his slumber had been far too real and unfeigned for him to have any idea of the offender. Alfred Fremantle indeed drew all the suspicions on himself by his immoderate laughter and the facetious observations which he made at the discovery. Soon after this, card tables were formed, and the whole party sat down to different games, which occupied the rest of the evening. Emma felt on parting that she should like to know more of Annie Miller, and she found the next morning that her wish was likely to be gratified, for the young lady called in the course of the forenoon and expressed the strongest desire to carry on an acquaintance with both the sisters. Margaret, whom she had known previously, and for whom she certainly entertained no very strong predilection, did not seem inclined to join the party which Annie tried to arrange for a walk. The feelings of jealousy and dislike which any pretty girl awakened in Margaret's mind were peculiarly vivid towards Annie Miller, and she naturally shrank from bringing herself much in contact with her. Mrs. Watson came into the room just as Miss Miller was pressing the two other sisters to join her. As soon as she understood how the case stood, 
being at that time peculiarly cross with Emma on account of the admiration she had excited on the previous night, she interposed in this way. Indeed, my dear Miss Miller, it is most kind of you to propose such a thing, and I have no doubt but that the girls feel excessively obliged to you, but it is impossible for Emma to accept it. Loath as I am to refuse any request of yours, I cannot really accede to this one. Her duty must confine her within doors this morning. She has calls upon her time which must not be set aside. She must therefore forego the gratification you propose. Emma could not help feeling rather astonished at hearing such a declaration, as she was quite unaware of any particular duties which would compel her to remain in the house that morning and she was quite puzzled what to answer when Annie Miller said coaxingly, Why can you not put off your business till the afternoon and go with us now? What have you so very particular to do? I suppose my sister-in-law wants me, said she, coloring and hesitating. And, of course, if so, it is necessary I should stay. Oh, I thought it might be some penance you were to perform something quite wonderful and romantic. But really, I think you might contrive to delay it and accompany us today. You are uncommonly kind, again interrupted Mrs. Watson, but there is so much of regularity and system absolutely necessary where very young people are concerned, that whilst Emma continues under my care, I cannot allow her to be running out at all hours." though if any one could tempt me to relax in my rules, it would be you, I assure you. The idea of a young woman of Emma's age not being at liberty to walk or sit still according to her own fancy appeared to Annie Miller very extraordinary, and her wonder and annoyance were equally shared by Emma herself. Now hearing for the first time of rules that had never to her knowledge existed at all, and, feeling unable to contend against the assumption of authority which her sister-in-law exercised over her proceedings, without the risk of causing an actual quarrel with her on the subject, she began to look forward with considerable dread, and to wonder what would come next. Well, said Miss Miller, if it is not convenient for Miss Emma to walk now, will you tell me when and at what hour I may look forward to that pleasure? Exceedingly as I regret that your rules have disappointed me today, there is this comfort that they ensure my gratification at some other time when I understand your arrangements. At what time does your sister take exercise? Mrs. Watson was completely caught and excessively puzzled what to say. She hesitated for a moment and then observed, Well, as I do not like to thwart any plan of yours, I will try another day and make arrangements to gratify you, my dear Miss Miller. In the meantime, I recommend you to take your walk today without any reference to Emma. Miss Miller assented with a sigh, and she and Elizabeth set off together. End of chapter. Recording by McKenna March, Bremerton, Washington. Volume 2, Chapter 9 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubbock. A very pretty thing, indeed, exclaimed Mrs. Watson the moment the door closed on them. A very pretty and reasonable thing for a girl like you, Miss Emma, coming into this house as a dependent, without a farthing in your pocket, or an expectation of any kind. A very pretty thing, I say, for you to go flaunting and jaunting about with all the best company in the town. I can tell you, if this is the way you go on, I shall take care and keep you upstairs when I have visitors." I suppose you hope for an opportunity for carrying on your acquaintance with Alfred Fremantle. Or perhaps you are looking out for George Miller himself. I see I must keep a firm hand over you, or I shall have some disgraceful proceedings, no doubt. A girl of your age to be so given up to flirtation. It is quite shocking. I do not know what I have done, replied Emma, struggling with her feelings. 
to deserve your reproaches. Miss Miller asked me to walk with her, but how am I to blame for that? Don't answer me, miss. It is exceedingly impertinent and disrespectful, and I will not put up with it from you. If you imagine because you have been acquainted with the Osbournes and those grand folks that you are to be mistress here and do as you like, you will find yourself excessively mistaken. I shall allow nothing of the kind, I assure you. Go to the nursery and take care of the little girl and tell the nursemaid I want her to go on an errand for me. Try and make yourself useful if you can and show some gratitude for the extraordinary liberality of your brother in receiving a beggar like you into his house. Emma's spirit rose and tempted her strongly to rebel. Her first impulse was to go to her own room and shut herself in there. But she remembered that she was powerless and totally without effectual support in the house. Elizabeth, it was true, would take her part, but she could only talk, not act, and as any contention must be fruitless, ending inevitably in her own defeat, she wisely determined to submit as quietly as possible, endeavoring to suppress her unavoidable feelings of repugnance and mortification, and trying to remember that since she was actually indebted to her brother for food and shelter, it became her to try by every means in her power to lessen the unwelcome burden. She went accordingly as she was desired to the nursery, and remained the rest of the morning in charge of Janetta, whose increasing attachment towards her kind new aunt really gave her satisfaction and made the time pass as pleasantly as possible under such circumstances. It distressed Elizabeth a good deal that Emma was not allowed to walk with her, and as she could never disguise her feelings, she immediately expressed this to her companion, adding that she was afraid Emma could never be happy at Robert's house, as Jane seemed to have taken a decided dislike to her. Annie exclaimed at the idea. She could not conceive it possible that anyone could dislike Emma. Those delightful dark eyes, those elegant ringlets, and the general grace of her appearance were, in her opinion, so strongly indicative of an amiable, lively, and ingenuous mind that nobody could take offense at her. She was most enthusiastic in her praises, and Elizabeth felt gratified. This conversation passed on their way to Miss Miller's home where she wished to call before starting for a country walk. She led her companion up at once to her own apartments, and whilst she left her for a moment in her dressing room to make some arrangements in private, Elizabeth, who to pass the time was looking at some books on the table, was suddenly interrupted by the entrance of George Miller. Her back being turned towards the door, the disguise of her bonnet and her cloak prevented his recognizing her, and concluding it to be his sister, he advanced hastily and laying his hand on her shoulder, he said, My dear Annie, when on her turning her face towards him, he of course discovered his mistake. He looked excessively confused for a moment, but Elizabeth laughed and took it so easily that he soon recovered himself. She explained to him why she was waiting there, and on hearing that they were preparing to take a country walk, he declared that it was a holiday with him today, and if they would not object, he would accompany them. Indeed, he added, I think it my duty to go with you, or that wicked sister of mine would infallibly walk too far and make herself ill. She is not to be trusted in the country, I assure you. Elizabeth did not feel inclined to raise any objection to this arrangement, as she was quite as well satisfied with what she saw as with what she heard of Mr. Miller, and did not feel disposed to retract her previous declaration in his favor. Their walk proved as agreeable as she could desire, and only left her the wish that she could have such another, and Emma with her. They were out a considerable time, as George Miller proposed visiting a small farm in which he took much pride, and which particularly delighted Elizabeth. The arrangement of his dairy, the welfare of his lambs, the progress of his poultry, were all subjects exactly to her taste and she entered heart and soul into the matter. Her interest was far too sincere for him to be otherwise than flattered by it, and he came to the conclusion that she was a very delightful young woman, with more intelligence and a clearer head than any town-bred young lady of his acquaintance. 
He determined to take her opinion and advice on the subject of making cream cheeses, and resolved to rear a calf which she had admired, instead of sending it to the butchers the following week. They were left a good deal to entertain each other, as Annie had chosen to unchain a large Newfoundland dog kept at the farm, and gone off in company with it for a gamble in the meadows. When every part of the establishment had been carefully visited, and some of the hops in the nearest fields inspected, Elizabeth began to think it was time for her to go home. But Annie had not yet rejoined them, and, having quite lost sight of her during the last hour, they had nothing to do but to sit down and wait patiently, if they could, for her appearance. The house, which was only inhabited by a bailiff and his wife, was small but pretty, and Elizabeth was eloquent in her praise of everything she saw, declaring with perfect unreserve how very much she should prefer living in that charming little house to inhabiting the best mansion in the town. However, as time passed on, and she remembered the distance she had to walk before reaching home, she began to be rather uneasy, well knowing how extremely displeased Robert would be if they were late for dinner, as seemed probable. She confided her fears to George Miller, confessing with perfect candor that she was very much afraid of her brother's displeasure. He immediately suggested, as a remedy, that if their return to Croydon was deferred later than she liked, she should give them the pleasure of her company at their own family meal, assuring her that there was not the smallest risk of Mrs. Turner's being angry, even if they kept her waiting an hour. At the same time, he said that, for that very reason, he should be sorry to do so, and he, therefore, hoped his sister would soon join them. At length, after trying their patience till Elizabeth was surprised it did not fail, the truant girl returned, and when her brother attempted to scold her, she laughingly placed her hand over his mouth, and desired him to behave well before her friends at least. There would be time enough for him to find fault in the course of the evening. He could keep awake on purpose. He called her, in reply, a saucy girl, and threatened that another time he would not take her out walking with him, whilst she persisted in asserting that it was she to whom he was obliged for his excursion and that she and Miss Watson could have done perfectly well without him. They then commenced their return homewards, and George told his sister to invite Miss Watson to dine with them on the plea of being too late for her own dinner. Elizabeth expressed herself exceedingly ready to comply, and it was so settled. When within half a mile of the town, they met Alfred Fremantle, who was enjoying a stroll on his escape from the office. Uninvited, he joined them, and placed himself by the side of Miss Miller, who was leaning on her brother's arm. She put up her lip in a very contemptuous way, and a moment after changed to the other side, and found a refuge for herself between Elizabeth and George, where she was safe from him. He saw the maneuver, and mortified at it, tried in his turn to mortify her, by enthusiastic praises of the absent Emma. "'What a sweet, charming girl she is!' I don't know when I have seen anything which pleased me better. Those sparkling black eyes and the clear olive complexion are perfection in my eyes, and her manners, so sweet, so ladylike, she is quite bewitching. You cannot praise her too much for me, replied Annie quite sincerely. I have been raving about her ever since last night, and so long as you make use of suitable and judicious terms, you may extol her beauty till you are worn out with fatigue. I intend to write an acrostic on her name, said he in a most self-satisfied tone. Perhaps you did not know it, but I am considered rather to shine in that way. I have made capital verses. So you have told me, Mr. Freeman, till before. Indeed, I remember on one occasion your presenting me with some lines which— from the style and manner, I should have judged impossible to be your own composition, but for your affirmation of that fact. Of course, therefore, I am aware of your talents. I am only too flattered by your remembering the circumstance at all, Miss Miller. You don't happen to recollect the lines, do you? No, indeed. I remember the fact, because I know a cousin of mine who was staying with us at the time amused himself with cutting up the paper into the smallest possible morsels, 
and I only read the lines once in consequence. The utter carelessness with which this assertion was made would have been sufficient to overwhelm an ordinarily modest man, but he did not appear distressed, only interposing with a declaration that he thought he could remember the little poem. Accordingly, he commenced reciting, Animated every angel, notice now my humble line, Never was there such a feeling in my breast as now is stealing, ere I saw that form divine. Pray spare me the rest, exclaimed Annie, almost suffocated with laughter, which she vainly tried to repress. My modesty is too sensitive to stand such praises, so I entreat you to allow us to exercise our imaginations as to the remainder. Do you know when I began that I wanted to make every word in the line commence with the same letter? But I could not manage it. It was too much for me. I can easily believe that, replied Mr. Miller gravely. I think it was too much for my sister, too. You should not indulge young girls with such flattery. Depend upon it. It's very bad for them. Oh, dear, no, replied he. A little flattery, delicately administered, makes way amazingly amongst those whose hearts are soft and easily touched. Amongst which number I conclude you reckon me? inquired Annie. No, indeed, you are hard-hearted and cruel to a degree to drive twenty such men as me to despair. I hope I shall never be reduced to so desperate a deed. Twenty such men would be a formidable phalanx, more than I could stand at all, said Miss Miller, arching her eyebrows and apparently looking on the point of laughing again. He looked suspiciously at her and said, after considering her countenance a moment, I have not made more than the first couplet of my address to Miss Emma Watson. Do you think you can help me? Let us hear your effusion. We will see what we can do, replied Annie. Emma, elegant, enchanting, merry maiden, much is wanting. But then I don't know what to say next. What do you think is wanting? said Alfred in the most earnest tone possible. I should finish it this way, suggested Annie. My melodious muse to make, all I wish it for thy sake. Thank you indeed, cried he. What condescending goodness on your part to stoop to such kindness as to assist me with such poetical rhymes. Do you ever compose yourself? How can you ask? Have you not read a small volume of poems entitled Wayside Flowers? And did you not know they were mine? No, indeed. How delighted I am to be acquainted with a real author. I shall never rest till I have procured and read your poems. I wish you success in the search, then, replied Annie, and repose and quiet when you have succeeded. In those days, authors and authoresses were far less plentiful than now, when not to know or be nearly related to one is a more remarkable circumstance by far than the contrary and Alfred Fremantle, really believing Annie's assertion, looked and felt most highly exalted at the supposed discovery. He continued during the rest of the walk to plague her with questions as to what species of stanzas, what measure, what style of writing she preferred, until Annie, on getting free from him at length, burst into a strong invective against his stupidity and want of common sense. Her brother quietly told her she deserved it. She liked to play on his dullness of perception, and it served her right when it recoiled on her own head. Annie denied that there was any malice in what she said. It was only a little fun. It was not really at all naughty. They reached their house at last, and the two ladies, being both tired and hungry, were extremely glad of rest and dinner. Elizabeth could not help wondering at herself for what she was doing and where she was. But the human mind soon gets accustomed to any circumstances, and she enjoyed herself too much to feel any regret at the change of scene. Their little quartet was extremely pleasant and good-humored. She was introduced to Mr. Miller's children, and was much pleased with them. 
and the little things, with the intuitive perception peculiar to children, clung to her with great delight and affection. After spending by far the most cheerful evening which she could remember, since they were snowed up at Mr. Howard's, she was escorted home by George Miller, and parted from him with so friendly a feeling that she could hardly believe he was only a two days' acquaintance. End of chapter Recording by McKenna March Bremerton, Washington Volume 2, Chapter 10 of The Younger Sister This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubbeck Chapter 10 Very different was the evening her sisters had been passing. Robert was engaged in his office. Margaret, engrossed with the new romance that morning procured, and Jane, being tired and having nothing to amuse her, was more than usually cross to Emma, finding fault with the manner in which she had performed some needlework, and going on from that to a general charge of indifference, indolence, and constant inattention. Emma sighed, and could not help throwing back a mournful thought to past times, when she had felt herself the pet of her dear uncle, and the idol of a whole household. Or later, when she had flattered herself with the notion that she was the first object with Mr. Howard. It seemed now quite like recalling a dream when she looked back to those happy days. So suddenly and entirely had the scene been changed. Then she began to wonder when she would hear from Miss Osborne and what she would say, how she would bear the idea of being called into a court of justice, whether her family would not be angry at it, and what the result would be. Would Tom Musgrove yield or not? Or would Robert persist in his determination? and in these silent meditations the evening passed heavily away. She was glad when Elizabeth came home. Her entrance brought some little diversion to their scene, as she had something new to tell. And Jane, though rather inclined to resent any one having so much enjoyment without her, was too well satisfied with the union which she anticipated between Elizabeth and Mr. Miller to feel any very strong indignation on this occasion. Bedtime came, and Emma feeling wretchedly depressed and miserable, could not refrain from the luxury of finishing the evening with a good fit of crying, which relieved her heart and soothed her to sleep. Early the next morning, Elizabeth went to Emma's room and began to express to her how very much she was pleased with George Miller, his sister, his children, his house, his farm, and all that belonged to him. Then she declared that, of all situations she had ever seen, she thought she should like the neighborhood of Croydon for a home, and indeed she should not object to live in the town altogether. Emma listened and acquiesced in it all. She had not recovered her spirits, and though, trying to enter into her sister's hopes and wishes, she could hardly summon energy sufficient to do so. The morning passed much as usual until post-time, when Emma received an answer to her note to Miss Osborne and Robert, at the same time, was favored with a letter from Tom Musgrove. The four ladies were in the drawing-room, and Emma was looking over the dispatch from Miss Osborne, when her brother entered and communicated to them all the contents of Tom's letter. It was short and decisive. Dear sir, the receipt of your letter of yesterday surprised me a good deal. I am extremely sorry that there should have been any misunderstanding of the sort but I am sure your amiable sister will at once admit that my attentions to her have always been limited within the bounds of friendship, such as our long acquaintance justifies, and such as I have paid to twenty other young ladies before her eyes. With kind compliments to the ladies of your family, I have the honor to remain, dear sir, yours faithfully, etc., etc. Margaret thought it incumbent on her immediately to go off in a fit of hysterics on hearing this read, sobbing out between whiles that he was a cruel, cruel man, and she never meant to care more about him. "'Do have done with that confounded noise,' said Robert impatiently, "'for there's no getting a word of sense from a woman when she's in that state, and heaven knows it's little enough one can reasonably expect at any time.' Margaret's sobs did not cease at this gentle request, 
and Robert grew more angry. By Jove, Margaret, if you don't stop, I'll leave you to make the best of your own matters, and neither meddle nor make any more in it. Afraid that he might really keep his word, she ceased at last, and he then inquired what Emma had heard from Miss Osborne. Emma read the passage in which Miss Osborne replied to her assurance that Margaret still considered Mr. Musgrove engaged to her. It merely thanked her for the information, stated that she would warn her friend, and wished Miss Margaret a happy termination to her engagement. The rest of the letter was about subjects quite unconnected with Tom Musgrove, and uninteresting to anyone but Emma. Miss Osborne mentioned one thing which gave her peculiar pleasure. Her marriage with Sir William was to take place after Easter, and they were going down to spend the spring and summer months at Osborne Castle, which her brother had lent to them, whilst Sir William Gordon was determining on the plan and elevation of a new mansion, which he intended to build on his property. Miss Osborne earnestly hoped that Emma would once more visit there, and declared she quite looked forward with impatience to a future meeting. She did not wish to read this aloud as she shrunk from the appearance of boasting about her grand acquaintance. But neither Jane nor Margaret would allow her to rest in peace until she had made known the principal contents of her letter, and a sentence containing the information that they had seen Mr. Howard, who had spent a few days in town lately, was the only information she eventually kept to herself. Margaret's curiosity having materially aided in restoring her composure, she was soon able to inquire of her brother what he intended to do. He repeated all he had formerly asserted, and Emma heard it with horror. She escaped from in the room to consider what she had better do, and after much thought, decided on writing at once to Miss Osborne, informing her of what was threatened. She sat down and wrote accordingly, Dear Miss Osborne, I hope you will not consider me in any way to blame if the information I have to communicate is disagreeable to you. I am sorry to say that Mr. Musgrove has been so unprincipled as entirely to deny the engagement, which we know subsisted between him and my sister. And what grieves me still more is that my brother, convinced that there actually was an engagement, declares he will bring an action against Mr. Musgrove, unless he immediately fulfills it. The idea that we shall have to appear in a court of justice frightens me very much, and I thought it right to give you early notice of his intention that you might not be taken by surprise. My brother is so fixed in his resolution that I cannot see the smallest probability of an escape for us unless Mr. Musgrove can be persuaded to act up to his promise. I know Lord Osborne has great influence with him, and for the sake of your family, and his own character and respectability, he might perhaps be persuaded by him to do so. But with a man of such a character, my sister's chance of happiness would be small, and I cannot wish for their marriage, even to save myself from what I so greatly dread. I feel I am wrong and selfish in shrinking from an exertion which I suppose is my duty, and perhaps, after all, when there are so many troubles in life, one difficulty more or less ought not to disturb me so much. I am truly rejoiced at your bright prospects, and shall indeed have great pleasure at any time you name in witnessing your domestic happiness. I assure you that your kind invitation has given me more pleasure than anything I have lately experienced. Believe me, Miss Osborne, very truly yours, etc., etc., we must follow this letter to London, and describe the effect which it produced on the parties concerned, and the results which arose from it. Miss Osborne was sitting in the breakfast-room in Portman Square, when it was brought to her. Sir William Gordon was beside her on the sofa, assisting at her late breakfast, in the English sense of the word, and playfully telling her that he never meant to wait so long for his, when he was settled at home. As she looked at the address— here is a letter, she observed, from that charming Emma Watson, with whom you were pleased to carry on such a flirtation just before you proposed to me. I flirt with Emma Watson, exclaimed he. I deny it entirely. I never flirted with any girl in my life. What, have you forgotten it all? Did you not take a walk with her in the park, a sketch in a cottage, and a drive in a cart? 
do you mean to deny all that? By no means. I only deny entirely all flirtation whatever. What time, what spirits, what inclination could I have to flirt with her when I was doing hard service to win your most intractable and hard-hearted self? Not so very hard-hearted, I think, Sir William, said she, blushing. Stern enough to drive an ordinary man to despair, Rosa, replied he, looking admiringly at her. And had I not been as obstinate as yourself, we never should have been sitting as we now are. Well, you may as well let my hand alone, I think, for I want the use of it to open my letter. And accordingly the young lady broke the seal, as soon as she could get possession of her hand. Let me look over you, said he, leaning forward with his cheek close to hers. She repulsed him, and placed herself in the corner of the sofa, where he was forced to be satisfied with watching her face. He saw her cheek glow, and her eye flash whilst her brow contracted with repressed indignation, and she seemed on the point of tearing the letter in two. She did not, however, but dropped her hands in her lap, and sat for a minute looking upwards earnestly, as if trying to recall some past event, then frowned again. Her lover extended his hand towards her and exclaimed, "'My dear Rosa, what is the matter? Your looks quite frighten me. Do let me see this letter.' "'Take it,' said she." and see what intolerable impertinence is threatened me. He read it attentively, then said, I am quite bewildered, completely mystified. What have you got to do with all this, and what does it mean? Ah, you may well be astonished, she replied. Don't you see what is threatened? Imagine me, a peer's daughter, dragged into the Assize Court as a witness in an action between Margaret Watson and Thomas Musgrove for a breach of promise of marriage. Can you realize the scene? It would be novel and interesting, I think. Extremely so, and I do not see why you should mind it. You will, of course, be treated with all proper respect and consideration, and justice must be done. Don't make yourself unhappy about that. You are joking, Sir William, and I shall be angry presently. No, don't, pray. I should not like that. But tell me how you happened to become the confidant of this charming Margaret. I did not know your friendship extended to the whole family. Neither does it. It is only Emma I care for, replied she, and she then proceeded to explain to Sir William all the circumstances attending their involuntary audience of Musgrove's courtship and her reason for keeping it quiet. "'Caught listening, eh?' ejaculated Sir William. "'I do not wonder that you shrink from being called on to avow it in public. What a pity that you did not start out and cry bo to them both. From all accounts they deserved it.' "'That's all very well, and you may amuse yourself with laughing at me if you like. But tell me, how can I avoid this difficulty? Must I appear in court?' Certainly, if you are subpoenaed to appear, there is no help for that. How coolly you treat it. Why is it not you instead of me it has happened to? Only because I was not one of the eavesdroppers. I assure you, Sir William, if you go on laughing at my distress, I will punish you for it. I am excessively sorry for your distress, my dear Rosa, but I must think it quite unfounded. Well, there's one thing certain, I warn you. If I have to appear in this business, we must defer our marriage. I could not appear as a bride and a witness during the same month. Sir William started up from the cushion where he was lounging, and looking fixedly at her, exclaimed, You are not serious. Perfectly so, Sir William, and I see you are so now, replied Miss Osborne. "'Then you shall have no occasion to put your threat in execution,' said he, with an air of determination. "'Let us talk the matter over seriously, Rosa.' "'Ah, I am glad I have brought you to your senses at last. Now consider. If we could do as Emma advises, and persuade this Mr. Musgrove to marry, as he ought, there would be an end of all trouble in the affair.' "'To you, perhaps, but not to Miss Margaret.' I dare say her amiable husband would beat her every day. 
Now don't relax into your indifference again and be provoking. Oh, here comes Osborne. Let's explain the case to him and see what he says on the subject. Lord Osborne, at the moment, entered the room, and his sister tried to make him comprehend the facts that had occurred. I think, said he, after hearing her story, that Musgrove has behaved very ill, very ill indeed. No doubt of that, my dear brother, replied she. But what do you think of this Mr. Watson's proposal? Just what we might expect from a lawyer, that he would go to law. It's his business, Rosa, replied her brother. But it's not my business to be obliged to appear in public as a witness in this ridiculous matter. If he likes to make his sister's affaire de cour the subject for conversation and coarse jokes through the county, it is all very well, but I cannot see why I am to be implicated in a transaction which reflects nothing but discredit on all the parties, said Miss Osborne with increasing dissatisfaction. Especially to those who are detected in listening, Rosa, suggested Sir William Gordon. And poor Emma, too, continued she, pretending not to hear him. She evidently dreads the threatened exposure. I am quite concerned about it for her. Naturally enough, said the lover in the same tormenting tone. It makes everyone sorry to be found out. Really, Sir William Gordon, said Miss Osborne, drawing up her slight figure with an air of great indignation. If you can suggest nothing that is more agreeable than such reflections, we shall be better without you and I recommend you to leave us to take care of ourselves. It was haughtily said, for her quick temper was roused. He knew her well, and did not mean that she should obtain a sovereign rule over him. He loved her for her spirit, but he was determined not to crouch to it, and rising, he made her a grave bow and left the room. She looked after him anxiously, expecting he would return, or at least give her one more glance, but he did not and the door closed before she could make up her mind to speak again. "'What do you want me to do, Rosa?' said her brother. "'I think it will be easy to prevent all this, if it plagues you and your friend so much. I will speak to Tom myself, and see if I cannot persuade him to keep his promise.' "'Ah, do if you can, Osborne. Of course the girl wants to marry him, and if he will do that, we shall be left in peace. Poor Emma seems very unhappy. Look at her letter.' Lord Osborne received it eagerly and read it through. "'Poor thing,' said he, quite compassionately. "'How soon, Rosa, may girls marry after their father's death?' "'Oh, that's a matter of taste, and I don't think it signifies in this matter at all. If we could only get Mr. Musgrove to acknowledge his engagement, he may take his own time for marrying.' Her brother was on the point of saying that he was not thinking of him, but he let it pass." and, after a moment's consideration, added, "'Then you think there would be no harm in engaging a girl, even if she could not marry immediately?' "'Oh, I don't know. This engagement was formed before old Mr. Watson died, and that makes a difference. Perhaps, if people are very particular, they might not like to commence a courtship under such circumstances.' "'Well, what can I do?' "'Find Mr. Musgrove. Tiresome man that he is.' and tell him that, as the fact of his engagement is known, and, consequently, he is as certain to have a verdict against him, as this Mr. Watson is determined to try for it, the only thing for him to do, to avoid such a result, is to act like a man of honor. If he refuses, and by that means draws me into anything so repugnant to my feelings as appearing in a court, he can never expect to be noticed by us again, and if we set the example— Everyone will throw him off. He will be scouted in the neighborhood, and can never dare to show his face again at home. Tell him this. And if I do not greatly mistake the man, he will yield. I will try what I can do, Rosa, but I wish Gordon had undertaken it. He has so many more words than I have. And if you cannot succeed with him, we must have recourse to Mr. Watson, the attorney, and try what we can do to stop his proceedings, continued Rosa. Perhaps a little bribery, judiciously applied, might induce him to relinquish his intention and save any further trouble. We shall see about that, replied he. 
But in the meantime, I will look for Musgrove and try my skill on him. Could you find Sir William, Osborne? said Rosa, blushing. And tell him that I should like to speak to him? Or no, perhaps if you tell him only what you are going to do, it will be better. I heard him leave the house, Rosa, said Lord Osborne quite innocently. But if I see him at the club, I will tell him what you say. Miss Osborne bit her lip and made no reply. She did not like to show the empire which Sir William had over her feelings, nor would she readily have acknowledged the anxiety she could not avoid entertaining with regard to his quitting her so gravely. She had discovered that he would not be played with and tormented for her amusement, and she dared not attempt to trifle with him, as she might have done with a less resolute man. Her brother left her, and she spent the rest of the morning alone and very uneasy. She was in no humor to receive visitors, and was entirely disinclined for any occupation. She kept on telling herself it was not because Sir William was absent that she was dissatisfied. It was only because she herself was threatened with a disagreeable incident. Then she fell into a train of wondering thought as to what Sir William intended to do, where he was gone, and whether he would soon return to Portman Square. Her heart beat every time she heard the knocker though she knew his hand too well to be deceived in that. At length, a note was brought to her with an assurance that the bearer was waiting. It was in his handwriting, and she opened it with trepidation. The style surprised her. Sir William Gordon's compliments to Miss Osborne, and he has the happiness of informing her that affairs are placed on a satisfactory footing with regard to Mr. Musgrove, but, as Sir W. has undertaken to communicate the result of the interview to Miss Watson and her sister, he wishes to know whether Miss Osborne would recommend him to go in person to Croydon, and if so, whether she has any commands for him. Rosa read the note over three times before she could make up her mind to the answer she should return. She felt it deeply. The tone, the meaning, all conveyed a sort of covert reproach to her. She was sorry and angry at the same moment, and she was quite undecided whether to yield to or resent his conduct. After much deliberation, she hastily wrote, Miss Osborne's compliments to Sir William Gordon, and as she finds it impossible to give an opinion without understanding more of the circumstances, she begs he will favor her with a call this afternoon to explain what arrangements he has made. No sooner was this note dispatched than she bitterly regretted having sent such a one, and felt she would have given anything in the world to recall it when too late. She could think of nothing else, of course, and being quite indisposed for any amusement, she refused to accompany her mother in the afternoon drive, but remained sitting alone in the drawing-room. Engrossed with her own thoughts, she did not hear him enter, and was not aware of his presence till he spoke and gravely observed— I am here, Miss Osborne, according to your commands. May I request you will let me know your further wishes? You are still offended, Sir William, replied she, looking up at him. I thought you would have recovered yourself by this time. I cannot so soon forget the repulse I received, and I presume you intended it to be remembered. Nay, now don't look like that. I cannot bear it. I was wrong, said she, extending her hand to him. Forgive me, and sit down. Miss Osborne had not to say she was wrong twice over, nor to repeat the request for forgiveness. He was not tyrannical, though he could not submit to slavery, and a reconciliation was soon effected. When they were able to talk of anything besides themselves, he described to her his interview with Tom Musgrove. He had found him insolent and angry, disposed to resent Mr. Watson's threats as insulting, and Sir William's interference as uncalled for. His tone, however, was considerably lowered when he ascertained for the first time that his conversation with Margaret had been overheard by two who were quite able to prove the fact. Sir William told him he was authorized by the family of one young lady, indeed as her affianced husband, he considered himself bound to step forward and endeavor to prevent the necessity of her appearing as a witness in a public court. Should she, in consequence of Mr. Musgrove's persevering in denying the truth, be compelled to perform so unpleasant a task, 
it would bring down on him the enmity of the noble family of which the lady was a member, and the universal contempt of the county. Whereas, whilst affairs stood as they did at present, the fact of his inconstancy being known to so few, it was evident the whole business might be hushed up, and when he and Miss Watson were married, they might be certain of the countenance and favor of the family at Osborne Castle and all their connections. Tom had hesitated much, and evidently deeply repented the unguarded conduct which had placed him in such an unpleasant predicament. And though he had yielded at last to a conviction of the necessity of the thing, it was with a reluctance which augured ill for the domestic felicity of the future Mrs. Musgrove. Indeed, he had told Sir William, with an oath, that if she really compelled him to marry her, Margaret Watson should rue the day, so that, upon the whole, Sir William was of opinion that the young lady had much better not persist in her claim, if she had any value for a quiet home. "'I dare say he will not be worse than other men,' replied Rosa saucily. "'I have a notion that they are all tyrants to women at heart.' Only some wear a mask and courtship, and some do not take that trouble. But they are all alike in the end, no doubt. Very possibly, Rosa. Suppose you were to carry out your theory and change places with Miss Margaret. Thank you. Your liberality is overpowering. But though they may be all alike in temper, they are so neither in person nor name. And in neither of these particulars does Mr. Musgrove please me. It was then settled that Rosa should write to her friend and inform her how matters were going on, it being understood that Tom Musgrove was by the same post to assert his claim to Miss Margaret Watson's hand in a letter to her brother. End of chapter. Recording by McKenna March, Bremerton, Washington. Recording by Lakshmi, Volume 2, Chapter 11 of The Younger Sister by Catherine Anne Hubert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Had Margaret Watson possessed one particle of proper spirit, the tone and manner in which Thomas Crow fulfilled his part of the bargain, would have been sufficient to cause a total rupture between them. But far from this was the case with her. The fact of being now believed in a declaration, of being known as an engaged young lady, of having a right to talk about wedding clothes, and sigh sentimentally at the prospect before her, the distinction which all this would give her in a small country town, where every occurrence from a proposal of marriage down to the purchase of a new pair of shoes, was immediately known to all the neighbours. This delighted Margaret's weak mind and set her heart in a flutter of gratified vanity. To be able to inform all the morning visitors at her brother's house that indeed she was contemplating this important change, that she was yielding to a long and well-placed affection, that she had known her dear dear Tom all her life, and that their mutual attachment had been of many years' standing, to sigh over the prospect of soon leaving his sisters and trying a new situation, seeking a new home, entering on new duties. All this was perfect ecstasy to her, and on the strength of her engagement, she became more than ever peevish and disagreeable to her sisters in private, and more affable and smiling to her associates in public. Her dear Tom, her absent friend, was introduced on all occasions in her speeches, and most happy would she have been had she been able to introduce him personally to the admiring young ladies of Croydon. Miss Jenkins was dying to see him. Miss Lamb was certain he must be a charming view. Miss Morgan and her sister were never weary of hearing the colour of his hair and the style of his ink page. This was highly gratifying to Margaret, but she had a little discomfort too. There were some young ladies who shrugged their shoulders and wished Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Crowe might have a quite house of it. There were others who whispered strange things about the courtship. Miss Lascom thought very odd indeed Mr. Muscrop did not come to see his betrothed. Of course, they knew their own affairs best, but she hoped, if ever she were in such a situation, to see a little more devotion and warmth in her swan. Miss Johnston said 
she knew how young men were sometimes caught that she did until she heard the gentleman declare his engagement with a smile she should not be persuaded that it did not cost him a sigh these speeches though not made to margaret were all carefully repeated to her by some of her many kind friends who delighted in retaining small wear of the kind she colored and pouted tossed her head and recommended people to leave affairs alone which did not belong to them and wondered any people could take such pleasure in interfering in other people's concerns but she knew what it came from that she did it was all envy and spite because she was going to marry a real gentleman who had nothing to do and mr johnston was only an apothecary and all the world knew that miss lascom had been setting her cap at the writing master for the last three years and all to no purpose in her heart she was really troubled with some misgivings on account of not receiving any communication from tom she would have delighted to parade his letters before admiring confidantes and envying female friends but this pleasure was denied her all she could do was to write very often herself and take care to have a letter directed to him beside her whenever any of her gossiping acquaintances came to pay her a visit of inspection the news from kistra which about this time arrived gave a very flourishing account of penelope's affair her lover notwithstanding his advanced age appeared far more ardent and energetic than the youthful tom miscroft in accordance it was said with his earnest solicitations the union was to take place very speedily and penelope hoped that the next time she had occasion to write to her sisters it would be to inform them that she no longer bore the same name as themselves in the prospects of her two sisters emma so little to console her for the blight which had fallen on her own she would have rejoiced with all her heart had she been able to suppose they would be happy but she could not reconcile herself to the proceedings of either nor persuade herself try as she would that in either case the motives which led them to engage in a connection so important as matrimony were such as could ensure blessing with them if in lopes case especially she could view it as a nothing but a sale of herself for a certain amount of settlements she knew there was neither love nor esteem on her side for she had heard her in unguarded moments express sentiments quite the reverse speaking of her future husband in a slightly tone and with a contemptuous accent as if she'd held him little better than an idiot for the very act of marrying her as to margaret though she really seemed in love after a fashion with mr musgrove there was too evident a reluctance on his part and too much want of delicacy in hers to leave as emma imagined the least chance of anything happier than a total rupture between them and taking everything into consideration it seemed to her that such an event would be by much the most desirable circumstance that could occur emma herself was for some time a close prisoner mrs watson found so much for her to do that she had scarcely time to stir from the nursery except when she took a walk with zenita who was now almost entirely confided to her care the child loved her dearly and had her exertions as nursery governess given the smallest satisfaction to her sister-in-law had it even been treated by her as an equivalent for board and maintenance she would have been less uncomfortable but she was spending her whole time in unremunerated and indeed unacknowledged services she was perpetually reminded of her entire dependence on robert and taunted with her uselessness her idle habits and her fine lady manners the numerous visitors who dawdled away a morning hour in mrs watson's parlour were apt to expatiate on extraordinary liberality and kindness in receiving her three sisters as a guest not imagining that the two elder paid for their board out of their scanty incomes and that the younger compensated for the misery she endured under the show of patronage in a way yet more advantageous to her grudging but ostentatious relatives at length a grand event occurred mr miller invited them all to a dinner party and annie hinted that it has to be followed by a dance and a supper they were all asked and though jane demurred about emma robert overruled her we must let the girl have a chance said he 
if she is never seen, there is no chance of any of those young fellows proposing for her. Jean had no wish that they should. She felt Ima's value far too strongly to be at all inclined to part with her. Her caps had never been so nicely made, her stocking so carefully darned, or Zanita's wardrobe so well attended to. As since she had turned over every trouble of the kind to Ima. But as she did not choose to own their considerations, she was obliged to assent to Robert's proposal, and Ima was to go to the Millers. In spite of their mutual wishes, she had seen very little of Annie Miller. Their meetings had been hindered in every possible way by Mrs. Watson, who was always apprehensive that Emma would complain, aware as she was that she had real reasons to do so. But Mrs. Watson had skilfully contrived that drawing back from her acquaintance should appear the voluntary act of Emma, a notion which cooled any friendship towards her. Until... Elizabeth, with her usual frankness, had no one occasion afforded an explanation of the matter. The result of this was an energetic attempt on Miss Miller's side to secure her society for the evening in question. As she had appealed to Robert, as well as Jane, she was successful. They were accordingly, and Emma's quick eyes were immediately caught by the difference of manner which George Miller displayed towards Elizabeth, compared with the rest of the party. To the others, he was open, cordial and kind, with an address which, if not exactly polished, was at least far removed from vulgarity, but to Miss Watson, he was hurried and awkward, apparently eager to please to a degree which deprived him of the self-possession necessary for the dead. Elizabeth, too, looked shy and conscious when their eyes met, though evidently expecting and wishing that he should take his stand beside her chair which she had fortunately secured in such a position that after walking forward to receive his visitors, he was able to fall back again and resume his conversation with her. Emma saw this with satisfaction and venturing in spite of her own disappointments to speculate on the future, she fancied that at least her dear sister Elizabeth would secure a happy home for herself. Annie Miller seated herself by Emma's side soon after the Watson party entered the room and began warmly expressing her pleasure in at length seeing her in her brother's house. Emma assured him reply that it was not want of inclination that had kept her away, but want of leisure, for she added quite simply, I am governess to my little niece, and have not therefore much time to spare for any other purpose. I dare say my sister-in-law told you so. No, indeed, said Annie warmly, and colouring with indignation. She never said anything of the kind. She always excused you on the plea of studies or occupations for your good, which you had to pursue, and boasted of her kind and attentive care for your benefit, without was hinting that she was under obligations to you, which the hospitality of which she boasts so much can ill repay. Oh, hush, Miss Miller, replied Emma, blushing deeply. You must not indeed talk so. If my brother receives me into his house, the least I can do is to take care of his child in return, and so lighten the trouble which I cannot help giving. But, my dear Miss Emma, excuse my taking the liberty of saying that if you were governess to any other lady's child, you would not only be supposed to earn your boarding and lodging, but some fifty or sixty pounds in addition. So that, in fact, Mrs. Watson is the obliged party in this concern. Miss Miller was called away at the moment to receive some other visitor. And when able again to return to her seat, she observed, That was a most fortunate interruption, for it certainly saved me from saying something unpardonably impertinent. I am, I have been told, much too apt to speak my feelings on all subjects, without sufficiently considering times, places and persons. How will your sister look tonight? Well, sister, inquired Emma. Oh, Miss Watson, I never could admire your sister Margaret, though I know many people who do. Neither she nor Mrs. Watson, who is rather in the other extreme, are at all to my hate's taste. Elizabeth looks very happy, observed Emma. I'm sure she deserves to be so, replied Annie with enthusiasm. She is such a very admirable person. I know few with whom I more enjoy a day's intercourse. It always seemed to be do good for here to talk. 
she makes so light of difficulties and is so cheerful. To me, who I believe him rather too apt to grumble, she is quite a lesson, I assure you. I am delighted to hear you say so, replied Dima, with a look that showed how perfectly sincere was the expression she used, though Annie was frequently called away by the necessity of receiving other visitors. She took every opportunity she could command of returning to Emma's side and conversing with her in the most friendly way. During the intervals when she was obliged to withdraw, Emma looked round the room to see how the others were employed or amused. Mrs. Turner was discoursing eloquently with Mrs. Watson, was evidently bored exceedingly and hardly listening at all. Her thoughts as well as her eyes seemed to turn constantly to an individual of the party and known to Emma tall and pleasant-looking man, who stood by a nice-looking elderly lady and seemed to be making himself very agreeable to her. Margaret had no one to talk to and was busy in arranging her tucker in an unsatisfactory way and smoothing her gloves from the tips of the fingers upward. Robert was happy and consequently quite unable to enter into conversation with anyone. He was faintly trying to hide the violent groans which he produced by the suspension of feeling the uneasy state of expectancy in which he was kept. Emma could read his impatience in the peculiar twitching about his eyes and the spasmodic way in which his hands closed at intervals, as if grasping some imaginary knife and fork. There were two other gentlemen of the party whose names she ascertained from her young friend, one a tall, stiff and elderly man with an erect carriage and a rather disappointed expression of a countenance. She learned was Captain Tomlin's and all soldier who played a remarkably good rubber at whist. The other was the clergyman of the parish, who had but just returned from Bath, and consequently was unknown to Emma. He was a mild-looking, middle-aged man, with a very bald head and a small quantity of silver hair. His countenance was singularly pleasing and inviting, and there was an earnest kindness in his manner which charmed her. He stooped and was very round-shouldered to his slight appearance of blameless arising the gout which had driven him to bath, interested Emma particularly in him, because it reminded her of her father. The other individual who occupied so much of Jane's attention, Emma, was likewise informed was the doctor of the parish, and one of the principal objects of interest to half the ladies of the town and assured her his reputation as a doctor was wonderful. He made all his patients pleased with themselves and consequently pleased with him likewise. Indeed, he had a sort of harmless way of making love to the ladies under his care, which was very captivating to most people. And are you one of his patients? inquired Emma, or only an immature admirer of his? Oh, I was never anyone's patient, replied Danny. I am never ill. And as to being an admirer of his, indeed, I do not think I would could admire a doctor. I have a decided aversion to the profession altogether. I never liked it, observed Emma, until I became acquainted with my brother Sam, and for his sake I have been quite reconciled to it. Yes, I can understand that. I think George could reconcile me to anything, replied Miss Miller with an expression of feeling resting on her open countenance which Emma thought quite bewitching. But after all, a doctor is an artist's profession to be eternally dying with complaints of pain and always administering drugs and mixtures in which I dare say they have no faith all the time, must require a stock of extraordinary patience. I wonder how that man can go smiling and complimenting to the world as he does. But to look only at the disagreeable side of the profession, returned Emma, should consider it as the means of elevating suffering, relieving distress, perhaps prolonging the most valuable life. If you think of the good a doctor can do, you will form a high estimate of the profession. Yes, but then all those wise thoughts do not come of themselves into my poor brain. It is only those as clever and sedate as you who can suggest them, and in spite of it all, I am afraid I shall go on always hating the profession till my life. Their conversation was cut short by summers to dinner, when owing to there being a preponderance of ladies in the party, Annie and Emma walked in together. At the table, however, they were separated and Emma's ill luck 
placed her between her sister-in-law and her brother. A misarrangement which was not perceived until everyone was seated and which Mrs. Watson then insisted should not be changed. Jane was particularly cross. She had expected the distinction of leading the way to the dining room in company with the master of the house. And she saw instead a quite looking, plainly dressed lady precede her. Not knowing who the stranger was and feeling all the right of being first, which as needs to Sir Thomas, she invariably claimed, and indignant blood mounted to her cheeks. The hope, however, that Mr. Morgan, the doctor, would take care of her instead for a moment tranquilized her mind. But when the place he should have occupied was officially filled by the whistling Captain Tomlins, who cared nothing for the right of precedence and only desired to reach the dining room quickly, her indignation was with difficulty repressed. And as she looked over her shoulder in leaving the room and saw Elizabeth following with Mr. Morgan, her anger rose to a climax. I wonder who that is walking just in front of me, said she to her companion. I'm sure I don't know, ma'am. I was thinking she must be a stranger, replied Captain Thomas, anxiously snuffing up the scent of dinner ascending from the lower regions of the house. The millers always give such good dinners. It's very odd, continued Mrs. Wast. How little attention is paid to rank. It seems to be getting quite the fashion now to set aside all the old distinctions. Formerly, neither men nor women thought of pushing themselves out of their places, but now all that is forgotten, and one may be obliged to walk into dinner behind you don't know who, and often conducted by some one who has no right to put himself forward. Very true, ma'am, such things may happen, but you know at least who is leading you, and I conceive that as an officer in the service of His Majesty, I have a perfect right to walk before any of our present company, excepting always our host. I'm sure you must agree with me. Upon my word, said Mrs. Watson with an angry little laugh, I was not at all aware of your rank being so very high, but entitling you to such a very great distinction. However, I dare say it's all right, and I shall find myself no doubt soon walking in behind the old sexton's wife or taking the hand of the parish club to the table. As they had reached the table by the time she had made its speech, Captain Tomlins did not trouble himself to answer her, being intently occupied in counting the dishes which stood before him. As resting his hands on the edge of the table and firmly compressing his lips, he bent forward to take a survey of the shining covers, as if half expecting to be able to penetrate the substance and ascertain their contents. Mrs. Watson tossed her head in an angry disdain and was forced to soothe her agitated feelings by scrutinizing the way in which the party on the opposite side disposed themselves. The doctor, whom she had vainly coveted as a companion, was seated between Elizabeth and Margaret, the former having a seat at the corner next to her host's chair, so that Mr. Morgan was not likely to be much engrossed by her conversation. Mr. Bridge, the rector, and Annie Miller filled up the rest of that side, as Mrs. Turner took the head of the table. These were well placed, as Mrs. Turner delighted in carving, and Annie being exceedingly attached to the old clergyman, whom she had known from childhood, amply compensated to him by her respectful attention for the total neglect with which he was treated by Margaret, and the rude repulsive stare which she received his first attempt at conversation. In consequence of her situation, Emma's dinner was exceedingly dull, and right glad was she when the time came for retiring to the drawing room. Here there was a change of scene and also a change of companions, for she was able to take a seat by Elizabeth and learn from her that she at least had found the party very agreeable. Meanwhile, Mrs. Watson was venting her indignation against Captain Tomlins, in no very measured terms for his love of eating, his indifference to good society, and his presumptuous and pushing manner. The stranger lady, whose name had not yet been made known, inquired if it was, it was her neighbour for whom she was speaking and having received from Mrs. Watson an abrupt and haughty information. She turned to Mrs. Turner and informed her that she formerly knew him and added that they had enjoyed some agreeable conversation together about old times and former acquaintances. 
Mrs. Watson, on hearing this, eyed her with increased disdain and suspicion, and moving away to the other side of the fireplace, she flirted her handkerchief before her face as if they were very ear were laden with impurity by her presence. With head thrown back and lips closely pressed together, she seemed determined to prevent any more of her words being wasted in such a presence. The party was soon after joined and elevated by a number of young ladies and a fair proportion of young men. The Miss Morgan sisters to the doctor, the Miss Zones and the brothers, children of a wealthy baker deceased, the owner of a flourishing paper mill in the neighbourhood, together with the whole of his large family, four sons and three daughters, rejoicing in the name of Lamb, the eldest daughter being an enthusiastic friend of Margaret's, and two or three families of great elegance and distinction in the neighbourhood, families who enjoyed the advantage of having houses quite in the country, surrounded with poppies and laurels, and no connections with any trade or business. These formed the elite of the party. There were several unconnected young men, amongst whom Mr. Alfred Fremantle appeared conspicuous and swaggering up to Emma's side, declared that he meant to make that the name plus ultra of his hopes for the evening. Any who heard him maliciously desired he would translate the Latin for the benefit of ignorant young ladies, but he pretended not to hear her request and went on talking to Emma without pity or cessation. Miss Annie Miller was busy dispensing the tea and coffee to her guest. Mrs. Watson approached her and inquired, Who was that little old lady who walked into dinner before her? A wicked light danced in Annie's eyes, for she had noticed Jane's scornful manner and was excessively pleased at the surprise in store for her. Do you not know her? she replied. She is my godmother and is now staying with us on her road to London. And her name, tell me that, who is she? Who was she to have the precedence over me, Miss Miller? She is the widow of Sir George Barry, a baronet, who died a year or two ago. There is no family, so the title becomes extinct. She is the kindest, quietest, best old lady in the world, I am sure. Bless me, cried Mrs. Watson, growing very red in the face. You don't say so. Sure, a baronet's lady. Well, really, I never thought of that. I am sure. I wish I had known it sooner. Why did you not introduce me? She did not think it necessary, replied Anne quietly. And we always let her have her own way. Indeed, I believe I ought not to have told you so who she was. Only I saw you were annoyed at her having the precedence of you. And I thought it would comfort you to find it. Was it not without reason and right? Well, I shall certainly go and talk to her now. But I am sure I don't know why you should suppose I was annoyed about anything of the sort. I declare I do not mind the least what I do or where I go. Nobody can be more indifferent about the place than I am. Though, of course, I do not like to see a mere nobody put over my head. But a baronet's lady is quite a different thing. I wonder whether she knows my uncle Sir Thomas. I dare she does. People of rank usually know one another in London. Miss Miller did not try to prevent her going to make the eminent honourable to Lady Barry. Her quiet features expressed some surprise at the manner in which she was attacked by the third scornful Mrs. Watson. And the repetition of the word, your ladyship, met Annie's ear as she contemplated them from the other side of the hearth rug. Mr. Alfred Fremantle continued his battery of small talk in Emma's ear, and at length, in spite of the cold ungraciousness of her manner, which was as far removed as possible from welcome or encouragement, the young gentleman ended his diet with presenting her with a paper which he declared was a copy of verses in her honour. Emma coldly de declined taking it, and his most urgent entreaties could not prevail on, him, on her to look at the verses. Just at this juncture, Miss Miller joined them, and on understanding the subject in dispute, she seized on the paper and commenced reading the lines aloud. They consisted of the usual jumble about stars and flowers, streams and boars, wings and other things, hearts, darts, flames and names, which might be expected in the valentine of a schoolboy. And Annie read them in such an absurd, mock heroic tone as made those within hearing laugh most naturally, really thinking as did that it was intended altogether as a burst. Alfred Fremantle writhed under his laughter, 
which he could not take as a compliment, having intended the whole poem to be extremely sentimental. He tried to smile too, but Rayleigh felt far more inclined to cry. And he shrank back into a corner, there to hide his confusion as well as he could. And he did not perceive her trying father, but left the poor young man to the mortifying consideration of his own defeat. When tea and coffee were dismissed, and he declared it to be her intention to have a dance, which of course all the young people seconded with zeal, there was fortunately amongst the party one lady that was known excelled in playing country dances on the hop's court, which stood in the drawing room, and heirloom from Annie's mother. The room was soon prepared, and the young ladies all drew up their heads and began to look straight before them, as if they did not care the least in the world which of the gentlemen asked them to dance, or whether any did at all. Emma, having no intention of standing up herself, drew farther back into a corner, without perceiving that it was the very one where young Fremantle had hidden his diminished head. He quite misinterpreted the action, and dropping down into an empty chair by her side, said with an air intended to be very apt, I hope, Miss Watson, you are coming to ask me to dance. Indeed, I was not, replied Emma, for I did not see you but I shall be very happy to do so immediately. Pray, Mr. Fremantle, to go and dance with anyone but myself. I'm Padlet Cruelty, cried he, clasping his hands and throwing up his chin into the air. To ask me to stand up with any other woman than the fair, the captivating, the charming object of all my woes, of all my wishes. If you mean me by those expressions, replied Emma quite calmly, and that you wish to stand up with me, Allow me to save you all further trouble, but the information that I do not intend to dance at all this evening. Impossible. You cannot be so hard-hearted, so cruel to your devoted slaves, as all the men in this room must be. You cannot be so unjust to your own charms, so unkind to your own attractions. That elastic figure, graceful as a weeping willow, was formed to float through the dance like the water lily on the surface of the stream. Those fairy feet... Those in short, do you really mean not to dance? Really, sir, replied Emma. Your reason, tell me your reason, I entreat you. Why should you shrink from beating our eyes and lapping our senses and lessons? Excuse me, I think I've done enough in giving you one positive answer. You have no right to require any reason from a woman. Let this suffice you. I will not, because I will not. Mr. Fremantle, said Emmy, advancing towards them and effecting an agreeable diversion in Emma's favour. I must request you to stand up. We can harbour no idle young men in corners here. You are doomed to make yourself agreeable to one lady for the space of two dances, and only on this condition shall you remain in the room. Since then, the beauteous Miss Emma will not do me the honour. Will you permit me to solicit your hand, Miss Miller? No, indeed. I am engaged for the whole evening, so you must find a partner somewhere else. Go and ask Miss Morgan, Miss Lamb. I obey with the accuracy which your commands must always inspire, and he went accordingly. Miss Miller stayed a moment after him with Emma. I will not ask you to stand up, said she, after the reason you gave me, but what both Mrs. Watson and your younger sister have joined the set, you see. How shall you lose yourself? Oh, never mind me, replied Emma cheerfully. Where's Elizabeth? She does not dance, surely. No, she's playing cast with my brother and yours. I believe they went to do that little parlour on purpose. Will you join them and look up? Before Emma had time to answer, Annie was called away, and a moment after Mr. Morgan came, and taking a chair near her, entered into conversation with the ease of a man accustomed to see much of the world and mix in good society. She was interested and amused by his conversation, and more especially so when she accidentally discovered that at college he had been well acquainted with Mr. Mr. Howard, had since been visiting occasionally in the neighbourhood of Osborne Castle, and knew the whole family. He was a good deal older than Howard, he told her, but he had remained some time in the vicinity of Oxford after he began to practice. Indeed, he had adopted his profession rather late in life, and having a fellowship, he had continued single. All this he communicated to Emma, but he had tact soon enough to discover that his own history, unconnected with the family and neighbourhood of Osborne Castle, interested her not little. 
They soon therefore turned the conversation to that channel again and discovered that her feelings were certainly deeply concerned in it. Yet he could not quite satisfy himself whether it was a young lord or his former tutor whose name raised a tinge of blood to the cheek, which he saw to be very becoming. Indeed, there were so many reminiscences and peculiar circumstances associated with her intimacy with Miss Osborne and acquaintance with her brother. They were so strangely implicated in Margaret's affair and so much that Emma was ashamed of was suggested by the names that she was quite as ready to blush at the memory of them as at the dearer and more tantalizing recollections connected with Mrs. Wills and her brother. Well, knowing the art of pleasing Mr. Morgan allowed her to lead in the subject of the conversation, carefully following the turn which she chose to give it and trying to read her feelings with a scrutinizing eye, which she seemed to be all attention to her conversation at the moment. And his account of him had not prepossessed her in his favour, yet now she could not deny that he was on the whole an agreeable man. The interval of the two dancers passed pleasantly away, but when they were concluded, Mr. Morgan left her, and she soon afterwards stole away to the little room where the card table was. For some reason, however, which she could not learn, the Wills party had been broken up, and she only found sitting there George Miller and Elizabeth, apparently deeply engrossed in a game of chess. She seated herself near them, her sister looked up and smiled, and then resumed her game. No one spoke. Emma took up a folio of prints lying on the table and amused herself with looking over them. At length, her attention was arrested by the sound of her own name. By the voices she learned the speakers were her sister-in-law and Mr. Morgan, and the first words she heard were the gentleman saying, A oh, very charming girl indeed, Mrs. Watson, the young sister-in-law of yours. You think so? Do you admire her? And why the lady? Very much. She is very handsome indeed. I cannot agree with you, replied Mrs. Watson rather tartly. Her features are too irregular to be called handsome, good eyes, perhaps, but her skin is coarse and her features insignificant. I cannot but wonder at your taste. Indeed, I must beg leave to differ from you, my dear Mrs. Watson. Her features may perhaps be rather smaller than real beauty requires, but the dark glowing complexion, the brilliant eye, the redundant hair and the rich red lips, these reminded me of strongly of yourself, that I cannot give up admiring them, even though you will not agree with me. Well, I don't know. I never was told that she was like me before, said Mrs. Watson in a simpering tone, which seemed to speak her propitiated by the incenses offered to her. Do you know how she is situated? added she. It's a most unfortunate thing. She was brought up so very much above her situation in the most foolish, ill-judging way by an old uncle who died without leaving her father. And now she's a beggar, without a sixpence to bless herself with, entirely dependent on her brothers and my charity. I'm sure I'm sorry for the poor thing. Yes, indeed, replied Mr. Morgan with a really feeling tone. If that is the case, she is indeed to be pitied. Poor thing, you may well say. The worst of it is that both her education and, I must say, her temper unfit her for her further situation. She must do something for herself. A situation as governess seems the only thing. But with her fine lady notions, I don't know what to do. If I wanted to get her such a situation, replied Mr. Morgan, I think I know one of which would probably suit her. Lady Fanny Aston is wanting a governess for her little girl. The child is extremely delicate. I am in almost daily attendance on it, and I know Lady Fanny always say, I don't care for accomplishments, Mr. Morgan. My child can have masters, but it's the manners I want, mind and manners, the feelings, the look, and the behavior of a gentlewoman. Now, would not this exactly suit your sister? The salary is most liberal, and altogether, I think she might be very happy there. Perhaps so, I don't know. You are very kind to think of her, but indeed, I am not sure that she would be at all suited for the place. And how are we to get it for her? I am sure I don't know. Oh, I shall see her ladyship tomorrow and can mention it to her. Only give me a thought to ask, and you shall see how soon it will be arranged. You are very kind, very obliging, but indeed, I cannot answer at once. 
I must speak to my husband about it. But don't mention it to anyone else. If you please my intentions, my wishes with regard to her are quite confidentially entrusted to you. And I wish you not to say anything on the subject. Mr. Morgan acquiesced, but Emma did not in this decision. She had at first felt extremely hurt that Mrs. Watson should make her circumstances and situation the subject of undeserved discussion with a man totally unconnected with her family, and that in so loud a tone as to be perfectly audible to anyone within a dozen yard of where she sat. The accent of real interest in Mr. Morgan's voice and above all, the prospect which he held up a release from the galling thraldom of her present situation served to compensate for the want of delicacy in a sister-in-law. She immediately formed a resolution to profit by the offer, if Mr. Morgan would really make good his word. Whilst meditating on this plan, she heard her sister-in-law invited to dance again, and her quitting her seat was immediately followed by Mr. Morgan's turning into the room where she was sitting. She looked up at him as he entered and fancied she perceived a slight shade of embarrassment on his countenance, as if he suspected she must have overheard his recent conversation. He drew a chair by her side immediately and began complimenting her on a taste for silence and seclusion, as he could not imagine that the two chess players on the other side had proved very communicative companions. She readily admitted they were too much engrossed by the game to have bestowed a word or thought on her and then added that in consequence of the quiet around her, she had discovered that others were thinking and talking of her in her absence. She coloured a little as she added. My sister informed you so fully of my circumstances that it is no use to effect reserve, and you mentioned a plan to her which appears to me would suit me perfectly well, if you really can make arrangements to talk of. I am sorry you overheard that. A fear may have appeared impertinent to you, replied he with a grave and earnest kindness of manner which would have suited a parent. But Mrs. Watson is accustomed to speak confidentially to me of family matters, and though I certainly have no right to intermeddle in your concerns, yet permit me to say, no one could have the pleasure of conversing with you for even half an hour without feeling a degree of interest which would certainly lead them to everything in their power to serve you. You must smile and reply, if you really want to serve me, Mr. Morgan, the first step to it must be leaving off complimentary speeches. Keep them for those whom you have no other means of serving and speak to the point with me. He smiled likewise and rejoined. Well, I will keep them for Mrs. Watson. She will not reject them with so much scorn. Hush, I will allow nothing personal, said Emma. I am Mrs. Watson's inmate and must not listen to reflections upon her. But tell me, if you know, exactly what are the particular qualities required by Lady Fanny for the little girl's governance? First youth, health and good spirits, ladylike manners, a cultivated mind, a thorough acquaintance with English literature, a taste for the fine arts and a love both for poetry and nature. Such as well as I remember was the catalogue she gave me. And to that she had no objection to add accomplishments but on the subject she is not particular. She knows that though a woman may perform as well as an amateur musician, may draw or paint pleasingly, and may be tolerably well acquainted with modern languages, it is not more than one in ten who can be so thoroughly grounded in these accomplishments as to be really able to tease them with any effect. One subject of study is as much as most women can encompass, and those who pretend to be more are most likely to fail or not. In my listen in silence and wondered mentally whether the entire oblivion of everything related to principles, morals and religions were the result of indifference to such subjects on the part of Lady Fanny or Mr. Margaret. To silent Miss Watson, continued he, after serving for a moment, her downcast look and thoughtful expression. Am I to suppose that my catalogue does not please you, or are you doubtful of my accuracy? No, indeed, I was considering my own sufficiency for such a task. I do not imagine you need doubt that, so far as my judgment goes. But that must be very little away, Mr. Morgan. The experience of this evening cannot be considered sufficient by those who will require information on the subject, however entirely it may satisfy yourself. 
You give me credit for less penetrance than I would claim. If you suppose my experience is limited to this evening, you possibly have never seen me before. But we have often met. Nevertheless, you did not know that I am a particular friend of your little niece and deep in her confidence. Well, I will allow you as much penetration as you choose to claim on this subject. Meantime, tell me, when will be the situation be vacant at Lady Fanny's? In about two months, I believe. I do not know exactly, but if you will authorize me, I will make all necessary inquiries for you. You may do so if you please, without absolutely committing me. And when I know all the particulars, I can consult my brother, to whom I hold myself responsible, and whose approbation I must of course have. At this juncture, the chess table was broken up, and Elizabeth joined Emma. Mr. Miller walked away to make the MNG honourable to those ladies, young and old, whom he had grievously neglected, was devoting himself to Miss Watson. Elizabeth looked very well pleased with the game, but she did not seem disposed to talk. At this moment, the noise in the dancing room attracted attention, and they moved to the door to look on. The party were going through Sir Roger de Cobbleray in a high state of excitement, especially some of the young gentlemen of whom Mr. Alfred Freemantle was the most conspicuous. He rushed forwards with furry and rather tore than ran round the figure at length when advancing to meet Margaret Watson, who was like himself dancing with more vigour than grace they ran against each other. Her foot slipped and she fell completely into his arm. Not satisfied with this exploit, she made belief to faint and he was forced to support her out of the circle, one or two people offered to assist, but he rejected their efforts, and half carried, half led her to the little drawing room, near which her sisters would be standing. Elizabeth and Emma tried to be of service, but in fact there was nothing to do. She would have been quite well, would she only have held up her head and sat upright. But this she chose to recline on Mr. Freemantle's shoulder, and allow him to keep his arms round her waist. They could do nothing but look on and feel very much ashamed of her. Emma went to procure a glass of water from side boat and meeting Mr. Morgan, asked him to come and see if anything was the matter with the sister, as she hoped his presence would be an inducement to Margaret to resume the use of her senses and leave off the hugging in which she was indulging Alfred. Mr. Morgan accompanied Emma and arrived just in time to see Margaret after making a slight effort to sit up, sink again on her companion's breast in an attitude of the greatest exhaustion. Throwing an art glance at Emma as he took the glass of water from her hand, Mr. Morgan said in an extremely plaintive tone, Poor thing, this is a complete failure. Something must be done for her. And without the smallest warning, he dashed the cold water over her face and neck, plentifully doing the young gentleman's coat and embroidered waistcoat at the same time. Margaret started up instantly, and so did Alfred, each shaking of the water, and looking excessively annoyed. Margaret was as red as fire, and whisk dabbing up the drops from her neck and cheeks with a pocket handkerchief, she exclaimed, Good gracious, doctor, is that the way you cure young ladies in a fainting fit? Precisely so, my dear Miss Margaret, returned he laughing. And you are a splendid example of the beneficial effects of my practice. What can be more different from the languid state in which I found you than the animation and colour which you now display? Upon my honour, Mr. Ogden, murmured Alfred, after he had done his best towards getting himself in good order again, after the share he had enjoyed of the sprinkling, if that is the way you treat gentlemen, I must really call you to account, sir, and in a lower tone, he murmured something further about satisfaction and honour, which was quite indistinct. Oh, my dear sir, replied the doctor, quite blandly, the libation was not intended for you, though your proximity to Miss Margaret made you come in for a portion of it. I assure you, I did not mean to throw it away on you at all. Annie now entered to inquire for Margaret's safety and expressed herself, rejoiced to find that she was apparently well and without injury. She had feared she had said for Mr. Morgan we called in that something very serious had happened. Instead of which, whispered he to Miss Miller, it was only something a little comic. I wish you had seen it, Miss Annie. 
It was soon after this for the party to separate, Alfred Fremantle insisting on seeing Fair Market home after her accident and tenderly supporting her through the street. They had not very far to go, but Emma, who was behind them, saw if she was not very much mistaken that he had his arm round her waist the whole way, and how Margaret, a woman engaged to another, could allow of such familiarity she could not understand. She went to bed, firmly resolving if Mr. Morgan's report from Lady Fanny Aston was favourable, to speak immediately to her brother and arrange everything for her removing there. She thought for full five minutes on what Miss Osborne would say when she heard of her plans, whether she would renew her invitation for her to spend some time with her after Easter, and she spent double the time in considering whether if she did, and she should again meet Mr. Howard. His manners would be warm or cold, how he would receive her, and what he would think of her undertaking such a situation. The result of her meditations was that she should write to Miss Vaughan and explain to her her plans and wishes, asking her, in case she failed in procuring the situation as governess to Miss Alston, to use her interest in finding her some other suitable to her abilities. This determination she put in practice the next day, and her mind felt relieved when it was done. End of chapter 11「Volume 2, Chapter 12 of The Younger Sister – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubback Mrs. Watson was so excessively cross after the excitement of last night that Emma's post in the nursery was really a subject of great self-congratulation to her. For though she did sometimes intrude, and was sure to worry when she did come, still it was better to be secluded from her for several hours, as was now the case. In the afternoon, as Emma was walking in a quiet lane on the outskirts of the town with her little niece, for it was now considered a regular part of her duty to take the little girl out for exercise, she was met by Mr. Morgan, returning home on horseback. He immediately stopped to speak to her, and, dismounting, placed himself by her side and proceeded to tell her the result of his mission that morning to Lady Fanny Alston's. He had been very successful. Her ladyship had expressed herself very well satisfied with his representations, and had empowered him to say that she should like an interview with Miss Watson on the first convenient opportunity. He proceeded to relate to her all the particulars as to salary, the comfort and the peculiarities of the situation, described the little girl, and, in short, entered into the most minute particulars relative to it. Emma, considering him as a man old enough to be her father, and thinking no evil herself, felt no hesitation in listening to him or allowing him to walk beside her. She certainly would not have chosen to confide in him. But, since Jane had imparted her situation, she did not scruple to avail herself of the advantage which that knowledge offered her. They walked a considerable time, for, engrossed by the conversation, she did not reflect where they were going, until Janetta's complaints of fatigue and entreaties to be carried reminded her that they were a long way from home. Emma prepared to comply with the request of the child in such a manner as showed him immediately that the exertion was habitual with her, but he interposed. "'Surely, Janetta, you do not want to make your pretty aunt ill?' said he to the child. "'Indeed, I consider myself, Miss Watson, called on to prevent that. It is enough to kill you. Janetta shall ride on my horse. That will do as well, will it not?' But Janetta was afraid of the horse, and cried for Aunt Emma to carry her. "'She is so very light,' said Emma. "'I assure you, I can do it with ease.' But Mr. Morgan would not allow of it. He took the little girl in his own arms, and they turned their steps homeward. The lane in which they were walking opened on the little garden behind Mr. Watson's house, at which Mr. Morgan privately rejoiced, whilst Emma, unconscious that she had done anything in the least imprudent or remarkable in allowing him to walk with her, felt no other emotion than satisfaction at getting Janetta quietly home. She wished much to speak to her brother that evening about Lady Fanny. But he returned to the office after dinner, 
and she was obliged to postpone it. Margaret and Mrs. Watson had an invitation out to tea that night, and in consequence, Emma and Elizabeth spent a comfortable evening together. The former told her sister of her plans, her hopes, and her walk with Mr. Morgan. In the first of these, she sympathized sincerely, but when she heard of the latter, she looked horrified. Surely, Emma, you never could be so excessively imprudent. Walk tete a tete with Mr. Morgan? What could you be thinking of? Did anyone see you? I do not know. I never thought about it. Our meeting was quite accidental, Elizabeth, and as he wanted to speak to me, why should I not take that opportunity? I cannot see anything wrong with it. Why, he is old enough to be my father. Your father? What nonsense! He is a single man, and a man at least six ladies want to catch. I hope you were not seen by any one, for depend upon it if you were, the account of your walk will be all over the town tomorrow, and then you will get into a pretty scrape, said Elizabeth with a look of sincere commiseration. Why, what harm have I done, Elizabeth? I am sure I meant none. You will have put all the single ladies of Croydon in a passion, that's all and made yourself the subject of very unpleasant scandal. Well, I am very sorry, replied Emma quite humbly, but as I did not go on purpose to meet Mr. Morgan, and I had little Janetta with me, I never thought of there being any harm in it at all. They were interrupted in their conversation by the entrance of Robert, followed by a supper tray with oysters and porter for he was determined to enjoy himself in a comfortable way when his wife was out. When he had discussed the oysters and was composedly seated with his feet on the fender and a glass of hot brandy and water in his hand, Emma ventured to open the case to him and inform him of what she had learnt from Mr. Morgan and her wishes with regard to engaging in the situation he mentioned. Robert agreed to it very readily. He never had intended to keep a nursery governess for his daughter, the trouble of educating her would fall on Jane alone if Emma left them, but the expense of his sister's maintenance came out of his pocket. Therefore, though Mrs. Watson wished to retain her for the value of assistance which she well knew she could obtain under no other circumstances, Robert was quite willing to part with her, as it would be a certain saving to himself, and would give additional trouble only to his wife. He, therefore, gave her his entire approbation commending her warmly for thinking of exerting herself, as it was the duty of every individual to do, and even promised, with great liberality, to make her a present of a new cloak and bonnet when she left his house, that her dress might show her to advantage. At the same time, he gave her strict injunctions not to forget his interests when she was there, to recollect that it was always the duty of each one of the family to help the others forward, and therefore, if, on any occasion, Lady Fanny wanted an agent for her landed property, or needed the advice of a respectable lawyer, it became Emma's duty to say all she could for him. Emma promised she would take every opportunity in her power to attend to his injunctions, and soon after this the girls went to bed without waiting to see the others on their return home. The next morning was ushered in with a violent domestic storm, such as she never remembered to have witnessed before. How it began Emma did not know, but she was startled when quietly sitting in the nursery with her niece by the sound of loud screams which greatly alarmed her. Little Janetta looked up and said very innocently, Mama is in a fit. Do you hear? I dare say Papa is cross to her. Anxious to know the cause of the uproar, she ran downstairs, and entering the parlor, the door of which was open, she saw Mrs. Watson stretched on the sofa in a violent fit of hysterics, whilst Elizabeth and Margaret were vainly endeavouring to hold her hands and arms, which she threw about with convulsive energy, whilst her feet kept up a perpetual agitation in a way as far removed from elegance as possible. As her head was turned away from the door, Emma's entrance was unobserved, and her light step was quite unheard by Jane, who continued to scream vociferously. Fortunately, at that moment, one of the maids observed Mr. Morgan on the opposite side of the street, and running after him, he was soon brought back and introduced to the scene. Whilst he was applying sal volatile and cold water, and soothingly holding the lady's hand, her excitement gradually began to subside, and at length she was sufficiently recovered to open her eyes and look round her. But the moment she saw Emma standing near, her languid gestures were suddenly changed into looks of rage and starting up, 
exclaiming, You little ungrateful vixen! I'll teach you to treat me so! She aimed a violent blow at her, which, had not Mr. Morgan interposed, and with one arm drawn Emma back, whilst on the other he received the slap himself, would probably have been successful in its object. My dear girl, he whispered to Emma, as he withdrew the arm he had thrown round her waist to protect her. You had better leave the room. I must manage her myself. She readily obeyed the injunction, whilst the doctor, seating Mrs. Watson on the sofa, placed himself by her side, and, still holding her hand in his, he turned to Elizabeth and inquired, in a subdued and melancholy tone, suitable to the occasion, how this sad affair commenced. Elizabeth's account was not very clear, and, indeed, she was so puzzled and frightened that, had she really understood the case, she would have been at a loss how to explain herself. The facts were these. After breakfast, whilst Elizabeth had been out of the room, Robert had informed his wife that Emma was trying for the situation of governess to Lady Fanny Alston's daughter, with his entire approbation. This announcement was a severe blow to Jane, who did not at all like losing her services. She argued hard against it, representing the impossibility in her delicate state of health of her doing justice to Janetta or attending at all to her education. The certainty that on no other terms would they get a governess so cheaply, and the probability that the household expenses would shortly be greatly diminished by the marriage, not only of Margaret, but of Elizabeth likewise. But it was all in vain. The advantage was all to himself, the evil only to his wife. So Robert was firm, and even when Jane burst into a passion of tears and began to show symptoms of hysterics, he was still obdurate. Suddenly, the thought occurred to her. How did Emma learn that the situation was to be procured? And, at this point, began Elizabeth's knowledge of the affair, for she entered the room just in time to hear the question and to answer it. She explained that Emma had accidentally overheard their conversation, and, consequently, questioned Mr. Morgan about it. This announcement had put the climax to the lady's rage, and brought on the screams and convulsions which had occasioned so much disturbance. Mr. Morgan, however, knew how to manage her. My dear madam, said he in a softly soothing voice, you know I have forbidden this violent excitement. To people of your nervous temperament, it is decidedly hurtful, and should be avoided. I must give you something to calm you. Miss Watson will be so kind as to bring me a glass of cold water, quite pure water. Ah, my dear doctor, sighed the patient, how could you use me so? Join in a conspiracy against me? I am astonished. I did not expect this from you. I, my dear Mrs. Watson. What have I done to deserve such censure? Surely you are under a delusion. I do not understand you. You betrayed about Lady Fanny when I charged you not. You have been the means of setting my husband cruelly against me, making him take part with that little mischief-making vixen, Emma. There, there, interrupted he, placing one finger on her pulse. You are agitating yourself again. I must forbid such excessive excitement. Thank you, Miss Watson taking the glass from Elizabeth. Now please, young ladies, open the window a hair's breadth or so, and then leave the room. I always like to have the patient to myself. Then taking a little case from his pocket, he said, I have a fine sedative powder here, which I shall give you to calm your nerves. Then proceeding to mix something in the glass, which it required a good deal of faith to believe was anything but powdered sugar, he commanded her to sip a little at intervals and hold it as long as possible in her mouth without swallowing it. Having thus succeeded in stopping her tongue, he proceeded to explain the circumstances of his making Emma acquainted with what he had proposed, taking particular care to allow no blame to rest on her, and saying everything he could to flatter and soothe Mrs. Watson. And you see, added he, was I not quite right in thinking she ought to be removed from you? This may happen again and it is really too much for you. Do you not feel I am right? I am sure your own good sense must prove it. You cannot speak, I know, but press my hand if you agree with me. It is presumed the pressure was given. As Mr. Morgan seemed satisfied, he raised her hand and looked at it. How each slender finger trembles, said he. 
certainly there were few who would have applied such an epithet to her plump and powerful hand. Indeed, it's a very naughty hand, added he, tapping it playfully with the tips of his fingers. It hit me very hard upon my arm. The hand should be made to pay a forfeit for that. How shall I punish it? She smiled languidly. I was so provoked, doctor. You must forgive me. Forgive you? Oh, yes, dear madam. Only, you know, when a lady strikes a gentleman, she ought to pay the penalty attached, advancing his face very close to her cheek. Oh, fie, doctor, cried she, affecting to be quite shocked. You are really too bad. I am ashamed of you quite a form of denunciation which would be, in nine cases out of ten, considered a positive encouragement. At this moment, the door opened, and Robert entered the room. Doctor, I say, as Mrs. Watson appears a little better just now, I want to speak to you in my room for a moment. Mr. Morgan followed him directly, with a sort of dubious feeling as to what was to follow, but he felt rather relieved for the interruption, as he was conscious he had carried his tenderness quite as far as was necessary for the good of his patient. Robert wanted to learn for himself about the situation at Lady Fanny's, and question him with some interest on the subject, for in a case where his own interest was in no way involved, he was not exactly an unkind brother. He felt on the whole a tolerable share of anxiety that his sister should be as safe and comfortable as circumstances would admit, and was glad to hear from Mr. Morgan a very favorable account of the family in question. At length, having satisfied all the fraternal doubts and scruples of Mr. Watson, he returned to the lady, and was immediately assailed by a shower of questions relative to what her husband had wanted with him. He only smiled, and said it was nothing bad. But he was far too much used to the inquiries and curiosity of ladies not to be expert at baffling such an attack as hers. And now, my dear Mrs. Watson, said he, I must insist on your keeping your mind easy, and not worrying yourself about such things as the occasion of this attack. It is of serious importance. Indeed, it is. But, doctor, how can I keep my mind easy when I see that little ungrateful thing there, Emma, coming round my husband and persuading him to contradict me? Is it not enough to provoke a saint? To find one's own husband turned against one by his sister? And that after all the kindness I have shown her, but I knew how it would be from the first. That I did. I always said so from the time those girls entered the house. It is very probable your penetration, my dear friend, might lead you to that conclusion, and you may be right. But in that case, is it not satisfactory to you that there is an immediate prospect of their being removed? Will not Miss Margaret soon be married? Does not all the town see that George Miller intends soon, if the lady prove willing, to ally himself to your family? And supposing Emma is likewise removed, you will have nothing to vex you. That may be very true, doctor, but I do not think it is the case. If Emma would only be tractable and obedient, she would be rather useful than otherwise, and really she might be quite a comfort if she were better tempered and more accommodating. But to go and say such things, to be bent on having her own way, without caring about my convenience, to leave me with that child in my hands, never considering my fragile health, and the miseries I suffer. This is really more than I can bear. It puts me in a nervous tremor, which is very bad for me. See how my hand shakes still. I see, said the gentleman, contenting himself this time with simply looking at the hand extended to him. But now I must wish you good morning. Remember my prescriptions, and pray keep quiet. The rest of the day was spent by Mrs. Watson, shut up tete-a-tete -tete with Margaret, bewailing her hard fate in having such a husband and such a tiresome sister. She would not go down to dinner, but indulged in a quiet little regale in her own bedroom of some dainties of a very superior order to the plain boiled beef and suet pudding, which was the family meal. Her husband took refuge with some friends, and Elizabeth and Emma spent another quiet evening together during which Elizabeth, with open-hearted warmth, confided to her sister how very much she liked George Miller, and how sanguine were her hopes that George Miller did not dislike her. She had seen a great deal more of him than Emma, for their walk to the farm had only been the precursor of several others to different places, and they had enjoyed them all exceedingly. He had not actually proposed to her yet, but he had both said and done things which led her to expect that such a termination to their acquaintance was in his contemplation. 
All this was truly the subject of rejoicing to Emma, especially as she was convinced from what she had both seen and heard of George Miller, that he was not a man to draw back from an implied engagement and hold himself privileged to carry his actions to any point of particularity, provided he never committed himself by word. It was true. Had it been her taste to be consulted, she would have preferred a quieter person, one more inclined to study and literature, and in every respect more refined. But Elizabeth would indeed be well matched, and the happiness of thinking this led her to reflect with pleasure even on their visit at Croydon, painful as it had been to herself in most respects. End of Volume 2, Chapter 12 Recording by McKenna March, Bremerton, Washington Volume 2, Chapter 13 of The Younger Sister This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubbock The next morning was ushered in with less of domestic tempest than the last. Mrs. Watson was tired of her own room and quite ready to come downstairs and mix in the world. She was perfectly amiable today, with only the drawback of being a little sulky to her husband, and exceedingly snappish to his sisters, except to Emma, whom she did not condescend to address at all. Emma thought this silence decidedly better than the form of invective which was the usual address to her, so that on the whole the day passed with tolerable comfort and peace to those concerned. That afternoon, Mrs. Watson having occasion to send a note to an acquaintance residing nearly a mile from the town, she chose to employ Emma as a messenger, ordering her at the same time to be sure and not allow Janetta to over-fatigue herself, but to carry her if the poor child was tired. The way led them through pleasant fields, and as the aunt and niece were quietly sauntering along, the little girl filling her hands with daisies, or stopping to watch the birds flitting in the hedgerow, they were again overtaken by Mr. Morgan, who seemed prepared to join their walk. Emma colored deeply, and was considerably embarrassed by the recollection of what Elizabeth had said about him. They had passed his house on their way, and she could not but suspect that his joining them was the result of design, not accident. With the vanity common to men, he completely misinterpreted the blushes and embarrassment of the pretty girl who interested him so much, and he fancied he was giving her peculiar pleasure when, after inquiring how far they were going, he assured her that his way led in the same direction, and that he should be most happy to escort her. Had she not been charged with the note from Jane, she would immediately have turned back. But she had no recourse, and as she had not courage to desire him to leave her, she saw nothing to be done but to submit in as quiet and unconcerned a manner as possible. "'I hope,' said he presently, you do not feel any the worse for the excitement and agitation which you went through yesterday. She thanked him rather coldly, and replied she was very well, but he was not to be so repulsed. He was bent on making himself agreeable to her, and with a quick perception of the readiest means, long practice, and no scruples on the subject, it was no wonder that he succeeded. There was just the proper air of interest— joined to a respectful deference, at the same time that he showed by his intimate knowledge of the family concerns, that he was completely in the confidence of her sister-in-law, and deserving to be treated as a friend of the family, the sympathy which he seemed endeavoring vainly to suppress, and the knowledge of her situation and difficulties, which he allowed her to discover he possessed, all tended to throw her off her guard, and to abate the cold indifference with which she meant to have treated him, he was so kind, so considerately and properly kind, and then both her brother and sister had allowed him to be so much connected with their affairs that it was impossible to repulse him, and gradually, she hardly knew how, she found herself led on to speak to him with openness, which he, in reality, little deserved. Mr. Morgan was a man of no principles, whose ruling passion was vanity, and this passion with him took one particular turn. He liked to be beloved by all the women of his acquaintance. The self-complacency excited by the worship of a woman was to him the most agreeable feeling in the world. He did not flirt merely for an idle amusement, like Tom Musgrove, with an entire indifference to the feelings he excited, 
but he made downright serious but clandestine love to nearly all the good-looking women with whom his practice brought him acquainted he liked of all things to watch the gradual growth of an ardent love in the unsuspecting heart and more than one interesting girl had had occasion to rue the day when illness had first brought her acquainted with mr morgan more than one young wife had been hurried abruptly from the neighborhood, as was whispered, because her husband thought her too fond of the doctor. Yet so well had he managed, and so general was the admiration he excited, that he never bore a fraction of the blame which was unsurprisingly bestowed on the victims of his arts. This was the man who, struck by Emma's beauty and seeing her helpless situation, had formed a deliberate plan to gain her affections though what was to follow when she was thus added to his list of triumphs he had not quite determined one thing was certain he did not mean to marry her but the necessary evils to which he saw she was exposed laid her he imagined peculiarly open to temptation and he certainly indulged in hopes and speculations for which even the phlegmatic robert would have kicked him out of the house had they chanced to come to his knowledge one great object in his attempt to remove her to Lady Fanny Alston's was that it would give him so great an advantage over her. Lady Fanny and her daughter were both invalids, and he was in the habit of visiting them every day. This, could he place Emma there, was an important step, as it would bring him in the most advantageous position before her eyes. She would see no one else, shut up for weeks together with an ailing child, her only recreation being an hour's drive in the pony chaise every morning, she would soon learn to look forward to his visit as the great event of the day. He should see her eyes sparkle at his approach, and feel her hand gently tremble as he pressed it. Such had been the case with her predecessor, and now that the poor girl had lost her health and spirits from disappointed affections and heart-sickening anxiety, he was coldly turning to seek another to supply her place. Little did Emma, as she listened to his sentiments of sympathy, his professions of philosophy, or his insinuations of warm interest, suspect the real motive of his actions and his friendship. His age, so much greater than hers, prevented her supposing he would feel attachment, and her own preference for Mr. Howard was a safeguard to her own affections. After conversing some time with great apparent interest on the subject of education, as appropriate to her peculiar calling, he gradually turned it in an almost imperceptible way to the scene of yesterday. The necessity of subduing passion and the dreadful effects of it when unrestrained naturally brought on a comment on the conduct of her sister-in-law. It was shocking, he protested, to think of such violence. It made his heart bleed to imagine what a mild and gentle-tempered girl must undergo when dependent on such a relative. Hers was a heavy hand, as he had experienced. He was delighted that he had warded off one blow from her. He only wished he could more effectually protect her from the other hardships of her lot. Emma assured him that such a scene had never occurred before, and probably would never do so again that he greatly magnified the evils of her situation, and that she really did not require such intense sympathy as he seemed inclined to bestow on her. This, so far from stopping him, only brought on a more decided eulogium upon the sweetness of temper which could endure such tyranny, and the self-denial which must be practiced daily to live in peace with one who could practice it. How much farther his compliments would have carried him is not known, as they arrived at the lodge gate and Emma was obliged to interrupt him to deliver the note which formed her errand. Now she expected to part company, but, to her great surprise, she found on turning her steps homewards that he was still at her elbow, and that he seemed resolved to continue the conversation as well as the walk. What was still more provoking, Janetta claimed his assistance to carry her again, and Emma had no alternative but to continue with him and as he caught up the child with glee and an appearance of positive enjoyment. This, my dear Miss Emma, said he, is a trouble which, I trust, you will not long have to endure. At Lady Fanny's you will not be expected to do anything which would be more properly entrusted to a servant. You will be Miss Alston's companion, not her slave, and I shall, indeed, rejoice to see it so. Emma thanked him with a sincerity rather greater, perhaps, than his own, but she could not help heartily wishing that he would demonstrate his interest in some other way than in walking home with her. 
she was in continual dread of meeting someone who would know her. For, though she really saw no harm in it herself, yet after what Elizabeth had said, she was afraid of being misinterpreted or misjudged. He parted from her at the entrance of the town, and Emma returned in some trepidation homewards. The whole town of Croydon was, shortly after, thrown into a ferment by the announcement that George Miller, the rich, the popular, the good-looking George Miller, was engaged, actually engaged to be married to Elizabeth Watson. It was so extraordinary, so incredible, so unheard of, that a young woman like Elizabeth Watson, not so very young, for she was at least thirty, they said, if not more, who had never been handsome, and was now decidedly faded, without money, for everyone knew she was dependent on her brother, in short, with none of the requisites for matrimony, except a pleasing person, an amiable and unselfish disposition, good temper, and a most affectionate heart, that such a girl should have presumed to try for George Miller's hand, and should have had the effrontery to accept him when he offered. She was a stranger, an interloper, and for her to come and thus carry off in triumph their best bow, it was too bad. As the oldest Miss Morgan observed to one of her intimate friends, she was sure there was more than they understood in the business, and she should like to know where they were to look for husbands if their fellow townsmen deserted them in that way for strange faces. It was the more hard upon Miss Morgan, because she had been so very kind to the children. She had more than once asked them to drink tea, and often kissed her hand to them from the drawing-room window. The houses were exactly opposite, and it would be too much to be forced to sit in contemplation of another mistress ruling in the house where she had long expected to reign supreme. It was the elder young ladies of the neighborhood who felt the affront most keenly, and were most bitter against Miss Watson. They had long regarded Mr. Miller as the lawful property of one of themselves, ever since the second month after his wife's death. And, unfortunately for their peace of mind, Mrs. Turner's habit of flattering everyone had given rise to hopes in their minds, which it now seemed never would be realized. The younger ladies felt it much less acutely, for, as a widower and a man verging on forty, they regarded George Miller as a little past his youthful and interesting days. But they felt for their friends and their sisters and sympathized in their indignation. Had Miss Watson been a stranger, in reality the affair would have been more endurable. Had she been married from Winston, for instance, they would have welcomed her to Croydon with tolerable cordiality, nay, perhaps with absolute enthusiasm. She might have been pictured then in their imaginations with no colors less brilliant than those belonging to a gay wedding and making her first appearance in new finery, she would probably have won popularity immediately. But now, the case was very different. It had all passed before their own eyes, so they naturally suspected something quite wrong, and Mrs. Watson was involved in the blame, as it was supposed she must have aided to win the point by some skillful maneuvering. It was so unnatural, so improbable, that, out of four sisters, three should be engaged to be married, that Miss Morgan declared, over and over again, that she could not, and would not believe it happened in the due course of events. There must be something wrong about those Watsons, and she was determined to find it out. Elizabeth was very unsuspicious of the storm her engagement had raised, but went about as usual with a smiling face looking forward to the termination of her residence with her brother, with peculiar satisfaction, and rejoicing especially, because she had a plan in her head for the advantage of Emma. This was no less than that Emma should reside with them, and since she was resolved against spending her life in idleness, that she should consent to superintend the education of Mr. Miller's little girls, for which task Elizabeth felt she was more competent than herself. In the meantime, she did not mention it to her until her own plans were arranged with a little more certainty and the time of their wedding fixed. At present, they could only say that it should not take place for a couple of months, at least. A day or two after this grand event becoming known, Mr. Morgan called on Mrs. Watson and found her little girl in the room. After praising and caressing the child, he asked her if she should like to ride a donkey and turning to the mother with a winning smile, he added that he had a very beautiful Spanish donkey, for which, at present, he had no occasion, that it was quite at the service of her charming daughter, for whom, he was convinced, the exercise would be peculiarly salutary. He, therefore, begged she would make use of it as her own. Mrs. Watson gratefully assented. Tomorrow, Janetta should have a ride, but the little girl cried out for today. She would go today. Aunt Emma must take her out today 
and she always had her own way with her mother. And as Mr. Morgan was merely following out a concerted plan, she, of course, carried her point. And, whilst she went upstairs to make her aunt get ready for the excursion, the gentleman hurried away to give orders to prepare the donkey. In about half an hour, Janetta had the delight of seeing the promised animal at the door with a beautiful new saddle and white bridle, and she clapped her hands with ecstasy as the doctor's footboy placed her on, hardly sitting sufficiently still to allow him to fasten the strap in front of the Spanish saddle. Emma felt extremely reluctant to go. She feared Mr. Morgan might again join them, and tried hard to persuade Margaret to accompany her. But Margaret hated walking like a nursemaid after the child and Elizabeth being out, Emma had no alternative but to set out alone. The footboy said his master had ordered him to go with them to see how the donkey went and to save Miss Watson any trouble. Emma rejoiced at this announcement, although it seemed to her so unreasonable an encroachment on Mr. Morgan's obliging temper that she half dreaded lest her sister-in-law should decline the lad's services. Mrs. Watson, however, accepted it all as if, in allowing the favor to be confirmed, she were in reality the giver, instead of the receiver of the benefit. She seemed rather to expect that he would be grateful that his donkey had the honor of carrying her little girl. Emma's anticipations proved perfectly correct, for they met Mr. Morgan again, and he again, uninvited, prepared to accompany them. She resolved that this should not occur another time, as she determined at once to speak to her brother, representing how extremely unpleasant it was for her to be daily sent out walking where she was exposed to be joined by anyone in this way, and begging that in future the duty of walking out with Janetta might devolve on one of the maids, when neither of her sisters could accompany her. If it had not been that she feared it was wrong, she would have enjoyed the walk extremely, as the day was fresh and invigorating, whilst her companion was particularly pleasant. She found his conversation both instructive and amusing, and as Janetta, on her donkey, kept a little ahead of them, they were free from the incessant calls on her attention with which the child usually interrupted them. Their tete-a-tete -tete did not, as usual, conclude at the suburbs of the town, for, emboldened probably by habit, he walked straight home with her, with only the precaution of placing himself on one side of Janetta, and lifting the child off at the door, he carried her in triumph to her mother. Emma expected and hoped that some notice would be taken of his having accompanied them, as she rather hesitated about introducing the subject, but Mrs. Watson seemed satisfied with believing that this was a refined compliment to herself through her child, as if a man of his age could take such pleasure in the society of a girl not yet out of babyhood. Emma was therefore firmly resolved to speak to Robert on the subject, and that afternoon, finding him alone in the parlor, she, with some hesitation, introduced the point. He heard her with considerable surprise. Well, said he, when she seemed to have done, what do you want or expect me to do? What's all this to me, child? I want you, brother, to persuade Jane not to send me out without a maid or some other companion, that I may not be exposed to long walks with him. But what harm does Morgan do you, I should like to know? Are you afraid he will eat you up? Or what do you fear? inquired he in a very discouraging tone. I am afraid it may excite observation and unpleasant reports, if I am seen repeatedly walking with a single man, replied poor Emma, not liking to say that she thought wrong what Robert seemed to regard as so innocent. Pooh, pooh, child, don't be absurd and prudish. There's no use in setting yourself up for an immaculate young lady. I don't believe but that you like it all the time, and are only wanting a little domestic persecution to make you more interesting. I am not going to indulge you, so you must find out some other way of making a martyr of yourself. Indeed, you are quite mistaken, but I do not think it right to throw myself in the way of any man as I am obliged to do with regard to him and I would rather not go out of the house for a month than continue, as I have done, meeting him. Morgan's a very good kind of fellow, and will do you no harm, repeated Robert, as if rather at a loss what else to say. And Emma, thinking she saw symptoms of wavering in his tone, began to hope that she should carry her point when Jane entered the room, and her husband at once appealed to her. Emma's astonishment was great at the way in which she took it. She had expected she would be angry at her walking with Mr. Morgan, but that was not the case. Her indignation seemed only roused by the fact of her wanting to evade the walking at all. She was in a great passion at this. A very pretty thing indeed, Miss Emma Watson, 
a very pretty thing, that you are to be fancying yourself too grand and too great to walk out with my child. Want a servant sent after you, do you? I wonder what your ladyship will want next. Upon my word, for such a little saucy minx as you, to be giving yourself such airs is rather too good, I must say. I have no wish to give myself airs. I only want... But she was not allowed to finish the sentence. You don't wish this, and you don't wish that, and you only want something quite different from what I order. I see what it is, miss. I know you want to be mistress, that's all. And if Mr. Morgan does walk with you, where's the harm of that? Are you such a conceited creature as to fancy it as your beauty which charms him? Depend upon it. You are very safe with him. It's for my child that he comes. Out of compliment to me, of course. So don't you go pluming yourself upon his attentions, or expecting anything to come of that. You are greatly mistaken if you think him in love with you. I can swear for it. I never for a moment supposed such a thing, replied Emma, with a spirit which was roused by her sister's injustice. But I am sure that it is not correct or respectable to be walking repeatedly alone with any gentleman, even one of Mr. Morgan's age and character. And I have a right, whilst I live with you, to have my respectability of appearance attended to. Mrs. Watson stood with a face of scarlet and her mouth open, contemplating Emma as she spoke with unaccustomed energy. She seemed almost to mistrust her senses at hearing such words, but Emma's firmness quite appalled her, and she actually did not know what to say. Seeing she was silent, Emma added, Therefore, for the present, I must beg that when one of my sisters cannot accompany me, you will send the maid in my place. When in company with anyone else, I shall have no objection to walk with Janetta as usual. Oh, well, said Jane after some hesitation, as you wish it so much, I will see what I can do, and perhaps Martha may walk with Janetta tomorrow. Emma thanked her, and the entrance of her sisters fortunately prevented farther discussion. Emma was rather surprised that she heard no more from Lady Fanny Alston, but the fact was her ladyship was ill and quite incapable of exerting herself in any way. Therefore, her engagement with Emma was forced to remain unsettled until she recovered sufficient strength to think again. Relieved from the care of Janetta's walk the next day, Emma enjoyed the treat of accompanying Elizabeth and the two Millers during a stroll in the country. Annie, of course, was her companion, and she found it a very charming change from the incessant trouble of looking after a young child. They talked much of Elizabeth's future prospects, and of Annie's likewise. She was delighted at the idea of the marriage, and anticipated with pleasure the society of a sister. She told Emma she had hardly known George's first wife, as she had been at school until after her death, and often spent her holidays with her own mother's relations. But since there would now be a chaperone for her on all occasions, her home would be much pleasanter. At the same time, she confided to Emma her secret wonder that any woman should marry at all, excepting her own brother, she did not believe there existed a single man in the world good enough to serve as a reasonable excuse for a woman becoming his slave. Emma remonstrated and protested at this idea, but Annie laughed and persisted. She asserted that nearly all men were dreadful and selfish, and that as it was impossible to be thoroughly acquainted with their dispositions until after marriage, and it was then too late to change, it was much better not to take the fatal step, but to continue mistress of oneself and one's fortune. She never meant to marry. That was her firm determination. Emma suggested that she might fall in love, but Annie protested again that the fall, which she considered a serious fall indeed, was only the effect of a predisposition to commit matrimony, and that where the mind was firmly made up, as hers was, on the subject, there could not be the slightest danger of such an accident. Emma smiled and said time would show whilst Annie drew an animated picture of the miseries of matrimony, dwelling on all the little trifles which she could imagine or recollect, to convince her companion of the wretchedness of the state. In spite of the nonsense she talked, Emma liked her very much, and was quite sorry when their walk came to a termination. Several days passed quietly, and there was, during that time, no solitary walk for Emma. One of her sisters was her constant companion, and sometimes Janetta accompanied her mother, sometimes went out with the maid. Neither did Mr. Morgan plague her any more. They passed two or three times on the road, but a friendly bow was all the intercourse they had together. And when he called on Mrs. Watson, which Emma rather thought occurred pretty often, she never saw him. 
Her first interview was on the occasion of his coming to take a quiet dinner, and the cause of his being asked to do so was so grand an event as to throw his presence quite into the shade. It was nothing less than the first visit of Tom Musgrove to his betrothed. He had written to say he was coming down to Croydon, and the announcement threw Margaret into such a state of trepidation and nervous excitement as to make Mr. Morgan and a composing drought absolutely necessary for her. She was very near fainting when she received the letter, and indeed was only prevented by not knowing how to manage it. Her next idea was to go out and see how many of her acquaintance she could meet with, either in the street or their own houses, to whom she might impart the interesting intelligence. She had intense gratification in assuring them of the nervous tremors, the palpitations, the painful excitement, the strain on the mental energies, the soft sensibility, the affecting circumstances, and all other sentiments and weaknesses with which she was pleased to charge herself. She viewed with much satisfaction the envy and mortification with which her joyous prospects were viewed by her sweet young friends. The more cool and indifferent they appeared, the more she enjoyed expatiating on her own delightful situation. Some she kindly congratulated, because they had now experienced her agitating feelings. Some she fondly caressed, because she could see they would feel the same in a similar situation. And some she triumphantly hoped might ever be blessed with prospects as bright as her own. In all this excitement, Emma and her walks were nearly forgotten and she was suddenly asked, as a special favor, to take Janetta out for half an hour. She could not refuse, and had the satisfaction of going and returning without seeing anything of Mr. Morgan, or encountering any acquaintance whomsoever. This gave her courage, and she began to think her fears and scruples were as imaginary as Jane had assumed them to be. End of Volume 2 Recording by McKenna March, Bremerton, Washington Volume 3, Chapter 1 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Erickson, Okemos, Michigan. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Huback. Volume 3, Chapter 1. The afternoon passed away, and Margaret, who had been incessantly walking from one window to another to watch for her lover's curricle, now began to create a new sensation for herself by a conviction which suddenly seized on her that some dreadful accident had happened to him. It was towards the end of March, and the lengthened days allowed them plenty of time to dine by daylight, and enjoy a long twilight afterwards. As the evening began to close in, her alarm and tribulation increased, when at length her fears were dissipated by seeing the curricle drive up to the door with the most important bustle, followed by a loud and prolonged knock which instantly brought twenty heads to the neighboring windows. Margaret sank on a sofa and exclaimed in feeble tones, "'He is there. My heart tells me he is there. Support me, my dear sisters. Support me in this trying hour.' Before any one had time to answer her, his step was heard on the stairs, and recovering as rapidly as she had appeared to lose her strength, she flew to the door and was ready to have thrown herself into his arms on the smallest encouragement. He did not, however, seem to desire her embraces, but coolly held out his hand and inquired how she was." then, without waiting for an answer, turned and paid a similar compliment to the other ladies. She looked a little disappointed at the want of tenderness her lover displayed, but consoled herself by smoothing down the nap of his hat, which she took from his hand, and stretching out the fingers of his driving gloves, of which she also assumed the care. At this moment, Robert Watson and Mr. Morgan, who had been sitting over their wine in the dining parlor, appeared upstairs, and Robert immediately suggested to Mr. Musgrove that he must want some dinner, to which the latter readily acceded. Jane and Margaret, who appeared to be almost equally interested in the newcomer, both left the room to see after the necessary preparations, and whilst they were gone, George Miller came in and persuaded Elizabeth to go home with him, to take tea with his sister and mother-in-law. Robert and his new guest adjourned to the dining room, where the two ladies joined them, and Emma was left to a tete-a-tete -tete with Mr. Morgan. He had seated himself in a corner and was looking over the newspaper during all the bustle attending the arrival of Tom Musgrove and the successive entrances and exits of the several members of the party. But when they were all gone, and Emma was quietly sitting down to work, he threw away the paper and walking across the room drew a chair close to hers and seemed inclined to enter into conversation. "'How happy your sister must be,' was his first speech, whilst he fixed his uncommonly penetrating eyes on her face. "'Which sister?' replied Emma, without looking up from her embroidery. Both must be happy, replied he, but at this moment I imagine your sister Margaret's feelings must be the most agreeable, 
Meeting after a prolonged absence must be so delightful. Don't you envy her? I hope not, said Emma, for she was not quite satisfied with his tone and manner. There was something of sarcasm in it which she did not like. I did not mean envy in the bad sense, he remarked, as if comprehending her thoughts from her tone. Of that I know you to be incapable. But can you not fancy how pleasant her emotions must be when again enjoying the society of an attached and faithful lover, like the gentleman in question? Perhaps I can, but I must be in her situation thoroughly to enter into her feelings, said Emma, rather wishing to drop the subject. And hitherto you have not been placed in this interesting situation? There was something in the tone in which Mr. Morgan made this comment, with his eyes fixed on her countenance, that gave it rather the character of a question than a reply. She felt offended at his manner and tone, and proudly raised her head with a look which seemed to ask what right he had to inquire on that subject. He understood her meaning, but did not seem inclined to take any notice of it, proceeding in the same way to observe, they whose hearts are untouched cannot, of course, understand all the pleasing emotions which the sight of a beloved object raises after a prolonged absence. Nor indeed does it require a prolonged absence to give occasion to the emotions I speak of. A month, a fortnight, even a week passed without the intercourse, which becomes dear and therefore necessary, is sufficient to raise a variety of pleasing but most overpowering feelings in an affectionate heart. Very likely, replied Emma coolly, and then she added immediately an inquiry as to whether he thought the next change of the moon would bring them more settled weather. He answered that he could not tell, and then added, Do you not think your future brother, Mr. Musgrove, is a very charming young man? I have often heard him called so, said Emma, but you know it is not my business to be charmed with him, smiling a little as she spoke. You are most discreet, said he, delighted that she appeared inclined to relax a little from her former gravity. But to tell you the truth, I should not have expected, from what I knew, that you would be charmed with him. From what you know of him or of me, inquired Emma. Of you both, but especially of you. It is not for nothing that I have been studying your character, and I am convinced that a man who would attract you, Miss Emma, must possess more good qualities than Mr. Musgrove can boast of. Perhaps I might be a little difficult to please, replied Emma, but do you think there is any harm in that? Harm, no, replied he with enthusiasm. Minds of a common order cannot discriminate between what is good or evil in its tendency. They see only what is evil to their own capacities, and are entirely unaware of the vast difference between the intellects of one man and another, whilst those who by their own intellectual powers are raised above the common level take in, at one keen and rapid view, the different mental altitudes of their companions, and appreciating alone the grand and elevated turn from more ordinary minds with indifference, contempt, or disgust. I hope, said Emma, rather doubtingly, that your description is not intended to apply to me. That is, if I understand you rightly, I should be very sorry to think I am guilty of setting up my understanding as a measure for that of others, or of despising any of my companions as thinking them less clever than myself. Indeed, I did not mean to accuse you of voluntarily giving way to such feelings. The sensation I meant to depict is as involuntary as your perception of light or color. A person endowed with a superior understanding could no more help deciding on the different mental capacities of her companions than she could on the beauty or fitness of the patterns of their gowns. But the superiority of mental capacities, or our own estimation of them, ought not to be the standard by which we should judge of the merits of our fellow creatures, Mr. Morgan. Surely their moral superiority is a far more important point, and it would be much better to live with a good but ignorant man than with a wicked one, however clever and well-informed. Mr. Morgan rather curled his lip. I doubt whether you will find your maxim work well in everyday life, however well it may sound in theory. The practice of mankind is against it universally, and where that is the case it is because the sense of the world leads them to the conclusion which you reject. Look around and see who has most success in life, the clever, unscrupulous, and if you will, the unprincipled man, or the sober, plodding moral one, without wit or wisdom to prevent his sinking lower than the condition in which he was born. Emma had not the vanity to suppose that she could be a match for Mr. Morgan in dispute. She was therefore contented to let the subject drop. Finding she did not reply, he moved his chair a little closer than before, and said in a tone of the softest sympathy, Are you quite well this evening? Dusk as it is, I am struck with your looks, and was so at dinner. She thanked him and replied she was pretty well. He did not seem satisfied. Are you sure you have no headache? There is a languor in your movements and a heaviness in your eyes, which plainly shows that all is not quite right with you. Confess the truth. Does not your head ache? She owned it did a little. I thought I knew your countenance too well to be misled, said he, complacently. Then, taking her hand without the smallest ceremony in both of his, he felt her pulse, 
and told her she was nervous and feverish. She smiled and said she was only a little tired, and that he must not persuade her she was ill. She had not time for that. I am certain, replied he, still detaining her hand, which she had made a slight attempt to withdraw, I am certain from the tremulous motion of your little fairy-like fingers that you are suffering from over-excitement of mind. You have so much to worry and distress you, so many small privations and never-ceasing annoyances that your nervous temperament is wrought up to too high a pitch. This little hand is looking too white and delicate for health. You must indeed, for your own sake, and for the sake of those that love you, take care of yourself, and do not tax your constitution too far. I do not mind what you say, Mr. Morgan, replied Emma, playfully, again attempting to withdraw her hand from a clasp which she felt rather too tender for a doctor. I know you only speak professionally, and it is your business to persuade those who listen to you that they are ill, that you may have the satisfaction of making them believe you cure them afterwards. Fie, fie, replied he, tapping her on the arm. I did not expect such malice from you, fair Emma. She decidedly drew her hand from his, and moved her chair away towards the window, saying as she did so, in a graver tone, Remember, I have not placed myself under your power, Mr. Morgan, and you have no business to attempt to mislead me. The rapidly decreasing light prevented his reading the expression of her countenance, but he felt from her tone and action that she would not endure the small personal liberties in which some of his patients permitted him. There was a pause, which she broke by saying, My sisters are a long time away. I must go to see for them. No, pray stay another moment, cried he, rising too as she rose. Allow me one moment more, one other word. She stopped and was silent for a minute, till she said, Well, Mr. Morgan, what am I to stop for? Tell me, said he, why you freeze me with that look and manner. Did I offend you with my remarks? Is my friendship the warm interest I feel for you? Is it unpleasant? Or in what way have I sinned to deserve this sudden check? She was excessively embarrassed, and mentally determined not to remain in the dusk tete-a-tete with a man again, at least not with Mr. Morgan. But this resolution, however good for the future, did not help her at the present moment. When she was thus standing before him, and under the unpleasant necessity of either admitting that she was capricious, or allowing that she attached more importance than, perhaps, it deserved to a trifling action on his part. Seeing that she hesitated, he continued, I will not press for an answer if it vexes you, and you must own mentally, if not openly, that you judged me harshly. I forgive you, convinced when you know me better, you will not do so again. He took her hand again, and was just in the act of putting his lips to it, when the door opened suddenly, and several young ladies, whom in the dusk she could hardly distinguish, burst into the room. "'Is that you, Margaret?' said one advancing. "'That we have caught making love in the dark? No, upon my honour, it's Emma Watson and my brother. Ha, ha! So you are found out, James.' "'Oh, it's not the first time that Miss Emma Watson has indulged your brother in a tete-a-tete,' -tete, cried a voice, which Emma recognized as belonging to Miss Jenkins, a particular friend of Margaret's, towards whom she felt a strong repugnance. "'They have been found out before now. They are very fond of taking long walks together, aren't you, Mr. Morgan? And carrying Janetta, too.' It was too dark for the expression of any one's countenance to be seen, so that the angry look with which Mr. Morgan received this attack, and the confusion and distress which Emma betrayed— were alike invisible. But could he have annihilated the young ladies who thus intruded, including his sister, he would certainly have done it with pleasure. Any answer on his part was prevented by the entrance of the party from the dining-room with lights, when a general scene of confusion and chattering followed, which concluded by a general invitation to the young visitors to stay for tea and have a little fun, to which they readily assented. Tom Musgrove, having eaten and drank, soon made himself very agreeable to the whole party, and after the tea and bread and butter were removed, he proposed a game at Blind Man's Bluff, or Hunt the Slipper, to finish the evening. The former was adopted, and a very noisy party it proved. Tom, of course, was the first to be blinded, and unless he contrived to see out from under the handkerchief, the dexterity with which he avoided catching Margaret, though she perpetually threw herself in his way, was quite wonderful. His first victim was the younger Miss Morgan, a pretty giggling girl who laughed so excessively and twisted about so much that he had great difficulty in holding her at all, and it was only by clasping his arm very tightly round her waist that he succeeded in keeping her prisoner. However, he named her rightly, and the handkerchief was secured on her. Her brother was the next. Apparently, he threw himself in her way. Whether because he disliked her going through the process of catching and naming Mr. Musgrove was not quite certain. Perhaps he wished himself to succeed her. He certainly was very successful in catching prisoners but made extraordinary blunders in recognizing them, never once hitting on the proper name, and consequently having no right to make over the bandage to another. 
At length, after several attempts, he succeeded in catching Emma herself. She had not been able to avoid joining in the game, though it was not much to her taste. But she took great pains to move about as quietly and keep as much out of the way as possible. His ear, however, was quick at detecting her light footstep, and unknown to her, he had traced her into a corner, where she was quietly resting when he succeeded in laying hold of her. As she neither struggled nor laughed, he knew instantly who it was, and whilst he held her hand in his, and made believe as usual to feel her features and ascertain her identity, he whispered, under cover of the noise which some of the other girls were making, "'Do you wish to be blinded, Emma Watson?' "'Certainly not,' replied she in the same tone, and he immediately guessed her to be someone else, and with a gentle pressure of her hand he let her go. Emma was very well pleased to escape, but she felt a half-scruple at the manner in which it was done, from the sort of private understanding which Mr. Morgan assumed to exist between them. On turning away, too, she caught the malevolent eyes of Miss Jenkins fixed on her, and she could not encounter their look without a feeling of embarrassment. Mr. Morgan soon afterwards caught and rightly named Mrs. Watson herself, who in her turn chased with great vigor but little success her different visitors. The whole affair ended in a complete romp. The table was upset, chairs thrown over, and Emma's gown narrowly escaped from a lighted candle, which the dexterity of Mr. Morgan alone succeeded in averting. It was now judged that they had enjoyed fun enough for one evening, and Emma, wondering much at the taste which could select such an amusement, retired to recover from the fatigue it occasioned. She had never seen anything of the kind before, for the associates of her uncle and aunt were very quiet people, and she had been quite ignorant of the extent to which liveliness might be carried when unchecked by the restraints of good breeding. It was a very unexpected pleasure to her to receive the next morning a letter from Miss Osborne, containing an announcement that the day for her wedding was fixed, and that it was to be celebrated in about three weeks. She hoped Emma would be able to keep her promise and spend some time with them whilst at Osborne Castle, but she did not assign any particular time as the date of their visit. Margaret likewise had her share of excitement and pleasure. It appeared that Tom Musgrove had come down with serious intentions of persuading her to marry on the same day as Sir William Gordon and Miss Osborne had fixed on. To be distinguished and to appear connected with the great was so completely the object of his life that he did not like even to fix a day for his own wedding entirely with regard to his own convenience, and now he was determined to make it as important as the reflected grandeur of Miss Osborne and her noble family could do. The credit of this idea, however, was not entirely due to him. It was suggested originally by Sir William himself. Miss Osborne, who could not feel quite happy or at her ease with regard to his steadiness of purpose until the ceremony had actually passed, which would make it certain that her testimony would never be required, induced Sir William Gordon to question him as to when he intended to marry, and though he found Tom's ideas rather vague and unsettled on the subject, he had not much difficulty in persuading him of the advantage of fixing on the same day as their own. The notion delighted Mr. Musgrove, and he immediately determined to run down to Croydon and make the proposal at once. "'Well, Margaret,' said he, the morning after his arrival, "'since it seems we must be married sooner or later, do you see any good in delay?' Margaret simpered and blushed, and did not know very well which way to look or what to say. "'I say,' continued he, "'there is no use in wasting time when the thing must be done, unless, indeed, you have changed your mind.' "'Oh, dear, no, Tom,' cried Margaret. "'Mine is a mind not lightly to be changed. You know that much, I am sure of me.' "'Miss Osborne is to marry this day three weeks,' observed Tom, "'to my friend Sir William Gordon, and he was proposing to me that we should celebrate ours on the same day.' I should rather like it, I own, as they are such particular friends of mine, and we are going to the same county. They come down to Osborne Castle for their honeymoon, and we might, indeed of course we should, be asked up there on our wedding. Oh, delightful, Tom, cried Margaret, perfectly enchanted at the prospect, and in the rapture of the view quite overlooking the coolness of her lover's manner, and the total absence of even any pretense of affection. I should like that of all things, only perhaps I might have some difficulty in getting my wedding things ready in time. To be sure, as I must wear mourning, I should not want much just at first, but a gown and hat. What should my gown be, dear Tom? Hang your gown. What do I know about your gown? Or what has that got to do with it? But women always make such a confounded fuss about their gowns and their petticoats. I say, will you marry me this day three weeks? Because if you will not, you may just let it alone for anything I care. "'You are always so funny, Tom,' said Margaret, trying to laugh. "'I never know what you will say next. "'But you do hurry and flurry one so, asking in that sort of offhand way, 
Upon my word, I do not know what to answer. What can I say to him, Jane? Is he not odd? For heaven's sake, Mrs. Watson, do try and persuade Margaret to act with a little common sense, if she has such a commodity in her brain, cried Tom, impatiently. Really, simpered Mrs. Watson, you are the most unlover-like lover that ever I saw. If I were you, Margaret, I would tease him unceasingly for these speeches. I would say him nay, and nay, and nay again, before I would give him his own way. Oh, I am not so very cruel, said Margaret. He knows my disposition, and how much he may venture on with me. Well, when you have made up your mind, let me know, said he, settling himself in an easy chair, and pretending to drop asleep. Upon my word, Margaret, said Mrs. Watson, he gives himself precious airs. Would I submit to such a thing from any man in the world? No, indeed. I would see the whole sex annihilated first. That I would. Do not be so dreadfully severe, Mrs. Watson, said Tom, without unclosing his eyes. Allow me to enjoy my last few days of liberty. When I have taken to myself a wife, where will my domestic freedom be? Impudent fellow, said Mrs. Watson, going up and pretending to pat his cheek. He caught her hand and told her in return. She was his prisoner now, and must pay the penalty of the box on the ear, which she had so deliberately bestowed on him. She giggled exceedingly, and he was insisting on his right when Robert entered the room, and said in a cool offhand way, I suppose, Margaret, Musgrove has told you he wants to marry this day three weeks, and as I presume you have no objection, I have resolved to get the settlements in hand immediately. I suppose you have not much to do in the way of preparation, have you? Well, I suppose, as you all come upon me so suddenly, there is nothing for me to do but to submit, said Margaret, and really I see no harm in it. Of course you will have the marriage put in the newspapers. It must be sent to the morning post, Tom. I have no objection, observed the ardent lover. Well then, Jane, I suppose I had better be seeing about my gown and wedding clothes. Will you come with me and help me choose some dresses, Tom? Not I, by Jove. What do I know about dresses, I tell you? It's all women's nonsense, and I will have nothing to do with it. I believe if a woman were dying, her only care would be to secure a handsome shawl, and the idea of a plain funeral would break her heart. Don't be so dreadfully severe, Tom, interposed Mrs. Watson again. You are a naughty, spiteful, ill-tempered satirist, and we must teach you better manners before we have done with you. Beyond a question, you will soon do that, returned he. I already feel wonderfully humbled and penitent from sitting with you for the last hour, and what I shall arrive at after being your brother for a twelvemonth can only be guessed at now. Margaret and Jane soon afterwards set off on the important business of looking for wedding dresses, and purchasing more clothes than she would know what to do with, whilst obliged to wear her deep mourning, a circumstance which was particularly distressing to Margaret, who, whilst anxious to make a very splendid figure in her new establishment, was perpetually checked in her aspirations by the remembrance that she must for many months continue to wear black. It was, however, a great delight to her to think that she should be married almost as soon as Penelope, and before Elizabeth, but since her own good luck was now certain, she felt no particular envy of either of her elder sisters. For, though she could not help seeing that Elizabeth's establishment, house and carriage, would be more expensive and grand than her own, she did not think that she would have given up the independence and idleness of Tom's situation as a gentleman for the large income and luxuries accompanying the brewer's occupation. Emma looked on and wondered at Margaret's state of contentment under the indifference and contemptuous treatment which her lover bestowed on her. She would not have borne it for a single hour, but Margaret seemed to feel nothing of it, and her own foolish and caressingly fond ways were enough to disgust a sensible man altogether. He did not mean to remain more than a couple of days, and during that time Mrs. Watson took care to occupy each evening with a party of young people, a most judicious arrangement which saved an immense deal of unwilling labor and unnecessary love-making. The Morgans, the Millers, and many others joined them, and they had country dances and reels enough to tire many indefatigable dancers. Emma continued to refuse to dance, and as the ladies outnumbered the gentlemen, she was less tempted to break her resolution. In consequence of this, she was, on the second evening, for a good while left quite alone, until Mr. Morgan, declaring himself quite knocked up, took refuge in the corner, where she was sitting and engaged her in an agreeable conversation. They were not discussing anything very remarkable, but Emma was amused and lively when she heard Miss Jenkins say, in reply to something, "'Oh, no doubt Emma Watson finds it quite agreeable to sit out. No great sacrifice there, I fancy. She takes every opportunity of throwing herself in somebody's way.' It was said so loud that there could be no doubt but that it was intended for them to hear, 
and from the quick glance round and the elevation of eyebrows which followed it on his part, it was evident it had not failed of its object. Emma wished she could have stopped the blood which rushed to her face and colored her cheeks so deeply, but she could neither conceal her feelings nor command her voice sufficiently to finish her sentence, for she felt that Mr. Morgan's eyes were fixed on her with a keen, scrutinizing glance, which seemed to read her thoughts in a moment. When Miss Jenkins was out of hearing, he observed very quietly, "'I think, Miss Emma, you have not been brought up in a country town.' "'No, indeed,' said Emma. "'You seem peculiarly unfitted to continue in one, with any comfort or peace of mind,' continued he. "'Indeed, I doubt whether I am to take that as a compliment or the reverse,' replied Emma, smiling a little. "'I never pay compliments,' said he. "'But if you want to know why I think so, learn that I can see you mind being talked about, dislike gossip and scandal, and have no taste for romping or noise. Therefore you are unfitted for a resident in a country town.' "'You are not complimentary to-night, Mr. Morgan. What has put you out of humor with your fellow townswomen?' "'I assure you I feel most amiably disposed towards them all, especially those who by dancing to-night have left me at liberty to converse with you. They are all charming chatterers and delightful dancers, and equally exquisite, enlightened, eloquent, and endearing.' "'Your compliments are rather equivocal, Mr. Morgan. I do not know that I should like such problematic praises. You, you need not be afraid.' i should never think of applying such terms to you did i not begin with observing that you were not brought up in a country town there are some people i have observed said emma thoughtfully who always hold the society in which they happen to move very cheap because they have an unfortunate power of vision which enables them alone to see the weak the ridiculous the faulty side of things thank you do not find fault with my compliments after that speech i never made one more severe i beg your pardon replied she coloring deeply Perhaps it did sound a little harsh. Yes, I am deeply indebted to you for your good opinion. You probably suppose me incapable of appreciating the beautiful and excellent when I meet it, because I am alive to the follies, the littleness, and the absurdities of those amongst whom I am forced to mix. Some day I trust you will judge me better. He understood Emma's character completely. The idea that she had been harsh in her speech, and that he felt hurt by her injustice, was decidedly the most likely thing to produce kindness and conciliatory manners to make it up. He assumed an air and tone of injured innocence, which quite touched her, for straightforward and artless herself, she never suspected he was only acting. She wanted him to speak again, but he was determined to leave it to her to make that effort, and he partly drew back and turned his chair slightly away, as if he had not courage again to address her. She renewed the conversation by inquiring whether he had long been resident in the town. The soft tone of her voice immediately drew him back to his former position, and he began to tell her that he had come to Croydon about fifteen years before, that like herself he had lived in his youth in the country, and the only towns he had previously been acquainted with were Oxford and London. Like yourself too, continued he, I came here frank and open-hearted, ready to place the best construction on anything I saw or heard, and believing that the neighborhood would do as much for me. Experience has taught me a very different lesson, but perhaps nothing but experience will do. With the consciousness of the amount it cost me to buy my knowledge with suffering, I sometimes idly think of saving others by my cautions from a similar expensive feeling, but it is vain, and I do not think I shall make the attempt again. And so, said Emma, after a short pause, you think me ungrateful and self-willed, because I do not like to hear wholesale deprecation of your fellow townspeople. I certainly will be wiser another time and keep my opinion to myself, replied he, still in a proud and injured tone. Well, I do not like to seem ungracious, and if you really wanted to give me advice, your superior age and experience certainly entitle you to form an opinion, and to be listened to with deference. So if you speak for my good, I will attend. But do not be too bitter, or I shall rebel again. I only wish to caution you against the spirit of prying curiosity and foolish censoriousness, which seems indigenous amongst the inhabitants of a small town. And you thought me likely to fall into a similar error, did you? inquired she simply. You, my dear girl, no indeed. But I thought you likely to be the victim to this spirit, unless you took care and were cautioned against it. If I do nothing wrong, said Emma, nothing blameworthy, how can there be any danger that I shall incur censure? I hope I shall not provoke enmity in any way. That will be a vain and elusive hope, replied he earnestly. There is too much about you to provoke ill will, for your conduct to be regarded with a friendly eye. 
Youth and beauty have innumerable enemies in a place like this. Your superior education, your acquaintance, I may say intimacy, with those very much above your present associates in rank, your frank and confiding disposition, all expose you to enmity and envy of the most malignant kind. You will make me quite unhappy, Mr. Morgan, if you talk in that way. I cannot believe that those I see around me are so very wicked, and why should any one try to injure a portionless orphan like myself? Because they are not all possessed of the generous feelings and high principles which form such a charm in that helpless and portionless orphan, and which, when joined to her personal beauty, endow her more richly than the wealthiest of all our townsmen's daughters. I cannot help hoping that your warnings are not more sincere than your compliments, and then I shall have the less to fear, Mr. Morgan, replied Emma, smiling. I wish you would give me credit for sincerity, Miss Watson. It is disheartening to find myself constantly doubted. I shall give you up in despair. Look beautiful and merry, prove yourself lively and amusing, wear becoming bonnets, pretty gowns, and well-made shoes, and you will soon not have a female friend in the town. This must be your prejudice, or you are quizzing me. I cannot believe that bonnets and shoes have anything to do with female friends. You will persist in judging everyone by yourself, and you cannot set up a more erroneous standard. Do you suppose that your wardrobe will be less commented on than your neighbor's? Does Miss Thompson make any one a new bonnet without its being known and abused by all the owner's most intimate friends? But you must be wrong, said Emma. It is impossible that all can be watched over in that way. We do not know a great many people who live here. Even my sister does not. And why should I suppose that I am so conspicuous a personage? The inhabitants of the town, said Mr. Morgan, are divided into many different sets, it is true. They move in different circles, and there is no mixture. But the individuals of each class have their eyes constantly fixed on those above as well as those equal with themselves. The former, that they may imitate their actions, the latter, that they may detect the first symptom of mounting to a higher circle. They have likewise to detect and repress the first encroachment from the ranks beneath them, so that you see each individual has her attention fully occupied in this perpetual watching. You must be exaggerating, Mr. Morgan. I trust you are, at least. Do you want a proof of the jealousy, an exclusive spirit which reigns amongst them? Look into the church. There, where men and women ought, if ever, to meet as equals, what do you see? The aristocratic classes. Those who have their carriages and horses to bring them to their Sunday devotions, who have their comfortable and elegant dwellings out of the town, have likewise their comfortable pews for lounging through their prayers, their cushions, their carpets, their footstools, that they may not be too much fatigued by worship. Their curtains, too, lest the vulgar gaze should distress their modesty, or intrude on their privacy. Then come the townspeople, the higher classes, those in professions, or perhaps in business, on a large scale, like George Miller or the Greens. These have their cushions and carpets, but are forced to forgo the privacy of curtains, for which they make up by the superior brilliancy of their pew linings, and the elegance of the fringe drapery, which hangs down in front of the galleries. Inferior classes are forced to sit on benches without cushions, whilst the poorest of all may enjoy what comfort they can on the hard open seats in the stone aisle. Emma looked thoughtful, but did not answer. "'You must admit the truth of my description,' continued he. "'There is sufficient stuff expended on the galleries of that church to have clothed half the children in the parish school.' "'I am sorry that you should have the power of saying such things, Mr. Morgan, or that I cannot contradict them.' Have you ever made an effort to procure a reform? Reform? No. Do you suppose I should even hint at such plain truths to a native of the town? Do you imagine I impart my opinions on the subject indiscriminately? No, indeed. My popularity, such as it is, would be soon blown away were I to venture to contradict all their dearest prejudices. It is a far better plan to tell Miss Jenkins that she looks like an angel in the sky when sitting in her blue pew, or to hint to old Mrs. Adams that the crimson marine gives quite a juvenile glow to her complexion. In short, said Emma gravely, to encourage people's weaknesses in order to gain their good will. Precisely so. It is the only way to live at peace with all the world, at least the world of Croydon. Why should I risk their repose and mine by voluntarily encountering them on their hobbies? Follow my advice, my dear Miss Watson, and make the best of those you meet with here. They were interrupted by the conclusion of the dance, and Mr. Morgan thought it best to move away. He left Emma thoughtful and dispirited, and as he watched her from a distance, he was quite satisfied with the general expression of her countenance. Her next neighbor was Mr. Alfred Fremantle, who threw himself into the chair Mr. Morgan had vacated, and began a series of inquiries as to who Mr. Tom Musgrove might be and whether it was really true that her sister Margaret was on the point of marriage with him. 
Emma soon grew tired of his bald, disjointed chat and moved away. She was met by Mrs. Turner. "'My dear child,' cried she, catching hold of both her arms, "'I have been wanting to speak to you this age, but I would not interrupt you whilst you were talking to that pleasant man, Mr. Morgan. Yes, what a nice man he is, ain't he, dear? Now I did not mean to make you blush, but take care. Don't flirt with him too much, because it may mean nothing, you know. There's no saying. But I wanted to tell you how excessively I am delighted with your sister, and how glad I am that she is to marry George. Poor girl, I dare say she is glad of it, too. Young women like to be married. But then I don't know where you could find a nicer young woman than Elizabeth, or one that would suit my son better. Now I don't mean that as any reflection upon you, my dear, on the contrary, so never mind what I say. I assure you, madam, that what you say of my sister gives me sincere pleasure, and I could not, I hope, be so unreasonable as to expect you to regard us in the same light. It is a great happiness when the friends on each side are equally satisfied with any projected marriage. Very true, my dear. I agree with what you say. Yes, Elizabeth is a charming girl, and much better suited to my son-in-law than you would be, perhaps, so we ought to be satisfied on all sides, as you say. I am certain she will make a most excellent wife, replied Emma warmly. And who do you mean to marry, my dear? Suppose you were to tell me now, I would promise not to tell anyone. I have not made up my mind yet, said Emma, laughing a little, but I will let you know as soon as I can. Don't try for Mr. Morgan, my dear. He will only disappoint you. Do not trust him too far. You had better not. Mr. Morgan, my dear madam, repeated Emma, almost laughing outright. Why, he is quite an old man, old enough to be my father, I am sure. No, no, I will lay no snares for Mr. Morgan. I am sure if I did, the ladies of Croydon would never forgive me. I dare say not, but indeed I do not think he deserves you, my dear. I know things of him which I will not tell you, but don't let him make you in love with him. Emma only smiled at this warning and the breaking up of the party at the moment prevented her hearing more on the subject from Mrs. Turner. Tom Musgrove did not stay longer than he had originally proposed, but the next time he came everything was to be ready for the wedding, and Margaret was in such high spirits at the prospect as plainly showed that she had quite forgotten the unpleasant difficulties which had previously interfered with his happy consummation. End of Volume 3, Chapter 1 Recording by Philip Erickson, Okemos, Michigan Volume 3, Chapter 2 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vinay Mala. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubbock. Volume 3, Chapter 2. Emma had often wondered that she had heard no more from Lady Fanny Alastair. She knew she had been ill, but did not apprehend that her illness was of so serious a nature as necessarily to cause this long delay. But she was at length surprised one day by receiving from her ladyship's housekeeper an abrupt and rather uncivil note completely breaking off the negotiation. There was something in the tone of the announcement which hurt her exceedingly, and she was in a very uncomfortable frame of mind when she walked out that afternoon with Janetta, for she had lately resumed this custom. She took her little charge into some meadows to look for primroses and violets on the sunny banks, and whilst the child was busy plucking all she could find, Emma herself sat on the stump of a tree to try and discover the meaning of this communication. She had nothing, however, to guide her conjectures. There was no clue in the note, and she was forced to remain satisfied with the conclusion that her ladyship was capricious and had changed her mind. Whilst occupied in considering this subject, she was startled by footsteps and she looked up with a sort of fearful expectation that she should see Mr. Morgan. It was not, however, the doctor who presented himself, but Mr. Bridge, the clergyman, whom she had formerly met at the Millers. He took off his hat with a very respectful bow and addressed her with an air of politeness and courtesy which pleased her exceedingly. 
After a slight remark on the bright day and the beauty of the scenery, he passed on a few steps, and Emma supposed he was going to leave her. Suddenly, however, he seemed to change his mind and surprised her by returning to her side. He inquired if she was intending to sit there long, as he feared it must be damp and unsafe. I do not perceive any damp, sir, replied she, and it is so pleasant, I am unwilling to think it can be dangerous. That is not a rule, he replied, smiling a little, and then gravely shaking his head, Many things extremely agreeable are invisibly surrounded with risks and dangers. It is a commonplace remark, I acknowledge, but one which is as constantly forgotten as it is frequently enforced. Young people like yourself are particularly apt to slight it. But if you would bear with an old man, he paused and regarded her with a look of interest which she noticed and finding he hesitated, she ventured to say with warmth and earnestness, Pray go on, sir. If you think me in need of caution, I will listen with the attention and reverence which is every way your due. I have been interested for you, my dear young lady, not only by your own sweet and ingenious countenance, your misfortunes and your unprotected situation, but by the representations of my young friend Annie Miller, and I feel that whilst you reside under my pastoral care, I should not be doing my duty were I not to exert myself to save you from inconveniences which you may perhaps be very innocently entailing on yourself. Emma coloured and felt quite astonished at this address, the purport of which she could not guess. But after a moment's hesitation, she begged Mr. Bridge to proceed without ceremony. If he had any censor to bestow on her, she would listen and feel obliged. It is not censor. It is only a caution I wish to give you. I mean with regard to your intimacy with Mr. Morgan. You probably do not know his character. Nor is it necessary that you should learn minute particulars. I am sure it will be enough for you to hear that he is not a safe companion for a young woman of your age and appearance. I think you must be under some misapprehension, replied Emma, surprised. There is nothing between us which can warrant the appellation of intimacy. He visits my sister-in-law and as her visitor only I have known him. I had hoped, replied Mr. Bridge gravely, to have met with more candor from you. I am under a very great mistake if you have not on several occasions met him when walking only with that little girl and allowed him to walk with you for a long time. Is it not so? That is perfectly true. But the meetings were quite accidental, said Emma. So far as you were concerned, I can believe it. But the world will only know that you were seen walking tete a tete with a man of known bad principles and immoral conduct. And more than that, he has been found with you in the drawing room alone, and you have passed many hours in his company when visiting in other houses. I was not aware, said Emma, perfectly astonished at the charge, that my actions could have thus been the subject of comment and inspection. But what you say, though perfectly true in itself, is capable of a very different interpretation. Will you listen to my defence? Certainly, my dear child, replied he, pleased at the frank and respectful manner with which she addressed him. I met Mr. Morgan at Mr. Miller's, and there I saw him received into the society of respectable women. He visited at my sister-in-law's house and was evidently in her confidence. He proposed to her to procure me a situation as governess to Lady Fanny Elliston's little girl, and my brother perfectly approved of the negotiation. It was the interest he took in this plan 
which produced the appearance of intimacy which you reprobate it was to discuss this subject that he joined me in my walks but as i did not like the appearance of clandestine intercourse i mentioned the occurrence to my brother and sister in law and to avoid him i refused for some time to walk out without some other companion than my niece lately i have seen less of him and it is a fortnight or more since we last met out walking had i known him to be a man of bad principles as you say he is i would never have allowed him to interfere in my affairs but how could i suspect that when i found mrs watson treated him with perfect confidence and he was evidently courted and caressed by nearly all the women of my acquaintance in croydon those who know him best have most reason to say it is unsafe for you to associate with him they know of what he is capable and are most shocked of course at your breach of conventional etiquette i am sorry to say that you are right in your assertion that he is courted and caressed by women in general in spite of his character his manners make him popular and many weak minded women encourage him in conduct which flatters their vanity by demonstrating admiration for their mental and personal charms but those who act thus are severe judges of others but tell me are you really going to lady fanny elston's on his recommendation no her ladyship has suddenly and not very civilly broken off the negotiation i am glad of it my dear it would have been very undesirable that you should go there throwing yourself completely in the way of that man it must have been his object poor girl anything would be better than that emma was silent and thoughtful if you have any resolution and strength of mind continued he i advise you by every means to shun the neighborhood of this dangerous man the struggle may be painful but depend upon it it will be less so by far than the consequences of indulging in your predilection for him i do not think that the danger you apprehend for me really exists replied emma looking up suddenly he shook his head the young are always confident said he but if you build your hopes on any degree of affection which morgan may have manifested believe me you are building on a quick sand and you will as surely find yourself deceived as his other victims you quite misunderstand me replied emma very earnestly i would not dare to boast myself more infallible than other young women but i do not think i shall be put to the proof i never had an idea for a moment that mr morgan entertained towards me any other than such friendly feelings as you do yourself it seemed to me very kind in him to interest himself for an orphan but it was a kindness which his age appeared to warrant for though not quite so old as yourself sir he is old enough to be my father and i fancied it was with something of a paternal feeling that he regarded me as to my own sentiments towards him i certainly felt grateful at first but lately there has been i own once or twice a something in his manner which made me suspicious of his principles and induced me to shun private intercourse with him do i speak in a way to convince you of candor or do you mistrust my confession and doubt my word i think i will venture to trust you but i must still repeat my warning take care of yourself and do not allow him to hurt your reputation you have enemies in croydon my dear i sir how is that possible and yet mr morgan hinted the same to me there for once he spoke truth whatever may have been his motive but you are watched whether from simple curiosity malice or envy your movements have been traced and are spitefully commented on 
It was in that way that I heard of your walks with him. And meeting you here, I could not resist warning you. I rather wonder we have seen nothing of him, for I saw him following me as I took this path. Perhaps he is waiting till I leave you. Would it be too much trouble for you to see me safe home? said Emma anxiously. I should be so very much obliged if you would. Mr. Bridge readily assented, and calling Janetta, they turned towards the town. At one of the stiles, they met the individual in question. He had apparently been watching them, but though perhaps disappointed at the result of their conference, he came forward with a bow and a smile, the most insinuating to hand Emma over it. Mr. Bridge observed gaily that he feared he was grown too old for gallantry and he must not wonder if such agreeable offices were taken out of his hands by men younger and more alert. The hand which Mr. Morgan held, he seemed unwilling to relinquish, but drew it under his arm with an appearance of considering it his right to support and guide her. At another time, she might hardly have noticed this, but with Mr. Bridges' warnings ringing in her ears, she could not permit it to continue. Resolutely, she drew away her hand and turned towards the stile to inquire whether the elder gentleman required any assistance. Mr. Morgan fixed his piercing eyes on her with an inquiring look, as if to demand why his attentions were thus repulsed. But he could not catch her eye, and he was forced to content himself with walking quietly by her side. I want particularly to speak to you, Miss Watson, said he presently in a low tone, as if wishing to avoid her companion's notice. I am quite at liberty to listen to you, replied Emma, turning towards him. It is on your own affairs, said he, as if hesitating and glancing towards Mr. Bridge. I do not know how far it might be pleasant for you to have a third person conversant with them. If it relates to the business with Lady Fanny, answered Emma aloud, I have just been talking the matter over with Mr. Bridge, and he can therefore quite enter into the subject now. It does relate to that affair, and I am sorry, exceedingly sorry, that I should be the means of occasioning you any disappointment. But I fear your hopes, I might say, our hopes in that quarter are all overthrown. I am aware of that, Mr. Morgan, said Emma calmly. I received a note to that effect this morning, and your intelligence, therefore, is no shock to me. I feel much obliged for the zeal you have shown in my favour, but on the whole, I am as well satisfied that things should be as they are. Satisfied? cried he, looking at her. You cannot really mean that. The loss of such a prospect may be nothing to you, but the reason? That is the evil. I had no reason assigned me, replied Emma, and only concluded that her ladyship had changed her mind, which of course she had full right to do. Mr. Morgan looked at her with an air as if he would penetrate her brain. I am so sorry, said he presently, so very sorry that I have been the means of leading you into this very unpleasant situation. But for me, you would never have met this repulse. I am vexed indeed. Do not take it so much to heart, replied Emma more gaily than she felt. For after all, it is only what any young woman in my situation might expect. A few repulses will serve to teach me humility. Eh, if you needed the lesson, but the reason is so very, he stopped abruptly. What is the reason? asked Emma. I told you I knew of none. If you really do not, you had better not force me to say it, though you cannot for a moment imagine that I believe there is a word of truth in Lady Fanny's assertion. She must have been so completely misinformed. I really should be obliged to you to be explicit, replied Emma, earnestly. You admit that you know the reasons. I must insist on knowing them likewise. I am unwilling to pain you, my dear Miss Emma, 
then you should not have alluded to them at all. You cannot wonder if I now consider myself entitled to learn what these mysterious reasons are. He drew out his pocketbook and took thence a note, which he placed in her hand, saying, If it offends or affronts you, do not blame me for it. Emma opened and read a short note from Lady Fanny to Mr. Morgan, stating that having heard various very discreditable reports concerning the young person he had named to her, she must beg to decline all further intercourse with her. Emma's cheeks glowed as she read the lines in question, but she said not a word. Quietly she refolded the note and returned it to Mr. Morgan. He was eagerly watching her, and as he took it from her hand, he detained her fingers one moment and stooping whispered, You cannot think how grieved I am thus to pain you. It is quite as well that I should know it, she replied very calmly and then a silence of some minutes ensued. They had reached the garden gate before anyone spoke again. She turned to Mr. Bridge before entering, and whilst holding out her hand to him, said in a low voice, I am very much obliged to you. May I have a little further conversation with you another day? Certainly, whenever you wish. When can I see you? I should like to see you alone, she replied. Then I will manage it. Depend on me tomorrow. He then warmly shook hands, patted Janita's shoulder and walked off, concluding that Mr. Morgan would do so too. But there he was mistaken. That gentleman, having no intention of retiring so quickly, he had opened the gate for Emma and stood leaning against it, till she returned and prepared to pass. But then he laid his hand on her arm and whilst closing the gate upon them both, attempted to draw her a little on one side where a thick screen of filberts concealed them from the house. Come here, my dear girl, said he in a tone of familiarity which affronted Emma. I thought that old humbug was never going to leave us. It's so too bad to be beset in that way. Have you anything to say to me, Mr. Morgan? replied Emma in a freezing tone. Because I must beg, if you have no particular reason, that you will not detain me here. I beg your pardon. I quite forgot, returned he in a very different tone. I am taking a liberty which nothing but my interest in you can excuse. He then withdrew his hand from her arm, but still stood in her path. The fact is, my indignation at the slanderous tongues of our neighbours made me quite forget everything else. Do you know the meaning of that note I showed you, the nature of the reports and their originator? I know simply what I read there, returned Emma, and unless the subject is one of immediate importance, I must decline to discuss now and here the cause of Lady Fanny's determination. Well, perhaps you are right, but I hardly expected that my warnings to you the other night would so soon be realized. They have not scrupled to make mischief of our meeting when out walking and the report has reached Lady Fanny's ears. If that is the case, Mr. Morgan, replied Emma, her face flushing with indignation and her voice almost uncontrollably trembling for emotion. If you know that to be the case, I wonder that kindness, courtesy, nay, the common feeling of a gentleman, do not prompt you to avoid giving countenance to such reports by forcing yourself on my privacy and intruding even here on my home. I command you to let me pass this instant, and I desire that I may not again be disturbed by a similar encounter. He did not dare dispute her command for a moment, as she stood with her slight and graceful figure drawn up, and her speaking face turned on him in indignation. He drew aside, and with a very low bow allowed her to pass and follow Janita, who had trotted up towards the house. He looked after her in an attitude of despair, but it was lost on Emma, who never turned her head or cast one relenting glance behind but walked straight into the house. In fact, she felt very angry and her anger increased the more she thought of what had passed. 
it seemed to her as if he sought to place her in equivocal situations and rather wished that she might compromise her reputation compared with the kindness of mr bridge his professed friendship and zeal appeared hollow and unsatisfactory and now that she found she had another friend she looked her difficulties more firmly in the face and determined not to endeavor to escape from one set of evils by risking another still when she thought of the words of mr bridge so sadly corroborated by mr morgan himself she could not help a sigh and a shudder she wished to ask his advice as to what she had better do but at the same time she tried to form an opinion for herself and questioned her own mind as to what was her duty on this occasion to avoid all intercourse with mr morgan and let the slanders die a natural death from want of food to sustain them appeared to her the safest course and she hoped mr bridge would agree with her she would gladly have left the place had it been possible but just at present there seemed no chance of an escape when the time of her promised visit to osborne castle arrived what a happiness it would be she lay awake many hours that night thinking over all the difficulties in her path and planning how she could surmount them one idea weighed most strongly in her mind it was would mr howard be at all likely to hear any report concerning her and would he believe it if he did she wished she could imagine he would hear of her at all only from miss osborne had she received any news of his proceedings and she feared that their intercourse was brought to an end forever how she might have viewed mr morgan and his attentions but for her previous acquaintance with mr howard she could not tell but she mentally compared the two men now not a little to the disadvantage of the former and she felt persuaded that she could never care for another unless she were to meet with one who possessed all the good qualities of mr howard and was better acquainted with his own mind for totally in the dark as to the reason why mr howard had suddenly withdrawn his attentions and recollecting well the many little signs which had escaped him of a more than ordinary interest she only concluded that he had on further acquaintance found her different from what he wished and that he had changed his mind and views accordingly she little knew that at this time he was suffering from a constant unceasing regret and dwelling on their past intercourse as the most precious and delightful period of his life it was with a heavy head and a heavier heart that she went through her daily routine the next morning hearing janetta her alphabet setting her sewing and reading to her she had great difficulty in getting through with it and could hardly fix her thoughts for 5 minutes on the business on which she was employed in the course of the morning janetta was sent for to the drawing room and returned in about 10 minutes radiant with joy emma who had lain down on the bed for a few minutes and was just closing her weary eyes in a doze was suddenly roused by the news that mr bridge had come to ask janetta to go to see his garden and that he was now waiting for them to accompany him home mindful of his promise he had called on mrs watson and after observing that he had met her little girl gathering flowers he begged she might come and see some of the beautiful violets and anemones in his garden mrs watson delighted at the civility to herself which she discovered in any attention to her child assented most readily and emma had now to rouse herself as well as she could to accompany her young charge she felt so totally unequal to any exertion that even her sense of the kindness manifested by mr bridge and the interest he showed in her was hardly sufficient to produce the energy requisite for the occasion her languid movements and the heavy eyelids immediately caught the attention of the kind old man but sensible how little sympathy her sufferings would probably excite in the mind of her selfish 
sister-in-law, he made no comment until they were not only out of the house, but safely hidden amidst the picturesque shrubberies which enclosed the parsonage. Then kindly taking her hand and looking half smiling, half sadly in her face, he said, I am afraid, poor girl, you have been fretting about what you learned yesterday and that you feel it more deeply than you expected to do. I have been thinking a great deal about it, I allow, replied Emma, and more about what Mr. Morgan said yesterday after you left me. But surely you cannot be surprised at my dejection when you consider the various difficulties which present themselves in my path. I cannot help a small suspicion, replied he, with a sort of cunning little smile, but which he speedily checked, that you feel some regret about Mr. Morgan himself. No, you do me injustice, but on such a subject, professions are perfectly useless, and I shall not attempt to make them. To break off my intercourse with him will cost me nothing. But what does really depress and annoy me is the terrible idea that any slanderous reports should have been circulated concerning that intercourse. He told me the story had reached Lady Fanny Elliston and that it was for that reason she had so abruptly concluded all negotiation with me. Very likely, her ladyship is the greatest gossip in existence and has a regular supply of the town news and scandal extracted from the butcher and baker by her own maid for her own private amusement. But if the story has travelled so far, how much farther may it not spread? I shall lose my character altogether, and with it all chance of earning an independent livelihood. And what will become of me? Her lip quivered, tears burst from her eyes, and her whole frame was visibly agitated to such a degree that Mr. Bridge feared a fit of hysterics would ensue. Emma, however, made a determined effort to conquer her emotion, and after two or three minutes succeeded so far as to resume an air of calmness, though it was some time before she could speak again. My dear girl, said the clergyman compassionately, you must not give way to despondency. Remember from whence your trials come, and you will become calmer and stronger in the contemplation. You do not seem to me at all to blame in what has passed. And whilst your conscience is clear, you need never despair that your path will be made clear likewise. It is not only the present difficulty which weighs on my mind at this moment, replied Emma, trying to speak calmly, but there are times when all I have lost comes back to my memory and seems quite to overpower me. My earliest friends lost to me, and with them the happy home where I had enjoyed every indulgence and every pleasure that affection could procure. Then just as I began to accustom myself to my new home and learn to value the affection and society of my only parent, that likewise is torn from me. And whilst I am deprived of parent and fortune and become dependent on my own exertions, I find myself robbed. I know not how, even of my good name, and my prospects blighted in the most mysterious manner. It seems in vain to struggle against such a complication of evils. What can I expect but to sink into contempt and disgrace? I admit the greatness of the losses you have sustained, said he. I cannot deny that it may be hard to bear, but you have still some blessings left for which you may be thankful. You possess a healthy constitution, a sound intellect, and a conscience unoppressed by a sense of guilt. You might have lost your heart as well as your fortune, and that, you tell me, is not the case. Emma looked down and tried to appear quite careless and unconcerned, but she could not feel quite convinced that she did enjoy the degree of heart's ease which Mr. Bridge seemed to imagine. An image of Mr. Howard flitted across her mind, and she felt that whilst enumerating her peculiar afflictions, she had omitted one which pressed almost as deeply as any. She blushed deeply, and could not raise her eyes. He watched her countenance, and then added presently, 
What do you mean to do now? Have you formed any plan? None at all, replied she. I feel I cannot. My head is all in confusion and I can hardly think connectedly. She pressed her hand on her forehead as she spoke. He saw she was looking extremely ill and feared her mind was overexcited. My first wish, she continued, the first object of my life would be to get away from Croydon, to see no more of those who slander me or him who causes the slander to circulate. But this I cannot do, whilst I have no other refuge and whilst Margaret's marriage is approaching, I suppose I must not go. But if I could but leave them all and have a little peace and quiet, it is sometimes more than I can bear. The perpetual worry and the incessant anxiety to please without success and those thoughts that will come back in spite of all that I can do. Thoughts of regret for past happiness and hopeless pining for what I may never see again. And you are quite sincere in wishing to leave Croydon and go where you will see no more of Mr. Morgan? Is it no momentary peak that influences you? No hope of being followed? No expectation of producing some great effect by your disappearance? I wish I could convince you, Mr. Bridge that whatever the word of Croydon may impute to me, whatever it may choose to say for me, Mr. Morgan was never an object of any peculiar interest in my eyes. And since they have associated our names to my discredit, he has become positively disagreeable. To shun him altogether is just now my first wish. Then perhaps I may help you there. I will at least try. Your desolate situation interests me deeply. Poor girl, you look terribly worn and flushed. Go home and lie down to rest and try to compose your mind and hope for better things. But above all, my child, endeavor to subdue a repining spirit and remember there is one above who is the father of the fatherless and who has promised never to forsake those who call upon him faithfully. End of chapter 2volume 3 chapter 3 of the younger sister this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by vinaymala the younger sister by catherine ann hubbuck volume 3 chapter 3 emma took janetta home and weary and worn out she laid herself down upon her own bed and there dropped into a heavy slumber. In consequence of her non-appearance at the dinner table, Elizabeth went in search of her and rousing her up persuaded her to attempt coming downstairs, though Emma at first felt so totally unequal to the exertion that she declared she could not stir. Jane is so very cross today, remonstrated Elizabeth. I am sure I do not know what is the matter with her, but she seems so very angry about something or other, that if you can contrive to come down, you will save a great deal of after trouble. Is your head really so very bad? You do look rather ill certainly, but you need not eat, only just try to sit at table. Slowly and languidly, Emma rose from her bed her head ached so intensely that she could scarcely raise her eyes. An iron band appeared to be compressing her forehead and seemed every moment to increase in pressure. She tried to arrange her hair and her dress, disordered by lying on the bed, but felt incapable of the exertion. Leaning on Elizabeth's arm, she descended to the dining parlour and took her seat at the table. Robert offered to help her to some meat, but Emma declined eating. Jane never condescended to lift her eyes until the table was cleared. And then she sarcastically observed, I am extremely sorry, Miss Emma Watson, that there is nothing on my table good enough for you to eat today. Shall I send over the pastry cooks 
and see if he has any little delicacies to tempt your fastidious appetite i am not so unreasonable as to expect a young lady like you to dine on roast mutton and plain pudding i am not very well replied emma and have no appetite today but it is my own misfortune not the fault of your dinner i am sure upon my word you honor my table with a very pretty costume i am a fixly may i ask how long it has been your fashion to have your hair awry in that way and your gown tumbled do you come out of your bed or have you been indulging in an interesting game of romps robert looked at emma and even he was struck with the appearance of suffering and coupling with it the fact that she had eaten no dinner and moreover feeling rather cross with his wife he began to defend her desiring jane not to worry his sister as it was evident she was very far from well mrs watson fired up at this she wondered what people could mean speaking to ladies that way she was sure they must quite forget who they were addressing as to what she said to emma she wondered what she should be forbidden to say next really it was too good if she might not find fault with a girl like emma in her own house and her own table too she supposed the next thing she should hear would be that emma sat there to find fault with her her manners her dress her general behavior would be called into question if emma gave her approbation no doubt she should be right she only hoped she should not be obliged to adopt the elegant negligence of miss emma watson's present style it was not to her taste and she was afraid she must confess emma has really a very bad headache interposed elizabeth and would be much better in bed then pray let her go to bed cried jane tossing her head who wants her to sit up not i i am sure she may go to bed if she likes but if she thinks i am going to call in a doctor for her she is very much mistaken i will indulge no some whims and fancies emma gladly availed herself of the permission to retire thus graciously accorded and elizabeth accompanied her upstairs and assisted her to undress neither would she leave her until summoned down to tea even then the temptation of mr miller coming in could not detain her from emma's room she told him how ill her sister was and she returned to sit by her bedside and attempt by cool applications to allay the burning throbbing pain in her head which emma complained almost drove her mad but she showed no symptoms of amendment and towards morning she was in a decided fever elizabeth who had sat up with her all night now pressed her to consent to see mr morgan the name made her shudder and she resolutely refused to do so she declared she was not very ill nothing more than her sister's skill could alleviate but that to see mr morgan would infallibly make her worse elizabeth thought this rather odd but she let her have her own way and said no more about the doctor mrs watson began to be frightened when she found that emma was really very ill she too then proposed her seeing the doctor but with more moderation though with equal firmness emma rejected her proposal as she had done that of elizabeth she only wished to see mr bridge but she had not energy or courage to request an interview with him she lay in a kind of half dreamy state during the greater part of that day and the next then elizabeth thought her worse and without asking her any more on the subject she went to robert and with tears in her eyes entreated that some advice might be sent for as otherwise she felt sure emma would die this startled robert it would have been so exceedingly unpleasant it would have interfered sadly with margaret's marriage and in several other ways would have greatly an inconvenienced himself accordingly he decided at once that mr morgan should be called in and so he was emma was in too profound a state of stupor to notice him or to be aware of what was passing beside her bed she did wake a little at the sound of voices but she could not guess whose they were 
they seem to her even a great way off though in reality close to her he might hold her hand now she could not withdraw it nay when he put back the dark hair from her brow and laid his hand on her temples to count the throbbing of the pulse there she made no resistance now she was unconscious of his touch he was not alarmed about her though he saw she was really ill too ill for him to flatter his vanity with the idea that it was affected for the sake of seeing him but he felt sure she would recover and greatly consoled elizabeth by his lively hopes on this subject nevertheless he came to see her twice that evening and early again the next morning on neither visit did he find her sufficiently conscious to recognize him but she gradually began to amend and on waking from a prolonged slumber on the afternoon of the third day she was sufficiently restored to the use of her faculties to inquire of elizabeth whether any one had been attending her during the intervening time her sister without circumlocution told her how often mr morgan had seen her and added that he was to come again that evening emma appeared excessively discomposed and asked her if she could not prevent his coming persisting that she did not want to see any doctor and that if she were only left alone she should soon be well miss watson who considered this merely as a fancy belonging to her state of disease tried to avoid giving her a direct answer and when she found this would not satisfy her she endeavored to persuade emma of the unreasonable nature of her request and ended by saying she would see what could be done for her of course mr morgan came at the time appointed and she was obliged to bear it though the very sight of him threw her into such a state of agitation that his feeling her pulse was perfectly useless and only served to mislead him he had however too much penetration not to discover quickly that his presence caused the feverish symptoms which at first alarmed him he would gladly have persuaded himself that they indicated partiality but not even his vanity could so far mislead him the averted eye the constrained voice the cold composed look which wore the expression of her real feelings told him a very different tale he felt that he had lost ground in her good opinion though he could not exactly tell why or how and still less did he know how to recover it his visit was short and his conversation confined entirely to professional subjects and he took his leave of her with a bow which was intended to express a profound mixture of admiration and respect towards her mingled with regret self reproach humility and penitence on his part if any bow could have conveyed so much meaning it would certainly have been his and it did undoubtedly express the utmost that a bow could do emma drew a long breath when he was gone and whispered i wish he would never come again elizabeth tried seriously to convince her that she was exceedingly unjust and pressed her to name any fault she could find with mr morgan of her own knowledge not speaking merely from hearsay emma's nerves were not in a state to bear argument and instead of answering she began to cry and went off in a fit of hysterics which elizabeth had great difficulty in soothing away the next morning emma requested elizabeth to procure her a visit from mr bridge she could not rest longer without an interview and she now felt strong enough to make her wishes known she would not allow any reference to be made to jane but sent a request in her own name that he would call on her and when this request was complied with as it speedily was she sent elizabeth out of the room that she might have unreserved conversation with her old friend her first question to him was whether he had as yet done anything towards procuring her removal from croydon he believed that she must recover her health before anything could be done with that view but she so earnestly assured him that she should regain strength with twice the rapidity if he would only let her know what he proposed to do 
that he told her to set her mind at ease as he had already arranged a plan for her comfort. He had a sister, a single lady, residing about 14 miles from Croydon, and if she liked to go and pass a few weeks with her, she would be sure of retirement and tranquility with every comfort that could be desired. Emma was delighted with the idea. She was certain she should like Miss Bridge, and that nothing could be more agreeable than residing in the country, quite retired and with only one pleasant companion. There she should continue, she trusted, until Miss Osborne renewed her solicitations for her society, and even after that visit was paid, she might return there. She pictured to herself how she would engage in a thousand useful and agreeable occupations, and how she would love the charming old lady on whom she would attend with unremitting zeal. She declared that she felt herself increasing every moment in strength by the contemplation of such a residence, and she trusted that she should soon be out of sight and sound of Mr. Morgan and all the inquisitorial residents of Croydon. How soon should she be able to go? This Mr. Bridge told her depended entirely on the state of her health. As soon as she could be moved with safety, he would take her in his own carriage half of the way, where his sister would meet her and convey her the other half. Oh, let it be tomorrow, cried she. I am sure I shall be well enough. My strength is greater than you think. Well, well, we will ask the doctor, replied he. Do not ask Mr. Morgan anything about it, said Emma, flushing again deeply. I do not want to have anything to do with him that I can help. I believe it was one thing that made me ill, because they would have him to visit me. Come, be reasonable, said he, smiling. If you talk in that way, I shall think you light-headed. Now I must leave you. I will see you again tomorrow morning, and if I find you well enough, will send word to my sister at once and settle your plans. He took leave and was quitting the room when he met Elizabeth returning, and Emma, anxious that her sister should immediately participate in her pleasant prospects, begged him if he could spare a few minutes more to stop and explain their plans. Miss Watson, of course, was very much pleased at hearing what he had to tell and immediately saw all the advantages to Emma which such a removal would procure, except the one principal one, which was the secret source of her sister's eagerness to put it in execution. But she had never heard a syllable of the reports which had been so industriously circulated relative to Emma and Mr. Morgan, and was very far from hatred, influence her feelings or proceedings. She admitted that it was in every way desirable that Emma should have a peaceful and comfortable home, and the only thing she stipulated for was that she should return to Croydon as soon as she herself could offer her an equally comfortable abode in her own house. This point Emma did not feel disposed to dispute, though she secretly entered a protest against returning to Croydon for a residence if she could in any way avoid it. She proved herself right in her anticipations that the relief to her mind would be of essential service to her body. She was so very much better the next morning as to be able to leave her bedroom and sit up some time in Janetta's nursery, and here she was with her little niece standing beside her and no one else in the room when Mr. Morgan was suddenly ushered in. She received him with a calm self-possession which astonished herself and at the same time a degree of frigid composure which seemed to imply that the past, both of good and evil, was swept from her mind, that she had to begin again in her acquaintance with him and meant only to recognize him in future as the doctor and not the friend. It was in vain that he sat beside her and in his most winning tones tried to establish confidence between them. She was perfectly calm and composed, but impenetrably grave, yielding to neither tenderness nor gaiety, and he was just rising to go when she made her first suggestive observation by telling him that she was so much better she should be able to take a drive tomorrow. 
he assented of course if the weather was favourable and added that as her sister had no carriage he hoped he might be allowed to take her out in his with sincere pleasure at being able to decline it emma thanked him assuring him it was quite unnecessary as mr bridge had promised her his he looked disappointed he could not bear that she should have any friends but himself what would he have felt had he known the real object of the drive in question his departure which emma had thought most unnecessarily delayed left her at liberty to think about mr bridge's promised visit she had longed to wait he came delighted to see her better and quite willing to acknowledge that she might be removed the next day the necessary arrangements he undertook to make he could send his sister word that she might expect them and he determined to drive over the whole way himself and spend one night at her house he likewise agreed to go and inform her own brother and his wife of what was about to take place and thereby save emma all excitement if the information should happen to be ill received accordingly in pursuance of this plan he paid mrs watson a visit before leaving the house and in answer to his gentle tap at the door received an invitation to enter which brought him into an extremely untidy and heated parlour jane was sitting over the fire with her feet on the fender her gown turned up over her knees and her petticoat emitting a strong smell of scorching which almost overpowered him she was reading a work of some kind which she hid behind her when she saw her visitor whilst she tried to arrange her hair and cap in a rather less slatternly way margaret was busy trimming a hat with white satin ribbons and judging from the shreds of white materials of diverse kinds lying beside her had been deeply engrossed in the dressmaking or millinery line after sitting a few minutes mr bridge inquired if he could see mr watson and though his wife was quite certain it was impossible it so happened that robert entered at that very time i am so glad to see you said mr bridge on shaking hands with him i wanted to get your leave to carry off your youngest sister what emma said robert why she is ill i understand she is better today replied he but she wants change of air and scene and i want to get it for her why what new fancy of hers is this exclaimed mrs watson that girl's head is always full of some strange vagary or another it's only the other day she would not walk out and now she is wanting to go away and she keeping her bed and pretending to be ill where do you want to take her to inquired robert unheeding his wife's speech why my sister wishes for a companion and i think they would suit each other very well and it really appears to me that she feels the confinement and application necessary in her present mode of life too much for her my dear mr bridge cried mrs watson in a fawning tone don't you please believe that she is a prisoner or acting under compulsion i am sure you would have too much regard for me to go and set such a story about only think what my feelings would be were such a story circulated about my dear husband's sister i did not mean to say anything to hurt your feelings mrs watson replied the clergyman coolly but you cannot deny that your sister-in-law has been ill and that at present she is incapable of continuing her labours as governess to your little girl i do not exaggerate in that statement oh dear no but she never had any great labours to go through nothing i am sure but what any one might accomplish i am of opinion she has exerted herself too much in every way and as my sister's house will be very quiet and they are persuaded they shall suit each other i really think the best thing she can do will be to go there i don't see that at all replied jane rather snappishly i cannot spare her i want her to take charge of janetta what am i to do without her i understood her services in that way were very trifling interposed mr bridge just her teaching may be said she retracting a little but then she is accustomed to take care of her all day long and i cannot spare her from that 
Not unless you find a substitute, said he. But I cannot do that. I do not like to leave her entirely to servants. And unless I mind the child myself, what can I do? And I suppose no one would expect me to become a slave to my little girl and shut myself up in a nursery. Then why exact it of her, suggested Mr. Bridge. Because whilst she is living at my husband's expense, I think it only fair that I should profit from her cares in that way. And I consider it always a charity to give young people something to do. That may be very true whilst she is here perhaps. But it seems to me a little unreasonable, begging your pardon for saying so, to keep her against her will and then make her work to cover the expense of staying. I am sure I don't know why you should find fault. I have not time to teach my child myself if I had the health for such an exertion. You never seem to have either time or inclination to do anything, Jane, said the husband. Look at this room. Was there ever such an untidy pigsty for a lady to live in? Why cannot you take a little trouble and make it look decent? You had better arrange it after your own fashion, said she scornfully, if you do not like mine. As to this plan of yours, Mr. Bridge, continued Robert, I think it a capital one, and sooner you can take her away, the better. When do you mean to go? Mrs. Watson was silenced altogether. And Mr. Bridge proceeded to explain the plan of their proceedings as proposed by himself. Robert highly approved of it all and gave his full consent and approbation to Mr. Bridge with the more jest because it appeared to annoy his wife. After this, it was of course vain for her to make objections. He was completely master of his own house and Jane knew from sad experience that she might produce as much effect by talking to the tables and chairs as to him when in one of his stubborn fits. All she could do, therefore, was to be as cross as possible for the rest of the day to those around her, in consequence of which she was left to a tete -a tete with Margaret as Elizabeth was upstairs making preparations for Emma's departure and Robert went out to spend the evening with some bachelor friends. End of chapter 3volume 3 chapter 4 of the younger sister this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by vinay mala the younger sister by catherine ann hubbuck volume 3 chapter 4 Punctually the next day, Mr. Bridge drove to the door and at the same moment, Mr. Morgan entered the house. Emma was in the parlour, quite ready for her journey and her eyes sparkled with pleasure as she told him that she should not trouble him to call on her again for she was leaving Croydon for a long time. He looked aghast. Going away was his exclamation as he cast an inquiring eye at the trunk which Mr. Bridges' man was preparing to place on the carriage. This is quite unexpected. May I ask where you are going? It is Mr. Bridge who is taking me away, replied Emma. And really I can hardly answer as to where we are going. I am wishing to try a change of air, as I do not find Croydon agree with me. This is Mr. Bridges doing then, said he, his face turning pale with an emotion which she did not understand. He felt convinced that his plans had been seen through and counteracted and entertained in consequence anything but a feeling of gratitude towards the agent of his disappointment. At this moment, the clergyman entered and claimed Emma's company and after an affectionate farewell from Miss Watson and a formal bow from the doctor, she was hurried away. The other two ladies were out walking as Jane was determined not to countenance Emma's departure by her presence on the occasion. Emma felt so very much relieved 
as she lost sight of Croydon and entered on a country quite new to her, that she fancied she was driving fresh health and strength from every breath she inhaled. She was, however, too weak to bear much conversation and was content to lie back in peace and silence in a corner of the carriage, quietly reposing on the cushions with which she had been carefully propped and enjoying the luxury of seeing the wearing landscape pass before her eyes without making any exertion. Mr. Bridge was reading, and in this way the fourteen miles were pleasantly and quickly passed, and in about two hours from leaving Croydon, they stopped at the door of Miss Bridge's residence. It was a small, old-fashioned house with a thick screen of shrubs surrounding it, and a few picturesque old scotch firs standing on the little grass plat which divided the front from the road. The walls were covered with creeping shrubs and it was evident that the owner loved flowers, for early as it was in the year, the little porch was crowded with showy plants and odoriferous with the scent of hyacinth, narcissus and other sweet bulbs. The old lady came out to receive them and the warmth of her welcome with the kindness of her manner quite won Emma's heart at once. She saw that her guest was fatigued and would not allow her to exert herself in any way, but leading her upstairs, made her rest on the bed and left her promising to return in a short time. The air of comfort which now surrounded Emma was truly grateful to her feelings. The airy and well-furnished bedroom, the snowy curtains and drapery round the bed, the comfortable furniture, all seemed to bespeak an attention to her wants, to which she had long been a stranger. And as she lay there thinking over all that was past and wondering what was to come next, a deep feeling of gratitude stole over her heart for finding herself at last in so peaceful and apparently comfortable a home. Faithful to her promise, Miss Bridge returned speedily, bringing with her some refreshment, of which she insisted on Emma's partaking, and then desiring her to remain quiet for a couple of hours at least, she returned to her brother, and spent the interval in learning every particular that he could detail relative to her interesting young visitor. When Emma woke from a refreshing slumber of several hours' duration, the first object which met her eyes was the countenance of Miss Bridge bending over her. There was such a look of benevolent interest in that good-tempered face as would have sufficed to redeem a very plain set of features from the change of insipidity, but Miss Bridge was very far from plain, and it was evident she must have been eminently handsome. She was extremely thin, and her high features and dark complexion made her look perhaps rather older than she really was. But her eyes, which were dark hazel, were still bright and lively. Her dress was that of an old woman, the colors grave and the materials rich, and though not exactly in the reigning fashion of the day, yet sufficiently like it to prevent any appearance of singularity, whilst it was perfectly becoming her age and station. Emma felt sure that she should like her exceedingly and quite longed to be strong enough to converse with her. She was found so much better as to be permitted to leave her room and lie for a time on the sofa in the drawing room, though Miss Bridge still proscribed conversation and recommended quiet and rest. Everything that she saw gave her an idea of the comfort of her new home. The well-filled bookshelves especially delighted her. She had enjoyed so little time for reading lately that the sight of such a collection of books was a most welcome prospect and she anticipated with satisfaction the time when she should be able to exert herself again and commence the acquisition of the Italian language as she was extremely anxious to increase her information and accomplishments to the utmost. The next day, the old clergyman took his leave and telling Emma not to fret about her friends at Croydon and hoping when he came over next month, he should find her with rosy cheeks and smiles to welcome him. 
he went off quite satisfied that he had secured a comfortable home for his young friend and a desirable companion for his old sister nothing could be more peaceful and pleasant to a contented mind than the course of life in which emma now engaged she speedily recovered her strength and was able by early rising to enjoy several hours alone in the morning which she devoted to study by this means she was always at liberty to give her whole attention to miss bridge so soon as they met in the drawing room their forenoons were employed in reading and needlework unless when miss bridge was writing letters or settling her household matters walking out or working in the garden occupied the afternoon and in both these occupations as soon as emma was strong enough she took great delight the garden was cultivated with uncommon care miss bridge having quite a passion for floriculture and emma thought nothing could exceed the beauty of her tulips anemones and hyacinths as they gradually unfolded their blossoms she became extremely interested in the pursuit and miss bridge more than once had to interfere to prevent her overtiring herself by her zealous labors the country round their residence was extremely pretty tracts of old forest land with the huge old trees survivors of many centuries formed an agreeable contrast to the agricultural districts interspersed in places and the steep sides of some of the chalky hills were clothed with hanging beech woods equally picturesque with the green forest glades beneath to wander over this scenery botanizing amongst the lanes and hedgerows or visiting the various cottages in the neighborhood formed a delightful variety to their labors in the garden Emma found that next to the clergyman Miss Bridge was looked up to as the guardian and friend of the poor every wounded limb or distressing domestic affliction was detailed to her her advice was sought equally when the pig died the baby was born or the husband was sick her medicine chest was in frequent requisition but her kitchen and dairy still more so for one dose of rhubarb which she dispensed she gave away at least two dinners and those well acquainted with poor may judge whether by so doing she was not likely to prevent as much illness as she cured for by far the greater part of the diseases amongst the laboring classes arise from scanty food and too thin clothing of course she was the idol the oracle of all the villagers and the more so because there was no squire or squire's family in the parish to diminish her importance or dim the luster of her position in fact she was the sister of the last squire and since his death as his eldest son resided on another property the manor house had stood empty and deserted it quite grieved emma to see it for the house with its gable ends and old fashioned porch was very picturesque but they derived one advantage from the desolate condition in which it was left as they had the uncontrolled range of the gardens and pleasure grounds which were very extensive the little church stood within these grounds and by its situation somewhat reminded her of osborne castle but how different was the rector he was an old formal bachelor living with an unmarried sister extremely nervous and shy and more remarkable for his total disregard to punctuality than any other point this was peculiarly evident on the sunday when the whole congregation were always assembled at least a quarter of an hour before his appearance amongst them if the day was fine they did not enter the church but remained strolling up and down the pasture in which it stood until the minister appeared and led the way into the sacred building the congregation which was almost entirely composed of the rural population presented a very different aspect from that at croydon there were few smart bonnets and the gayest articles of apparel in the church were the scarlet cloaks of the women the dark and old fashioned building itself had no ornaments but the hatchments belonging to the bridge family 
and one or two ugly and cumbrous monuments upon the walls which seemed intended to record that certain individuals had been born and died though what they did when living was now totally forgotten when the service was concluded the clergyman quitted the pulpit and walked out before all his congregation who stood up respectfully to let him pass and then miss bridge and emma who had their seat in the squire's pew followed before any one else presumed to stir from their places there was then a friendly greeting between the rector and his principal parishioners after which they took their quiet way homewards to partake of their early dinner and return to the afternoon service such was the tenor of emma's life whilst she remained with miss bridge the only incident that varied the scene was a drive over to croydon one day in order to attend margaret's wedding emma had recovered her strength so rapidly that she was perfectly equal to the exertion and margaret had sent a pressing invitation not only to her but to miss bridge likewise it was therefore settled that they should go and spend the night at the vicarage as robert watson's house was quite full with the addition of some cousins of his wife who were paying a visit in consequence of this arrangement she did not see her future brother-in-law that day but elizabeth spent the afternoon with them she saw with sincere pleasure how much emma was improved in looks she was plumper and fresher more blooming and bewitching than ever and so thought mr morgan too for he likewise called to see her and was quite startled with the alteration in her appearance i need not ask you how you are said he fixing on her eyes which spoke his admiration as plainly as if he had put it into words you are looking so well emma was forced to turn away for the expression of his face was too openly admiring to be pleasant elizabeth had a long chat with her in private there was so much to learn about her new way of life and so much to tell her in return that it seemed as if four and twenty hours instead of two might have been talked away with ease there was much to discuss about margaret's prospects elizabeth was very little satisfied with tom musgrove and only wondered that her sister appeared so well pleased as she did he was careless and cold almost to insolence and had evidently tried to annoy her in every way he could flirting with every girl who came in his way and only showing that he was not careless to her feelings by his repeated attempts to wound them to all this she seemed perfectly indifferent whether from vanity she really did not see or from wilful blindness she would not perceive his meaning elizabeth could not tell but she always continued to preserve a most satisfied air and when slighted by tom sought peace and contentment in the contemplation of her wedding presents and bridal finery constantly talking as if she enjoyed the unlimited affection of the most amiable and agreeable man in the world and who do you think appeared amongst us last week continued elizabeth actually lord osborne ah you colour and look pleased and well you may for i have no doubt croydon would never have seen his countenance if he had not thought you still living here lord osborne said emma astonished what brought his lordship here do you know the ostensible reason was to bring a present to margaret from his sister a very pretty necklace as a wedding present but the real reason i have not the smallest doubt was to see you and had he not supposed you were still here the parcel might have come by the coach for any trouble he would have given himself about it it was very good natured of miss osborne to remember margaret in that way said emma how pleased she must have been yes i think she was it seemed even to put tom in a better humour with her and everything it gave her a sort of consequence what did lord osborne say inquired emma hoping to hear something relative to mr howard oh we had a long talk together and he inquired particularly about you and where and how you were and he said he hoped very soon to see you he talked about expecting you to visit his sister 
in short he seemed to have a great deal to say for himself and really for him was quite agreeable to be sure i do not think him quite so pleasant as george miller but everybody need not have my taste of course well i should like to have seen him did he say nothing about our friends mrs willis and her brother how are they he said what i was sorry to hear that mr howard appeared ill and out of spirits i wonder what can be the matter with him do you think he can be in love i am not in his confidence said emma coloring deeply you will see him of course said elizabeth if you go to osborne castle be sure let me know what you think of him then do ascertain if he is in love you had better make observations for yourself elizabeth replied her sister how can i judge of a sentiment with which i am unacquainted wait till you visit margaret and you will be able to form your own opinions i do not think i shall ever visit margaret replied elizabeth so if i do not see mr howard under any other circumstances our chance of meeting is but small the wedding day was as bright as sunshiny as any bride could desire emma's thoughts wandered from margaret and her companions to the bridal party in london who she imagined would be engaged in the same ceremony about the same hour she knew mr howard was to officiate for her friend and she tried to picture the scene to herself then she imagined another group where mr howard himself should perform the part of bridegroom and wondered what her own feelings would be if she were the witness of such a spectacle she was ashamed of herself when she recalled her mind from this vision and she tried to think of something more appropriate to the occasion she joined in the prayers for her sister's happiness but her heart trembled as she thought of her prospects however it was no use for boding evil she tried to hope for the best margaret was not satisfied with her two sisters as bridesmaids but both she and tom had insisted on having four more from amongst her intimate friends one of these was the younger miss morgan and as a compliment to her her brother was invited to be the party to church he stood by emma but she was unconscious of it until when the ceremony was concluded and there was a general congratulations and kissing going on she felt her hand clasped by someone and on her turning round he whispered in her ear when shall you stand in your sister's place before she had time to answer or even to understand exactly what he had said her new made brother came up and claimed the right of kissing her the double right in fact both as bridegroom and brother and when she had submitted to the infliction she again heard it whispered into her ear that is the only part which i envy mr musgrove emma moved away without looking round again and took her station by the side of her friend miss bridge where she felt convinced that mr morgan would not dare to intrude on her there was something in the change of manner which he had lately assumed to her most particularly offensive and grating to her feelings another thing she could not avoid remarking was that some of the young ladies affected to shun her shrinking away when she approached and abruptly changing the conversation as if some mystery were going on between them this was more particularly evident during the party which succeeded the wedding when she found herself rather a conspicuous person two or three times being left alone by those she approached and on more than one occasion seeing a group suddenly disperse on her drawing near she did not comprehend the reason of this but she felt it particularly disagreeable and it induced her as soon as she noticed it to keep close to miss bridge in order to avoid the feeling of solitude in a crowd which was so distressing to her the meeting after the wedding was as dull as such affairs usually are and right glad was emma when the time for retiring came and she was able to return to the peaceful vicarage the next day she again left croydon and once more found repose and tranquillity beneath miss bridges hospitable roof end of chapter 4
Volume 3, Chapter 5 of The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vanemala. The Younger Sister by Catherine Ann Hubbock. Volume 3, Chapter 5. Much as Emma's thoughts had been dwelling on her acquaintance in London, she little guessed the scene that had really been passing or the prominent figure which Mr. Howard had made on the occasion. When the ceremony was performed, the breakfast over and the new married couple had left the house, Lady Osborne retired to her dressing room and thither she sent for Mr. Howard. Without the slightest suspicion as to the real object of her wishes, he obeyed the summons and found her ladyship alone. She requested him to be seated and then looked exceedingly embarrassed and not a little silly, but after some attempts at conversation, which ended in total failures, she suddenly observed, The marriage of my daughter makes a great difference to me, Mr. Howard. Of course it must, replied he, rather wondering what would come next. I fear I shall find myself very uncomfortable if I continue in the same style of life I have done before. Without Miss Osborne, I shall be quite lost. Mr. Howard could not help thinking that he should have supposed few mothers would have felt the change so little. They had never been companions or appeared of any consequence to each other. However, he felt it his duty to make some cheering observation and therefore ventured to suggest that her ladyship should not give way to such desponding thoughts. She might perhaps find it less painful than she anticipated. You are very kind to try to cheer me in my melancholy situation. But, Mr. Howard, I have always found you so, and I am deeply indebted to you for the many hours of comfort you have at different times procured for me. You have always been my friend. He did not at all know what to say to this speech, and was therefore silent. Do you consider, continued she, that gratitude is a good foundation for happiness in the married state? It is, no doubt, a good foundation for affection, replied he. But unless the superstructure is raised, I do not think the foundation will be of much use. It is not sufficient of itself. You distress me by your opinion. I had hoped that to secure gratitude was the certain way to produce love. I apprehend that your ladyship will find it much more easy to deserve gratitude than to secure it. It is an intractable virtue and favours which are supposed to have this return as their object are apt to fail entirely in their purpose. I am very sorry you say so, Mr. Howard. I wish I could secure love from the objects of my affection. I fear the case is exactly the reverse. The gentleman was silent and a pause ensued between them which the lady broke. What do you think of my daughter's marriage? I think, replied he, it has every promise of securing them mutual happiness. I hope this as sincerely as I wish it. Sir William is an excellent young man. The marriage is not so high a one as what my daughter might have aspired to. She has given up all dreams of ambition. Do you not see that? Of course, Miss Osborne might have married the equal or the superior to her brother in rank, said Mr. Howard. But she has acted far more wisely, in my opinion, in preferring worth and affection, though not accompanying so splendid an alliance as possibly her friends have expected for her. Sir William has wealth to satisfy a less reasonable woman than Lady Gordon. And if his rank is sufficiently elevated to content her, she can have no more to desire. Do not imagine, Mr. Howard, from what I said that I was regretting the difference in rank. On the contrary, I believe most fully that as she was attached to Sir William, Miss Osborne could do nothing better than marry him. 
far be it from me to wish any one to sacrifice affection to ambition had there been even more difference in their rank had the descent been decidedly greater had he been of really plebeian origin i should not have objected when her affections were fixed i cannot imagine that there was any possibility of such an event miss osborne would never have fixed her affections on an unsuitable object as any one decidedly beneath her would have been do you then consider it unsuitable where love directs to step out of one's own sphere to follow its dictates i am decidedly averse to unequal marriages even when the husband is the superior if the inequality is very great i am inclined to think it does not tend to promote happiness but when their positions are reversed and the man instead of elevating his wife drags her down to a level beneath that where she had previously moved it can hardly fail to produce some degree of domestic discomfort alas i am grieved that your opinion should be so contrary to my favorite theories i can imagine nothing more delightful than for a woman to sacrifice station and rank to forego an elevated position and to lay down her wealth at the feet of some man distinguished only by his wit and worth to have the proud happiness of securing thus his eternal gratitude i think a man must be very selfish and self-confident who could venture to ask such a sacrifice from any woman i could not but i am supposing that the sacrifice is voluntary proposed planned and arranged entirely by herself women have been capable of this what should you say to it i cannot tell what i should say for i cannot imagine myself in such a situation your ladyship takes pleasure in arranging little romances but such circumstances are unlikely to occur in real life and why what do you suppose is the reason why is in this prosaic world we are governed only by titles empty sounds not to be compared to the sterling merits of virtue and learning mr howard i prefer a man of sense learning and modesty to all the coxcombs who ever wore a coronet or paraded a title your ladyship is quite right replied he beginning to get a little uncomfortable at the looks of his companion and rather anxious to put a stop to the conference and if that man were too modest to be sensible of the preference if he could not venture on his own account to break through the barriers which difference of station had placed between us should he be shocked if despising etiquette and throwing aside the restraints of pride and reserve i were to venture to express those feelings in all their native warmth and openness he was silent and lady osborne continued for some moments in profound thought likewise looking down at the carpet and playing with her rings at length she raised her head and said i think you understand my meaning mr howard of the nature of my feelings i am sure you must have been long aware do you not see to what this conversation tends he appeared excessively embarrassed and could not for some minutes arrange his ideas sufficiently to know what to say at length he stammered out your ladyship does me too much honor if i rightly understand your meaning but perhaps i should be sorry to misinterpret it and really you must excuse me perhaps i had better withdraw no mr howard do not go with a half explanation which can only lead to mistakes tell me what you really suppose i meant why should you hesitate to express seriously replied he trying to smile i for a moment imagined that your ladyship meant to apply to me what you had just been saying and i feared you were going to tell me of some friend who would make the sacrifices you so eloquently described sacrifices which i felt would be far beyond my deserts and supposing i did say so supposing there were a woman of rank and wealth and influence who would devote them all to you what would you say i would say that though excessively obliged to her my love was not to be the purchase of either wealth or influence 
I know you are entitled to hold worldly advantages as cheap as anyone. But remember, my dear friend, all the worth of such a sacrifice. Think of the warmth of an affection which could trample on ceremony and brave opinion. And think on the consequences which might accrue to you from this. Even you may well pause before preferring mediocrity to opulence and obscurity to rank and eminence. These advantages would not greatly weigh with me what they attainable. But you forget my profession forbids ambition and removes the means of advancement. No, you forget the gradations which exist in that career. Do you treat as nothing the certainty of promotion, of rising to be a dignitary of the church, a dean, a bishop, perhaps becoming at once a member of the upper house? Has ambition no charms, no hold upon your mind? My ambition would never prompt me to wish to rise through my wife. I could not submit to that. Hard-hearted, cruel man. And has love, ardent love, no charms for you? It is true I cannot offer you the first bloom of youth, but have I no traces of former beauty, no charm which can influence you or soften your heart? Has not the uncontrollable though melancholy love which actuates me has that no power over your affections? She paused and Mr. Howard hesitated a moment how to answer, then firmly but respectfully replied, If I understand your ladyship aright, and I think I cannot now misunderstand, you pay me the highest compliment, but one which is quite undeserved by me. Highly as I feel honoured, however, I cannot change my feelings or alter the sentiments which I have already expressed. My mind was made known to you before yours was to me, and to vary now from what I then said might well cause you to doubt my sincerity and could give no satisfaction to your ladyship. He stopped abruptly. He wanted to say something indicative of gratitude and respect, but the disgust which he felt at her proceedings prevented the words coming naturally. She, the mother of a married daughter and a grown-up son, to be making proposals to a man so much her junior in age and in every way unsuited for her, Really, he could not command the expression which perhaps politeness and a sense of the compliment paid him required. He rose and appeared about to leave her, but she rose likewise and said with a look of betrayed indignation, struggling with other feelings, No, do not leave me thus. Reflect before you thus madly throw away the advantages I offer you. Consider the animity you provoke. Calculate the depth of my wrath and the extent of my power. Refuse me, and there is no effort to injure you which I will not practice to revenge myself. You shall bitterly rue this day if you affront me thus. I cannot vary him from my answer. Your ladyship may excite my gratitude by your kindness, but neither my love nor my fears are to be raised by promises or menaces. On this subject, I must be apparently ungrateful. But when the temporary delusion which now influences you has passed away, you will doubtless rejoice that I am firm today. I must leave you. Leave me then, and let me never see that insidious face again. Ungrateful monster, to throw my benefits from you, to reject my advances? Is my condescension to be thus rewarded? But I debase myself by talking to you. Leave me. Be gone and take only my enmity with you as your portion. The lady seemed struggling with vehement emotions which almost choked her, and knowing she was occasionally attacked with dangerous fits, Mr. Howard hesitated about leaving her alone. By a gesture of her hand, however, she repulsed his offer to approach her. He therefore slowly withdrew, and his mind was relieved of anxiety for her by seeing her maid enter the room before he had descended the stairs. He then hurried away and tried by walking very quickly through the most retired paths in Kensington Gardens to soothe his feelings and tranquilize his mind. Had there been no Emma Watson in the world, or had she been, as he feared she would soon be, married to Lord Osborn, he must still have refused the proposal which had just been made to him. 
it never could have presented itself as a temptation to his mind but under present circumstances with the heart full of her memory all the more precious the more dwelt on because he feared she would never be more to him it was more than impossible it was entirely repulsive if he must love her in vain as he told himself he should that was no reason he should marry another and if she were to become lady osborne as he feared her mother-in-law would be the last person he would be tempted to accept step father to her husband oh impossible rather would he remove a thousand miles than voluntarily bring himself into contact with that charming girl in that relationship if he could not have her he would remain single for her and for his sister's sake and his nephew should hold the place of son to him these were his resolutions and a further determination to avoid all intercourse at present with the dowager was the only other idea which could find any resting place in his troubled brain he returned the next day to his vicarage and there with his sister his garden and his procurial duties he sought alike to forget the pleasures and the pains of the past end of chapter 5 Volume Three, Chapter Six: The Younger Sister. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Younger Sister by Catherine Anne Hubback. A month of tranquility and peace of mind passed in the society of Miss Bridge was sufficient to restore Emma Watson to all her former health. and more than her former beauty when lady gordon wrote to remind her of the promised visit she was almost sorry to go yet her heart would flutter a little at the notion of again visiting osborne castle of being again in the vicinity of mr howard of seeing hearing meeting him again it was very foolish to care so much about it extremely so when he had so completely shown his own indifference and yet she could not help feeling a good deal at the idea of meeting she called it curiosity to see how he was looking when she admitted that thoughts of him had anything to do with it but more often she persisted that it was affection for lady gordon or a wish to see her old neighborhood or to visit osborne castle in the summer in short she found a hundred surprisingly good reasons why she should wish to go to osborne castle any one of which would have been sufficient had it only been true but as they were mostly imaginary she never felt quite deceived about them in her own mind this was provoking as she would have liked had she been able to convince herself that she no longer took any interest in mr howard she had however a right to remember his sister with regard and she readily owned to herself that she should be extremely glad to renew her acquaintance with mrs willis she hoped to see margaret again and judge of the comparative happiness of her married life yet she looked back with regret to the past four weeks and reckoned them as some of the happiest she had ever known elizabeth had spent part of the time with her and she had enjoyed herself so very much the more she had known of miss bridge the better she had liked her and the parting was accompanied with mutual regrets and hopes of meeting again it was june when she returned to osborne castle june with its deep blue skies its sunny days its delicious twilight june with its garlands of roses scenting the air and its odoriferous hayfields the weather was such as any lover of nature must revel in delicious summer weather fit for strolling in the shade or sitting under trees making believe to read whilst you were really watching the birds flitting among the bushes or the bees humming in the flowers weather for enjoying life in perfect listlessness and idleness when scarcely any occupation could be followed up beyond arranging a bouquet or reading a novel so thought and so declared the young bride when her husband pressed her to engage in any serious pursuit she enjoyed the pleasure of teasing him by her refusals perhaps rather more than she ought to have done but she never teased him very far now she knew what he would bear and ventured not to go beyond it i am glad emma watson is coming to-day said she as she threw herself on a seat in the flower garden you will have something else to look at than besides me and i shall quite enjoy the change are you sure of that rosa said he doubtfully 
"'Why, you have not the impertinence to suppose that I value your incessant attentions,' said she. "'Can you not imagine how tired I am of being the sole object of your love? Emma Watson shall listen to the grave books you so much love, shall talk of history or painting with you, shall sit as your model, and leave me in my beloved indolence.' "'May I inquire if you suppose you are teasing or pleasing me by this arrangement, Rosa? Is it to satisfy me or yourself?' "'Oh, don't ask troublesome questions. I hate investigations as to meanings and motives. All I want is to be left alone, and not asked to ride or walk when I had rather lie on a sofa in quiet.' "'Shall I leave you now, then, my dear little wife?' inquired he smilingly, and offering to go as he spoke. I have a letter to write now, and you can stay here in solitude. He returned to the castle. She remained musing where he left her. And thus it happened that when Emma was announced, she found the young baronet alone in their morning sitting-room. He laid down his pen and advanced to meet her with great cordiality, desiring a message to be sent to summon his lady. After expressing the pleasure it gave him to see her again, he observed, Who would have thought, Miss Watson, when we last met, that I should be receiving you in this castle. Did you prognosticate such an event? Not precisely, replied Emma, so far as concerned myself, but as relating to Miss Osborne, I mean, Lady Gordon, any one must have foreseen it. I assure you, when such things are foreseen, Miss Watson, it most frequently happens that they never come to pass. I have repeatedly seen instances of this kind. He spoke with an arch smile, and a faint idea passed through her mind that she was in his thoughts at the moment, an idea which might, perhaps, have embarrassed her more had it not been swallowed up, annihilated entirely by a more powerful sensation, as the door opened and Lady Gordon entered with Mr. Howard. It was fortunate that the inquiries of the former, her expressions of pleasure, and her caresses were an excuse for Emma's not immediately turning to the gentleman. Had they been obliged to speak at once, it is probable their dialogue would have been peculiar, interesting, but unconnected, as the man said of Johnson's dictionary. As it was, they both had time to collect their thoughts, and when they did turn, were able to go through their interview with tolerable calmness. But Emma had the advantage, as ladies frequently have where circumstances require a ready tact and presence of mind. Indeed, they did not start on fair ground since she had only one set of sensations to contend with and conceal. He had more, for, besides the emotion which the sight of her occasioned him, he had the double evil of being convinced it was contrary to the requisitions of honour, to feel any extraordinary pleasure in her company. Had not Lord Osborne made him his confidant relative to his attachment, or had Howard boldly owned to his lordship at the time that he entertained similar views, all would have been right and he might openly have expressed the interest which he now was compelled carefully to smother. His address was cold and formal, the very contrast to his feelings, and extremely ill done, likewise. Emma, chilled by the reception so different to what she had ventured to expect, began to fear her own manners had been too openly indicative of pleasure at the sight of him, and determined to correct this error, she almost immediately followed Lady Gordon, who had sauntered towards the conservatory. Come here, said the young hostess, linking her arm in Emma's. Let us leave the gentlemen to discuss the parish politics together. Mr. Howard came on business, and Sir William dearly loves meddling with it. Now, you must tell me all the news of Croydon. Have you no scandal to enliven me? With whom has the lawyer quarreled? Or to whom has the apothecary been making love? Emma colored and laughed a little. Lady Gordon smilingly watched her. "'To you, I suppose, by your blushes, Miss Watson? "'Well, that gives me a higher idea of his taste "'than I have been accustomed to form of country-town doctors. "'How many lovers have you to boast of, "'beginning with Lord Osborne "'and ending with this nameless son of Esculapius? "'Tell me all.' "'Indeed, I have no such honours to boast,' replied Emma. "'No one has sought me, and probably no one ever will.' This was followed by a little sigh. Nay, do not be so desponding. A little chill is nothing, cried Lady Gordon. But I am not going to pry into your secrets. This conservatory has given us enough of trouble in that way already. By the way, 
You will, of course, like to go over and call on your sister, Mrs. Musgrove? When will it suit you? Tomorrow, if you please, replied Emma gratefully. Lady Gordon promised that the means of conveyance should be at her service, and they proceeded to discuss other topics. She insisted on detaining Mr. Howard to spend the afternoon and to dine with them, pleading, as a reason, the absence of his sister, who was away on a visit. And when this point was carried and settled, she led them out into the flower-garden again, and loitered away the rest of the intervening time amidst the perfume of summer flowers, and the flickering lights and shadows of the alcoves, and their gay creeping plants. It was the day and place for love-making. Who could resist the fascinating influence of sweet scents, sunshine, murmuring fountains, and soft summer airs? Not Mr. Howard, certainly. Gradually, his frozen manner melted away. His purposes of reserve were forgotten, and he became once more the Mr. Howard of Emma's first acquaintance, pleasant and gay, sensible and agreeable. Lady Gordon left them several times together, whilst she occupied herself with her flowers or her tame pheasants, and each successive time of her absence there was less check and constraint in his manner. And when, at last, she totally disappeared, and they were left without other witnesses in that delightful spot, than the silent trees or the trickling waters, his reserve had disappeared altogether, and she could converse with him as in former times. "'Have you enjoyed your visit at Croydon, Miss Watson?' inquired he presently. She looked surprised at the question. "'Enjoyed it,' she repeated, then, after a momentary hesitation, added, "'I wonder you can apply such a term to circumstances connected with so much that is, that must be, most painful.' He was exceedingly vexed with himself for the question, and attempted to make some excuse for the inadvertence. It is unnecessary, she replied with something almost of bitterness in her tone. I had no right to expect that the memory of our misfortune would remain when we ourselves were removed from sight. I ought rather to apologize for answering your question so uncivilly. No, no, indeed, cried he eagerly. I cannot admit that. But indeed, Miss Watson, you do me injustice, and the same to all your former friends in that last speech. We cannot cease to regret the misfortune, the providential dispensation, which, in removing your excellent father from among us, robbed us likewise of you and your sisters. My dear father, said Emma involuntarily, her eyes filling with tears. She turned away her head. It was, of course, a terrible wound to you said he softly, and stepping up quite close to her, but not one which you need despair of time's healing. Your good sense, your principles, must assist you to view the occurrence in its true light. It must not sadden your whole life, or rob you of all pleasure. True, but there are other sorrows connected with it, she stopped abruptly, then went on again. However, I have no right to complain. I have still some friends left. My loss of fortune has not entailed the loss of all those whom I reckon amongst my friends, though an event of that kind is a good touchstone for new and untried friendships. Can you imagine, cried he eagerly, that such a circumstance can make the shadow of a difference to any one worth knowing? It is, I own, too, too common. But surely you have not met with such instances? She shook her head and looked half reproachfully at him. In her own heart, she had felt inclined to charge him with this feeling. I should have thought, continued he warmly, you would have said, at least you would have found it like the words of the old song that, Friends in all the old you meet, and brothers in the young. I believe it is not usual, replied she, trying to speak playfully, to attach much value to an old song. We may consider that as a poetical fiction. He looked very earnestly at her and said, You fancy friends have deserted you, owing to a change in your prospects. Do not. Allow me to advise you. Do not give way to such feelings. They will not make you happy. They do not make me unhappy, I assure you, said she with spirit. The value I place on such fluctuating friendships is low indeed. In one single instance, perhaps, it may be so, but you had better not dwell on such ideas. 
they will create eventually a habit of mind which must tend to produce secret irritation and uneasiness the allowing yourself to think it much more expressing that thought can do you no good and each repetition deepens the impression he spoke so gently with such a low earnest tone she could not resist or for a moment longer indulge her half-formed suspicions relative to him and his sister whether he had guessed her feelings she could not tell his eyes were fixed on her with too much of interest to allow her to attempt reading the whole of their meaning she never liked him so well as when thus and with justice reproving her i dare say you are right said she meekly i will try to repress such feelings indeed i am ashamed i ever gave them utterance and here too where i have been so very kindly welcomed and i am to imagine then continued he that croydon offers few attractions to you a country town is not usually agreeable except to those who love gossip of which i do not suspect you but you must have found some compensations it was a great pleasure to look forward to elizabeth being so comfortably settled replied emma i like my future brother very much and am pleased with his family i have no doubt of her happiness and the style of life will not be irksome to her but i love the country and country pursuits and was right glad to exchange the noisy streets of croydon for the delightful groves of burton its meadows and green lanes you have not then been the whole time at croydon she explained he had certainly been in a state of complete darkness as to her movements lately and she really felt a momentary mortification that he should have been contented to remain in such profound ignorance yet she also rejoiced that he had never heard anything relative to the course of events which had occasioned her so much pain in croydon and driven her from the place he knew nothing of mr morgan how much longer they would have been content to loiter in that pleasant flower-garden cannot now be known but they were only induced to leave it by the sound of the gong which summoned them to the castle to prepare for dinner the hour which they had thus enjoyed had been one of the pleasantest to emma which she could recollect and the witchery of it to howard himself would have been quite unrivalled had his conscience been easy on reflection with regard to lord osborne's plans and hopes he tormented himself with the idea that it was unjust to his friend to take advantage of his absence yet a flattering hope dwelt in his heart that she had shown no reluctance to the interview nay if his wishes did not deceive and mislead him there was a glance in her averted eye and a rich mantling of colour over her cheek once or twice which spoke anything but aversion and if so if he really had been so fortunate as to inspire her with a partiality so delightful was he not privileged more than privileged bound in honour to her to prove himself deserving of such feelings and capable of appreciating them this conviction gave him a degree of confidence and animation quite different from the manners he had exhibited when they had previously met at osborne castle and emma found him as pleasant as in the earlier stage of their acquaintance are you still partial to early walks miss watson inquired sir william in the course of the evening or is it only in frosty winter mornings that you indulge in such a recreation ah i had a very pleasant ramble that morning said emma at least till the rain came and spoilt it all a very mortifying way of concluding said sir william laughing for i came with the rain i wish you would not put in that reservation i am not so ungrateful as to include you and the rain in the same condemnation replied she you were of great assistance in my distresses but if you wish to indulge in the same amusement now you will have abundance of time as lady gordon is by no means so precipitate in her habits of rising and performing her morning toilette as to compel her guests to abridge their walks before breakfast perhaps as a compliment to you and by making very great speed she may contrive to complete her labours in that way by ten or eleven o'clock well i do not pretend to deny it said lady gordon i am excessively indolent and dearly love the pleasure of doing nothing but sir william is always anxious to make me out much worse than i am but you have not answered my question as to your intentions for to-morrow miss watson and i have a great wish to know whether you are proposing an excursion because i think it would be much more agreeable if we can contrive to walk together and if i know at what time you intend to start i will take care to be in the way is he serious lady gordon 
inquired Emma. It is a most uncommon event if he is so, I assure you, replied the young wife. And indeed, I would not take upon myself to assert such a thing of him at any time. Do not believe all the scandal my lady there will say of me, returned Sir William, but just say at once that you will walk to-morrow morning, and that you will be particularly happy if I and Mr. Howard will join you. Emma blushed deeply, and hardly knew what to answer, but Lady Gordon saved her the trouble of replying, by exclaiming at the presumption and self-conceit of her husband, declaring that he had completely reversed the proper order of things, and that he deserved a decided negative from Emma, for having expected her to profess such extraordinary satisfaction at his company. Emma made believe to consider the proposal entirely as a joke, but somehow, without knowing exactly how, it was settled that the proposed excursion should take place, and that Mr. Howard was to meet them at a particular spot, from whence they were to ascend the hill behind the castle to enjoy the prospect bathed in a morning's sunshine. Lady Gordon privately gave her husband many injunctions not to interfere with the lovers, and whilst keeping near enough to take away all appearance of impropriety, to be sure, and give them plenty of time for quiet intercourse. In return for her consideration, he only laughed at her, and accused her of a great inclination to intrigue, assuring her she had much better leave such affairs to take their chance. The walk, however, took place as was planned, and was exceedingly enjoyed by all three, though Mr. Howard did not take that occasion of declaring his passion. Indeed, he would have had some difficulty in finding an opportunity, as Sir William did not follow Lady Gordon's suggestions of leaving them together. Mindful of her promise, Lady Gordon sent her guest over the next morning to pay her first visit to Mrs. Tom Musgrove. It was with rather a feeling of doubt and hesitation that Emma ventured to her sister's house. Anxious as she was to see her and judge for herself, and curious to observe the manners which Tom Musgrove adopted as a married man. She could not help some internal misgivings as to the result of her investigations. She had never seen the house before, and though she had been previously warned of the fact that it had no beauty to recommend it, she was not exactly prepared for the bare, unsheltered situation, and the extreme unsightliness of the building itself. Tom had always spent too much money on his horses and their habitation to have any to spare for beautifying his house during the days of his bachelorship, and he was far too angry at the constraint put upon him in his marriage to feel any inclination to exert himself for the reception of his bride. She had, therefore, no additions for her accommodation, no gay flower garden, not even any new furniture to boast of, and her glory must consist alone in the fact of her new name and her security from living and dying an old maid. Most people would have thought that security dearly purchased, but if such were Margaret's thoughts, she had not as yet given utterance to them. Emma found her lying on a sofa, and in spite of her very gay dress and an extremely becoming cap, evidently out of spirits and cross, yet wanting to excite her sister's envy of her situation. "'Well, Emma,' said she sharply, I am glad you have come over to see me, though I must say I think your friend Lady Gordon, since she is such a great friend of yours, might have paid me the compliment of calling with you. She thought it would be pleasanter if we met first without her, said Emma cheerfully, but she desired me to express the pleasure it would give her to see you and Mr. Musgrove at Osborne Castle any day you would name. Somewhat mollified by this unexpected attention, Margaret smiled slightly then again relapsing into her usual pettish air, she observed, I think you might say something about the house and drawing-room. What do you think of it? Emma was exceedingly puzzled what to answer, as it was difficult for her to combine sincerity with anything agreeable. But after looking round for a minute, she was able to observe that the room was of a pretty shape and had a pleasant aspect. It wants new furnishing, sadly continued Margaret, pleased with her sister's praise. But Tom is so stingy of money, I am sure I do not know when I am to do it. Would not pale blue damask satin curtains look lovely here, with a gold fringe or something of the sort? Rather expensive, I should suppose, replied Emma, and perhaps something plainer would be more in character with the rest of the house and furniture. I don't see that at all, retorted Margaret. Do you suppose I do not know how to furnish a house? Of course I should have everything to correspond, 
I have a little common sense, I believe, whatever some people may choose to think of it. At home, indeed, I was always considered as nothing, but as a married woman I am of some importance, I believe. It was not your taste that I doubted, replied Emma, and then stopped, afraid lest she should only make bad worse by anything she might venture to say. I should like to know what you did doubt then, said Margaret scornfully. Perhaps you thought we could not afford it. But there, I assure you, are quite mistaken. Tom's is a very ample income, and he can as well afford me a luxuries as Sir William Gordon himself. I am very glad to hear it, replied Emma composedly. Margaret thought a little, and then inquired how Elizabeth was going on. Emma's account was very satisfactory, or at least would have been so to any one really concerned in Miss Watson's welfare but Margaret would probably have felt better pleased had there been some drawback or disadvantage to relate concerning her, being not altogether so well satisfied with her own lot as to make her quite equal to bearing the prosperity of her sister. And so she is really going to marry that man, in spite of his brewery? Well, I wish she had more pride, proper pride. I must say I think a clergyman's daughter might have looked higher, and she should consider my feelings a little. I should have been ashamed to marry any one not a gentleman by birth or a situation. We have not all the same feelings, replied Emma, willing to propitiate, and I do not wonder at her liking Mr. Miller. He is so excellent a man. You think so, I dare say, said Margaret scornfully, but a girl like you has seen far too little of the world to be any judge of what men are or ought to be. There is nothing so deceptive as their manners and company. I, who must be allowed to have more power of judging, and indeed in every respect be your superior, never saw anything remarkable in Mr. Miller, a certain coarseness and grossness, a something which irresistibly reminded one of a cask of double X, was much his most distinguishing characteristic. I never observed it, and indeed, Margaret, I think you do him injustice, said Emma with spirit. I am sure he has nothing coarse about him either in mind or person. I think it is very unbecoming in you to set up your opinion in opposition to me. I have had far more experience, and my position as a matron places me in a much more competent situation for judging of men and manners. Emma did not again attempt to contradict her, and Margaret, pleased with her supposed victory, inquired with some good nature and more vanity if her sister would like to see her jewel-box. Emma, aware that she wished to exhibit it, good-naturedly expressed pleasure at the proposal, and was in consequence immediately desired to ring the bell to summon her maid to fetch it. With much self-complacency and a considerable wish to make her sister envious, all the new trinkets were exhibited by the happy possessor, and amongst many which owed all their value to being perfectly modern and just in fashion, were some few ornaments which would have been valued anywhere for their intrinsic worth although antique in their setting, and differing decidedly from the style of ornament then in vogue. Those belong to Tom's mother, observed Margaret, rather contemptuously, pushing aside the trinkets in question. I believe the stones are rather good, and if they were only new set, I should like them very well, but they are monstrous old things now, set as they have been. Before Emma had time to reply, or to express any opinion at all on the subject of the trinkets, the door was violently thrown open, and with a sound which indicated that he was luxuriating in very easy slippers, Tom Musgrove entered the room. "'I say, Marjorie girl,' he began in a loud voice, but stopped in seeing his sister-in-law. "'Hey, Emma Watson! Why, I did not know you were here. By Jove, I am glad to see you!' He advanced towards her, and not satisfied with taking the hand which she extended to him, he saluted her on the cheek with considerable warmth then detaining her hand. He stared her in the face with a look of admiration, which was quite offensive to her. Upon my word, Emma, you are looking more lovely than ever, blooming and fresh. I need not ask how you are. Those bright eyes and roses speak volumes. I am glad to see you. Indeed I am. Thank you, said Emma turning away her head and struggling to release the hand which he retained with a most decided grasp. I am glad to see you and Margaret looking so well. Oh, Marjorie there. Yes, I dare say she is well enough. 
But as for me, I am sure it must be something miraculous, if I am anything remarkable in that way. He glanced at his wife and shrugged his shoulders with an air that excited disgust, not pity in Emma. And so you are come to enliven us, Emma. That's monstrous good of you. Upon my honor. I hope you are going to stay here some time. You are very kind, replied she. But I am staying with Lady Gordon, and only came over here for a short visit to Margaret. So there, you see, cried Mrs. Musgrove. My relations are as much noticed at the castle as you are, so you need not plume yourself so much on that head, Tom. I do not wonder that Sir William likes to have a pretty girl to stay with him, replied Tom, again staring at Emma, who colored highly with indignation at his impertinence. Ah, ha, how you blush, added he, coming close to her and attempting to pinch her cheek, which she, however, avoided. Why, how monstrous coy you are, exclaimed he. What, are you afraid of me? Fie, fie, you are my sister, and should have no naughty ideas in your head. I will trouble you, Tom, to leave my sister alone. I do not approve of your taking personal liberties with her. Be so good as to treat her with the respect which is due to a relative of mine, exclaimed Margaret, half rising from her sofa to speak with greater energy. Ha, ha! So you are jealous, Marjorie, said Tom, throwing himself on a seat beside Emma and rolling about with laughter. That's a good joke upon my soul, a capital joke indeed. To be sure, considering all things, it's natural enough, but really I cannot help laughing at it. Indeed, I cannot, though I beg your pardon, Emma, for doing so. Emma looked most immovably grave, and would not give him the smallest encouragement in his hilarity whilst Margaret muttered quite audibly, What a fool you do make of yourself, to be sure. So you are exhibiting your necklace box again, observed he sarcastically as he caught a glimpse of the case beside her. Upon my honor, I do not believe there is another woman so vain of her trinkets between this and Berwick. You are always showing them to everybody. Well, and what if I am? I suppose I may if I like. It does nobody any harm that ever I heard of, retorted Margaret, quite angry. I see no more wonder in a woman's showing her jewels than in a man exhibiting his horses, dogs, and guns. I have known instances of that peculiarity in some of my acquaintances, quite as well deserving of ridicule as my sisters wishing to see my ornaments could be. I dare say, the horses and the dogs were much better worth looking at than your trumpery, replied he. Why, the only things in your assortment worth anything are the topaz set which belong to my mother. All the rest is mere rubbish. What? Those frightful old things? Upon my honor, Tom, I am ashamed of wearing such monstrous, heavy, old-fashioned articles. But having once belonged to your mother, of course they must be wonderfully precious. Emma here interposed to deliver Lady Gordon's message, and to request them to name a day for accepting it. A debate ensued as to the most convenient day on which to fix, which presently branched off into a violent dispute as to whether the invitation in question was intended as a compliment to Tom or his wife, each maintaining the opinion that the honor of the invitation was all due to themselves. At length, however, Emma contrived to persuade them to settle the point in question, and two days from that time was fixed on for the dinner visit, and soon after this point was arranged, Emma took her leave. Much as she was grieved by what she had witnessed, she could not be surprised at it, when she considered the circumstances under which the union had been formed. Tom was reckless and unkind, Margaret peevish and fretful, without energy of character to make the best of her situation, or strength of mind to bear with patience the evils in which she had involved herself. No doubt, if Tom had loved her, she would have been fond of him, and any sensation beyond her own selfish feelings would have done her good but forced into the marriage against his will, love, or anything resembling it, was not to be expected from him. In consequence, her own partiality could not survive his indifference, and there was a mutual spirit of ill-will cultivated between them, which boded ill for their future peace. Emma reflected on all this as she drove home from her very unsatisfactory visit and was only roused from these unpleasant considerations by finding the carriage stopped suddenly soon after entering the park, 
On looking up, she perceived Sir William and Lady Gordon, who inquired if she would like a stroll before dinner, instead of returning at once to the castle. She assented with pleasure, and quitting the carriage, they took a pleasant path through a plantation, the thick shade of which made walking agreeable, even in the afternoon of a June day. "'Suppose we go and invade Mr. Howard,' said Lady Gordon. "'This path leads down to the vicarage. "'Let us see what sort of a housekeeper he makes, "'without his sister to manage for him.' "'Always running after Mr. Howard, Rosa,' said Sir William. "'Upon my word, I shall be jealous soon, "'yesterday flirting in the flower-garden, "'today visiting at the vicarage. "'If things go on in this way, "'I will take you away from Osborne Castle very soon.' Yes, you have reason to be jealous, have you not? When men leave off pleasing their wives themselves, they always dislike that any one else should do it for them, replied Lady Gordon, smiling saucily. You know you are always thwarting me yourself, and naturally wish to keep me from more agreeable society, lest I should draw disadvantageous comparisons. But the comparisons are not fairly drawn under such circumstances, suggested Emma for Mr. Howard's way of treating Lady Gordon can be no rule for his probable way of tyrannizing over some future Mrs. Howard. Of course not, replied Sir William. But I observe, Miss Watson, you take it for granted that he will tyrannize over a wife when he has one. Is that your opinion of men in general, or only of Mr. Howard in particular? Of men in general, no doubt, interposed Lady Gordon. Miss Watson has lived too long in the world not already to have discovered the obvious truth that all men are tyrants when they have the opportunity, the only difference being that some are hypocrites likewise, and conceal their disposition until their victim is in their power, whilst others, like yourself, William, make no secret of it at all. I am glad you acquit me of hypocrisy at least, Rosa. It has always been my wish to be distinguished for sincerity and openness. I never indulged in intrigues or meddled in maneuvers, or sought for stratagems to carry out my wishes. He accompanied this speech with a peculiar smile which made his lady color slightly. As she well knew to what he alluded, she did not reply, and they walked on some time in silence. At length Emma observed that it was a remarkably pretty walk which they were pursuing. Lady Gordon told her that they were indebted for the idea and plan of it to Mr. Howard. He had superintended the execution of some other improvements which Lady Osborne had effected, but this one had originated entirely with him. It was the pleasantest road from the vicarage to the village, and was so well made and drained as to be almost always dry, although so much sheltered. The idea that he had planned it did not at all diminish the interest with which Emma regarded the road they were discussing, and her eyes sought the glimpses of distant landscape seen between the trees with pleasure materially heightened by the recollection that it was to his taste, she was indebted for the gratification. This sort of secret satisfaction was brought suddenly to a close, by finding herself quite unexpectedly at a little wicket gate opening upon his garden. She had not been aware the house was so near, but the nature, not the source of her pleasure, was changed. It still was connected with him, and the beauty of his garden quite enchanted her. When she had previously seen it in the winter, she had felt certain it must be charming, but now it proved to surpass every expectation she had formed, and she was internally convinced that a love of gardening and a taste for the beauties of nature were sure signs of an amiable and domestic disposition in a man, which promised fair for the happiness of those connected with him. They found him hard at work constructing some new trellis work for the luxuriant creepers which adorned his entrance his coat off and his arms partly bare for the greater convenience of his labors. "'We have taken you by storm today,' said Lady Gordon, smilingly holding out her hand to him. "'I like to see your zeal for your house.' "'Really,' said he, holding up his hand, "'these fingers of mine are not at all fit to touch a lady's glove. When we assume the occupation of carpenters, we ought to expect to be treated accordingly.' and when we intrude on you at such irregular hours, we ought to be thankful for any welcome we can get, replied Lady Gordon. Indeed, I take it most kind and friendly of you to come, answered he, his eyes directed with unequivocal satisfaction towards Emma. My garden is better worth seeing now than when you were last here, added he, approaching her. It is lovely, 
replied Emma, honestly speaking her mind. What beautiful roses! I do not think I ever saw such a display of blossoms. I am glad you admire it, said he in a low voice, though after the conservatories and flower gardens of the castle, I am afraid it must look rather poor. I would not make unjust comparisons, replied Emma, but I think you need not dread it if I were inclined to do so. It is not grandeur or extent which always carries the greatest charm. And would you apply that sentiment to more than a garden? asked he, very earnestly, fixing on her eyes, which unmistakably declared his anxiety to hear her answer. He was not, however, destined to be so speedily gratified as he had hoped, for, quite unconscious that he was interrupting any peculiarly interesting conversation, Sir William turned round to inquire the name of some new shrub that struck his eye at the moment. Recollecting himself after replying to the baronet's question, he invited them to enter the house to rest, but this Lady Gordon declined, declaring that she preferred a swelling bank of turf under a tree to any sofa that ever was constructed. The ladies, therefore, sat down here, and begging to be excused for one minute, Mr. Howard disappeared, going, as Sir William guessed, to wash his hands and put on a coat that he might look smart and fit for company. Lady Gordon laughed at the idea of a clergyman making himself smart, or of Mr. Howard treating her as company. But Sir William was proved to be partly right, since it was evident upon his return that he had been employing part of his absence in the way that had been suggested, but to dress himself had not been his sole object, for he reappeared with a basket of magnificent strawberries in his hand, which on a warm afternoon in summer had a peculiarly inviting appearance. Lady Gordon accepted them eagerly, declaring that she knew his strawberries were always far better than any the castle gardens ever produced. As to Emma, she was certain she never tasted any so excellent in her life, nor was she ever before pressed to eat with so winning a smile or so persuasive a tone of voice. I wonder you take so much pains to beautify this place, when you are almost certain of being soon removed from it, said Lady Gordon. The occupation is in itself a pleasure, replied he which more than repays me for the exertion, and after your brother's liberality in making the house and garden as comfortable as possible, it would be very bad if I could not do my share in keeping it so, even if I am not to remain as possessor. But I by no means anticipate a change with the certainty which you seem to do. I have no doubt in the least that the moment Carsdine is vacant my brother will offer you the living, and as the rector is very old and infirm, it seems hardly possible that it can be long first. Mr. Howard was silent for a few minutes, and when he spoke, it was on another subject, but not with the gaiety with which he had before conversed. In fact, he was secretly meditating on the extreme desirableness of quitting his present vicarage. If ever Lady Osborne came to reside again in the neighborhood, nothing could be much more unpleasant than a meeting between them and he longed to learn from her daughter whether there was any chance of such a catastrophe. But as yet he had not found courage to inquire, fearing her penetration might have led her to guess the past events, or her mother's indiscretion might have made her acquainted with them. Mr. Howard, said Lady Gordon soon afterwards, you are under an engagement to Miss Watson, to give her another lecture on the paintings in the castle gallery. I remember hoping for that pleasure, said he but I could hardly have flattered myself that Miss Watson would remember it for such a length of time. Indeed I do, though, replied Emma. I have a very good memory for promises which are likely to afford me pleasure, and if I did not fear encroaching too much on your time and patience, should certainly claim that one. And I assure you I have no wish to shrink from my promise, but any time you will name I will be at your service, said he with a look of lively pleasure excepting tomorrow, when I am particularly engaged. There is no desperate hurry, I dare say, interposed Sir William. You can postpone your engagement without material inconvenience, I should think, for a day or two, after waiting nearly six months. Oh, yes, Miss Watson has come to pay us a long visit, added Lady Gordon. So you may easily settle on the day and hour at some future meeting. Any time will do for me, said Emma quietly. And are you really going out for the whole day tomorrow? inquired Lady Gordon. He assented. Then we will come down and rifle his strawberry beds, 
"'Shall we not, Miss Watson?' continued she. "'I protest. That will be most unfair,' exclaimed he. "'Since I give you willingly all I have, "'and only request, in return, the pleasure of your society. "'That is so pretty a speech, I can do no less than say in reply "'that we shall be most happy whenever Mr. Howard will indulge us "'with the honour of his company. "'Come whenever you can. "'The day after to-morrow, Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove dine with us. "'Will you meet them?' "'He accepted with pleasure.' though perhaps he would have preferred their absence to their company. After loitering away a couple of hours on his lawn, Lady Gordon rose to take her leave, and even then she pressed him so earnestly to accompany them up the hill to assist Miss Watson, who, she was certain, was fatigued by her long walk, that he could not have refused had it been an unpleasant task she was imposing on him, instead of the thing which he liked best in the world, and was really wishing to do. The encouragement which he received from Lady Osborne herself was so obvious that had his suit depended only on her, he would have felt neither fear nor hesitation as to the result. But as the wishes and tastes of another person were to be consulted, and there seemed far more doubt as to the direction which those took, he still debated whether or not he should venture to put his influence to the proof, and rest all his hopes on a single effort. He accompanied them home. But Emma denied that she was tired, and would not accept the assistance of his arm, because she misinterpreted the hesitation with which it was offered, fancying it was done unwillingly, and solely in compliance with her friend's directions. This discouraged him. He did not recover from the disappointment, and in consequence would not enter the castle, but persisted in returning to spend a solitary evening at the vicarage. There, Emma's smile and Emma's voice perpetually recurred to his fancy, and he occupied himself, whilst finishing the work which they had interrupted, in recalling every word which she had said, and the exact look which had accompanied each speech. End of Volume 3, Chapter 6 Recording by McKenna March Bremerton, Washington